uh, I will certainly be reaching out to him. He indicated he had a very important and serious message uh, to deliver to our community. And so uh, hopefully uh, we can reschedule Minister Jamal to a, another date. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, we want to go ahead and get ready for our speaker for this evening, uh, Brother Anthony Browder from Washington, uh, D.C. And that's right. And before we uh, bring him on, uh, we certainly uh, want to uh, help him in his work. Because I can imagine that uh, people like Brother Browdy, uh, who are following in the footsteps of Dr. John Henry Clark. And this is why Dr. Clark and Dr. Ben mean so much to us, because when people from all over the world come to New York and they have some knowledge of who they are, there are two people that they always ask us to take them to see. That's Dr. John Henry Clark and Dr. Yosef Benyakinen. And so we are very fortunate ourselves to be living in New York at a time when Dr. Clark and Dr. Ben are still alive. We are very fortunate. And so when uh, Brother Browder came to uh, New York today, he said, the only place I want to go is to see Dr. Clark. And that's where he went, to see Dr. Clark. So it shows you, uh, really, when the story is really told, and I hope that somebody is taking good notes and being a great scribe, to really write the real story of Dr. John Henry Clark and Dr. Ben. Now, they have written a lot about our history. It is now time for somebody to write about them. Because they deserve that. Uh, because wherever people uh, go, I don't care where you go, all over this country, all over this world, these two men have sparked a revolution. And they are true giants. And uh, we are so blessed uh, to be living in their times, and we should continue to elevate their names. We should continue. There's no reason why uh, people like uh, Reverend Ike and others' names can be more elevated in our community than somebody like Dr. Clark or Dr. Ben. There's no reason for that. And, and so, uh, uh, again, it just shows you how important they are, and I say that once again because, as I said before, whatever we're doing on Sunday, we should spend a moment honoring Dr. Ben and showing him how important he is to us. And so the word should go out from, from, from here to abroad that all roads on Sunday at some time will eventually lead to the Ben house and that our entire community should be there. There should be no room uh, within 20 blocks of the Ben House. That's how packed that place ought to be. That's all the packed that place ought to be. There should be no black person in this city that lived in New York during these times who do not know who Dr. Ben and Dr. Clark are. Y'all hear what I'm saying? There should be nobody. There should be no child, no young person, no adult, uh, who does not know who Dr. Ben and Dr. Clark are and what they really mean uh, to us. And I hope over the next few days on radio that some of you, when you are calling in to Tony Brown talking about nothing, uh, that you will also uh, bring up Dr. Ben and where all of us should be on Sunday and tell Tony Brown that he ought to have a front row seat. And take a, a, a vacation from cyberspace. 
before he becomes space. So now we are getting ready to get started. Uh, and in terms of our collection, uh, as I said uh, on many occasions, on most nights, if everybody here uh, just gave $4, we would probably meet our quota. Of course, we know everybody's not going to give $4. Some people, let's put our hands together for a brother uh, that came to the Slave Theater last year, one of the leading authorities on ancient Kemet, director of the Karmic Institute in Washington, D.C., Brother Anthony Browder. Let's give Brother Anthony Browder a big hand. Brother Anthony Browder. Brother Brown is, uh, is someone that I know that some of y'all were holding y'all money back because y'all were trying to get his book. Uh, if you really want a real profound book on ancient Kemet, uh, then now Valley Contributions to Civilization is a must. It is an absolute must. Uh, for anybody who want a deep understanding of ancient Kemet. That book is a must and it is available in the back as well as the Browder file, which is also important for us to have a real understanding of what we are looking at. For you to look at uh, uh, African symbols and ar African architecture, don't know what you're looking at, mean that you are not conscious because you cannot interpret what you see. Many of us have eyesight, but we have no insight. We are here tonight to develop insight, which will ultimately lead to foresight. On the 24th, we will be leaving uh, here early in the morning, going to Baltimore and Washington, D.C. That trip is an absolute must because on Sunday, the 25th, we will be given a tour of Washington in terms of the African influence on European landmarks, memorials, buildings, and et cetera by Brother Anthony Browder. Now, the cost is very minimal because we, this is not something that we are making a profit at. Transportation to Baltimore and D.C., tour fees for both the Great Blacks and Wax Museum in Baltimore and the uh, tour in D.C. on Sunday, as well as overnight lodgings at Howard Inn which many of you know is black owned. And we, oh yeah, we keep our, our money in the family. We keep our money in the family. When we're going down, we're going down on a black bus to black institutions, to a black tour guide, and staying in a black motel and eating black food. You can't get no blacker than that. And all of that for $125. Now that's not bad. You can't even ride Amtrak in style for that to DC. Much less stay at the Howard Inn and engage in two tours as well as possibly seeing the Frederick Douglass home as well for $125. So uh, that particular tour uh, is a must, and it is an expansion on what we are doing here, and it is kept at a minimum cost so that everybody can be able to go. And more importantly, you should have your children on board. 
there are more than uh, uh, probably a million of black children a year that are going to Washington to be brainwashed by white teachers who, who are telling them that George Washington never told a lie and Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves. And so uh, we are very fortunate to have Brother Browder up here tonight uh, with us uh, at the Slave Theater. And as I said before, one of the great books uh, on ancient Kemet is under his penmanship. And that's now valid contributions to civilization. And you should get yourself one and get your children one because any child can read that book and regain his or her identity. That's how important it is. So once again, as we get this lecture of afoot, let us get on our feet once again as we present our keynote speaker for tonight, all the way from Washington, D.C., Brother Anthony Browder. Let's give him a UAM Slave Theater ovation, Anthony Browder. All right, Hotep. I'm uh, very pleased to be back with the, uh, the family here in Brooklyn and to have another opportunity to share some information with you. Uh, I'm going to jump right into it uh, because there's a wealth of information that I want to uh, discuss this evening and um, time is tight. Uh, what I'm going to talk about this evening, particularly my subject, is uh, survival strategies for Africans living in America. Uh, specifically, I'm going to be focusing on seven steps to freedom, talking about some of the issues that confront us as African people and what it is that we need to begin to do to understand what those problems are and begin to modify our behavior so that we can ensure that we will gain our freedom, all right? This, <clears throat> bring the mic closer. Okay, is that better? All right, thank you very much. Um, one of the things that, that has been important for me in the process of developing uh, this lecture and other material is that uh, I've come to understand the importance of information, processing, packaging, presenting information. I have essentially been in the information business for about 15 years. What started out as a hobby has now become my profession as a result of, of, of my being miseducated, understanding that I had been miseducated, and then beginning to actively participate in the process of re-educating myself. And so I focus primarily on the study of African history, culture, architecture, symbolism, philosophy, concepts of spirituality as well. And so the real significance of what I have devoted my life to was impressed upon me a couple of years ago when I was, in, I was invited to do a, a lecture uh, in Washington during Black History Month at a, um, a government agency by some of the black employees who had seen me speak at a conference. And it wasn't until I got to the, the facility that I discovered that this office was a branch of the CIA, okay? And when I was being introduced to the audience by the director of the facility, he made it a point to tell the audience that I was in the same business that they were in, except that the information that I gathered was information relative to the survival of African people. And so I thought about that, you know, because the whole role of information agencies or intelligence agencies is to gather data to process, to analyze that data, and then to disseminate it to the appropriate individuals so that strategies can be developed for your survival, okay? So I've come to understand over the years that you know, what we're engaged in, what you all are engaged in here every Wednesday night is more than just a lecture. We're talking about processing, disseminating information that is essential to your survival as a person, our survival collectively as, as, as a people. And so <clears throat> this topic is going to deal specifically with some of those aspects that I think we need to look at. And probably one of the most important issues that confronts us as a people is the issue of racism. We can't get away from it, right. right? We can't get away from it. If racism were not the biggest problem confronting African people in America, we wouldn't be here. Right. We'd be back at home. Racism wasn't a problem. There would be no need for organizations such as the NAACP or the National Association of Black Social Workers, even the National Medical Association, which was founded 100 years ago, 
African physicians in this country were not allowed to, to join the American Medical Association, so they had to start their own medical association. Every aspect of life has been influenced by racism, so we need to understand that. We need to understand and realize the fact that racist governments and institutions do not change by the goodness of their heart. They only change when they are forced to do so by conscious African people. And so we live in a society where practically every aspect of our life is controlled or manipulated by other people. Due to the fact that I was trained in, in advertising and design, I've always had uh, an interest in, in art. And I look at symbols, I look at pictures, I look at images and try to interpret them from a, from a cultural standpoint. And that's the essence of the, the African Center tour that we're gonna be doing uh, next Sunday in Washington, D.C. It's an analysis of the architecture in Washington, D.C., a discussion on the African origins of that architecture, and then a study of how this information has been incorporated into the very essence of Washington, D.C. And you can see that same pattern has been repeated in every city throughout the United States of America. If you know what to look for, if you understand the symbols and understand how the symbols are related to the history, you can go anywhere in the world and reconstruct your cultural identity. The information is right before your very eyes, brothers and sisters. But if you don't understand it, if you don't understand it, you'll walk by without really, without really having a clue as to what it is that you're dealing with. To give you some examples of the extent of the racism that we have to deal with in this society, I want to share with you some, some illustrations that reinforce the, the fact that racism is and probably will be one of the biggest issues that we'll ever be confronted with. All right, this particular image was a cartoon, an illustration that was in a newsletter that was produced by AT&T about two years ago. Over 30,000 copies of this newsletter were distributed to AT&T employees throughout the world. And in this illustration, the artist shows various people using There we go. Various people using the technical equipment of AT&T. You see a Caucasian in North America using the telephone. Caucasian in South America using the telephone. Two Caucasians in Europe on the telephone. But in Africa, you see a gorilla. And it was only when the African-American employees at AT&T complained did they apologize, the people responsible for producing this image apologized, and they said in issuing that apology that they didn't realize that it was offensive to black folk, all right? We, we are invisible in their society. Another example of this process, there was a, the Indiana State Medical Association every year has a conference in Indianapolis. And they send out invitations to members of the state legislature as well as physicians throughout the state. The theme for their reception that year was entitled Jungle Fever. And they showed this image on the invitation. Over 15,000 of these invitations went out to people throughout the state. They showed a black man dressed as a cannibal with a bone in his nose cooking two white people in a pot. And again, it wasn't until the African-American members of the Indiana State Legislature received their invitation and complained that the people responsible for creating the invitation in the first place apologized. And what was their excuse? They didn't realize that it was offensive. We hear that over and over again. We will continue to hear it over and over again until you all send a very clear message that you will not tolerate your perceptions of reality to be distorted by people. You have to understand how important these images are and how they affect your psyche. Uh, two other examples I want to share with you real quick so that you can begin to become conscious of how subtle on one hand and how blatant on the other hand these symbolic attacks are and how they affect and influence your psyche. A couple of years ago, Spike Lee 
uh, produced a movie in 1991, produced a movie called Jungle Fever about interracial relationships, okay? The movie was released on June the 10th, 1991. The week that that movie was released, two national publications featured the lead actors in that movie on the front page of their magazine. One publication was a European-centered publication, that was Newsweek. The other publication was a Negro-centered publication, and that was Jet Magazine. Now, I want you all to look at these two covers and tell me the difference you see between the two. Here is Jet. That's Jet Magazine. And here's Newsweek. Okay? What you have to realize, when people produce a magazine, a television commercial, a radio commercial, a movie, when anything is produced in advertising, there's a group of men who sit around a table and determine every component that is going to be incorporated into that visual image, into that ad into that movie. So nothing is there by accident. You have the art director, you have the photography director, you have the writer, you have various individuals sitting around determining everything that you see. The, the pictures, the placement of the individuals on the pictures, the size of the type, the placement of the type is all important. It's all designed to send specific messages. And what you will notice in the media is that height denotes power. Here on the cover of Newsweek, you see an image that shows the European woman in a position that says that she is superior to the brother. It reinforces the hierarchy that exists in this country. That hierarchy is white male, white female, black female, black male. That's the hierarchy. Contrast that to this image, Jet Magazine. Think about it. These art directors had a host of photographs to choose from but they chose photographs that would reinforce their cultural orientation. Look at this Newsweek cover again. <clears throat> what else do you see when you look at that cover? The expression, they're not smiling on this picture. She looks like she, she's mothering him, right? And her hand is on his shoulder, almost pushing him away, all right? But then one other thing that you'll notice is that, and you really can't see it that well because of the quality uh, of this color Xerox, but her face is lightened on this image, and his face is darkened in order to reinforce the caption of this particular issue of the publication, Tackling a Taboo. Right? All of these things are done in order to manipulate the images which will ultimately affect and influence your consciousness. Now, we need to realize that racism is an unavoidable fact of life in America. We need to understand how racist images attack us constantly, 24 hours a day. We need to understand that whoever is responsible for creating images will ultimately determine your level of consciousness. How you feel about yourself is determined by how you see yourself. And if the images that are constantly projected about you says that you are less than human, then you will act less than human. Others will regard you as less than human. Carter G. Woodson said it best when he said, when you control a man's thinking, you don't have to worry about his action. You don't have to tell him to stand here or there, for he will find his proper place and will stay in it. A person who has been miseducated does not have to be ordered to the back door of any society because they will go without being told. In fact, if there is no back door, their very nature will demand one. Why? Because their miseducation makes it necessary. So my question to you is, who has been responsible for educating you? The same people who were responsible for enslaving your forefathers, foremothers? The same people who have been responsible for giving you your concept of God? Well, at some point in time, you've got to stop and reevaluate this entire process. So that's what I want to focus on this evening, reevaluating the information that has been instilled within our conscious mind. It is a process, in this particular instance, it's a seven-step process that is designed to help recovering Negroes and former black people become born-again Africans. It's designed to help you resurrect your African consciousness. The first step, 
The first step we want to focus on is the step that you must be actively engaged in the process of freeing your mind. You must work to free your mind. You have to do that, begin the process of freeing your mind by evaluating everything that you've been taught, everything, and develop a discriminating eye so that you can ultimately learn what not to believe. You don't want to believe everything everybody tells you. Or you want to get some information to reinforce that, to validate that information, to determine whether or not it should be programmed within your consciousness. This brain here that you have is a sacred instrument, and you don't give anybody access to this instrument. This process for freeing your mind can be developed through uh, the development of, of uh, a thinking process that is referred to as higher order thinking skills. Educa educators refer to this as higher order thinking. And there's three basic levels of higher order thinking, and I reference them in, the, in uh, Nile Valley Contributions, but I want to cite them this evening. The first level is <clears throat> that of the literal level, the second is the inferential level, and the third is the evaluative level. Now what does that mean? At the literal level of consciousness, you are programmed to accept all information as it is presented to you literally. You don't question any information. At the, at the inferential level, you begin the process of inferring or reading between the lines in an attempt to understand what has not been presented to you. And at the third level, at the evaluative level, you begin the process of evaluating every information weighing the information as to its validity in your life to determine what you will keep and what you will discard, all right? Your objective as you participate in this process of freeing your mind is to try to function at the evaluative level of consciousness. Why? Because we all have been lied to. We all have been miseducated and we're trying to reconstruct our consciousness. For example, <clears throat> this object here, is referred to as what? What do you call this object? All right, everyone who calls that object the Sphinx has been miseducated. And you gotta free your mind. That is not a Sphinx. The word Sphinx is a Greek word. This statue was made at least 4,000 years before the development of Greece. So what are we doing calling it by a Greek name? The word Sphinx, if you go home and look up the word Sphinx in the dictionary this evening, you'll find the word Sphinx means to strangle or to hold. This image was referred to by the Africans who created it as Hair Market. It means Heru on the horizon. It is an image of Heru, the son of God. The image of Heru on the body of a lion. This symbol, this statue is symbolic and it represents the process by which you can develop your higher consciousness through the refinement of your mind. Developing your God consciousness through the refinement of your mind, which allows you to conquer your lower animal nature. See, the lion there represents the bestial nature that exists within every person. So your objective, if you are to succeed in life, is to develop, develop the God consciousness within you so that you can control your lower animal nature and are no longer subservient to your passions. You know, you no longer go out and do something on Friday and Saturday night that you regret nine months later because you understand what happens when you are not in control of your consciousness, all right? Hair Market is the name of this statue that we call the Sphinx. It's in the books, brother, it's all in the books. This, that is a Sphinx. That's a Greek Sphinx, okay? The reason why this statue was called a Sphinx, the reason why it has the head and breast of a woman is because this statue was evil. The Sphinx was a monster which was perched on a cliff which led to the city of, of Thebes in Greece. And everyone who traveled along the road that passed this cliff was asked a question by this Sphinx, which we know, we know this question today is the riddle of the Sphinx. And whoever could not answer this question of this riddle was strangled by this Sphinx. That's why the word Sphinx means to strangle or to hold. The question, or the riddle of the Sphinx, was in essence a test of your level of consciousness. A test of the evaluative level, 
of consciousness, the inferential level of consciousness that I just talked about earlier. The riddle says what walks on four legs in the morning, three legs in the afternoon, and two legs in the evening, and the more legs that it walks on, the weaker it becomes. This question was put to every person who whoever could not answer that question was strangled. The only person who successfully answered that question was a man by the name of Oedipus, who realized that that question, who evaluated the question, he didn't take it literally. He inferred as to his deeper meaning and evaluated it based upon his own personal experience and gave the only answer he could, which is man. The question is symbolic. Why? Because man in the morning of his life crawls on four legs as an infant, as an adult in the afternoon of his life stands erect on two legs, and in the evening as the elder walks with the cane on three legs. After Oedipus gave the correct answer to the riddle, the Sphinx then commits suicide. The Greek, Greek Sphinx then committed suicide by jumping off of a cliff. Oedipus then went into the city of Thebes where he proceeded to marry his mother after he had murdered his father. This is Greek history. This is Greek culture. This is Greek philosophy, all right? And, and based upon this Greek philosophy, European physicians, European scholars have developed what they consider to be a natural worldview. So when Sigmund Freud, the, the, the great psychiatrist, heard about this story of Oedipus, he created a concept called the Oedipus Complex, which said that every male child wants to murder his father so he can marry and have sex with his mama. Now, I don't know about you all, but I ain't never had the desire to have sex with my mother. That is a European thing. It shows you the extent to which they are not capable of understanding profound concepts which sprang from the minds of human beings, okay? That's why they portrayed, the Greeks had to portray the Sphinx as a woman, because from their cultural point of view, women were inherently evil. The Greeks were the first so-called civilization to legitimize the concept of homosexuality and that they believed that only men were intelligent, men had the capacity for knowledge, and that the greatest love that a man could ever experience is the love of another man. And so women were inherently evil, so they had to portray this great monster as a female. So you all need to understand that. We love and revere Greek philosophy and, and, and the Greek and, and, and Greek scientists and Greek mathematicians, but we don't really understand that all these, these folk were freaks. They were crazy. So you have to reevaluate all of that information that you were taught in school and begin to look at your life differently. The second step, after you reevaluate yourself, you have to begin to know yourself. And then this is a serious responsibility. You have to begin to become aware of the significance of that statue of Hera Market. You have to begin to become aware of the significance between the relationship between your mind and your body. The mind is literally and symbolically the seat of God. The mind is capable of influencing every activity that takes place within your body. Every activity. And what's interesting is that physicians now are beginning to understand something about the relationship that exists between the mind and the body. And they're reevaluating their whole concept of the human body. Let me give you one example. There's a, a book out entitled Ageless Body, Timeless Mind by an Indian physician by the name of Deepak Chopra. And in this book, he talks about an instance where physicians are discovering the power that transplanted organs have on the people who receive the transplants. Let me give you a quote from his book. He said that some transplant patients report an uncanny experience after receiving a donated kidney, liver, or heart. Without knowing who the organ donor was, they began to participate in the memories of the person whose body that, that organ came from, all right? He cited this specific example. There was a woman who received a heart transplant. And after the heart transplant, she began to develop a craving for chicken McNuggets and beer, all right? Never drank beer before in her life. Never really went to McDonald's. 
but she had this craving, all right? And then when she would dream at night, she would have visions of this person, this, this, this man, this black man named Timmy, who would come to her and talk to her in her dreams, and she couldn't figure out what was going on. She thought she was losing her mind. And so she decided she wanted to find out something about the person whose heart she now had in her body. So she went back to the hospital and was able to search through the records and discovered to her surprise that the heart in her body came from a black man named Timmy. She got his address, went to his house to talk to his family, and discovered that Timmy used to always drink beer and died coming home from where? McDonald's. There you go. OK, body parts. So what I'm saying is, these people are now beginning to reevaluate this thing called life. Now beginning to look at it from a totally different perspective. One of the things that we have got to begin to do is we reevaluate our lives, is to understand it from an African perspective. And when we do that, we'll see that our view of the world was totally different than the view of the Europeans. We understood the relationship that existed between the mind, the body, and the soul. All right? And we viewed the body as sacred because the body is the seat of the soul. The mind is the instrument through which God communicates to you. This is a powerful thing that we have here, this human body. It should not be wasted. It should not be abused. There's a couple of things that I want to, um, to, to, to sh share with you, a couple of demonstrations that I want to share with you very briefly to kind of reinforce some of the issues that I'm talking about, because I, I believe in, in a hands-on approach and, and going beyond talking and showing you how this stuff really impacts your life. <clears throat> but the mind doesn't have the ability to distinguish between what is real and what is a lie. The mind responds to whatever information is given to it. For example, if you've ever been in, in an argument or been in a situation where your life was threatened, your body responded to that crisis by secreting uh, hormones, adrenaline, uh, you started to sweat, your heart started to beat, to beat fast, and your body began to prepare itself for what's referred to as the fight or flight syndrome. Either you defend your life and fight, or you run for your life. And your body prepares you to, to have the strength to do whatever is necessary in order to survive. But if you've ever been in a life-threatening situation, notice how your body responds. And then notice how when you think about or reflect back on that experience, your body also responds. Think about a threatening situation. And as you think about it, you'll feel your heart starting to beat faster. You'll feel your palms starting to get sweaty. Uh, you'll feel your breath beginning to race away from you. Why? Because just by thinking about something, your body accepts those thoughts as if they are happening right now. So the point that I'm trying to get across to you is that you've got to begin to understand how powerful your thoughts are how they influence your physical body, and how they also influence your behavior, all right? I want to do a little, de a little demonstration to illustrate this point. And in order, order to do it, I need uh, four folk. So can I have four people just come on up? Doesn't matter who, but four people, come on up. I've got <clears throat> this little gadget here, which is like a little ping pong. It's a little toy that has in it uh, two batteries. There's two metal strips which are connected to each of the batteries. It has a, a little soundboard, and it also has a, a light inside of it. And when I hold my fingers on both of these metal strips, then what happens is this little toy lights up. What it illustrates is the fact that this electrical current from one of the batteries is moving through my finger to the other finger and completes the circuit so that this thing lights up. If I lift up my hand, then it stops. So electrical energy flows through the human body. All right, one basic reality. I, got, I need one more person, one more person. Sister, why don't you come on up? Come on. Somebody, sister, come on up, all right. I got four people up here and let me, <clears throat> 
Let me show you how if we form a circle, if we form a circle and hold hands, I touch one end of the strip and the other person next to me touches one end of the strip, I want you to see what happens. First of all, energy flows through the human body. Energy flows, flowed, in this one example, from my body to his, to hers, to his, to his, and back to mine, and completed the circuit. That's why this ball lit up and made that noise. So all of our bodies are capable of transmitting energy. Physical energy, mental energy, and spiritual energy. You may not be able to see it, you may not be able to smell it, but it's happening. It's going on around you. Let me show you all another, another brief demonstration that, that reinforces this concept of this principle that I'm talking about. And to do that, um, let me bring out this chair. Right. Some of you all may have seen this before, but I want to do it again, and then I want to explain to you this process. Take the microphone with me. OK. Now, this is a, this is a a basically a, a very simple uh, Sesame Street demonstration that illustrates something about the human body and the relationship between the mind and the body. And what the four of us are going to do is to lift this brother up out of the chair using two fingers each. All right. The first time we attempt to do it, we won't be successful. Then I'm going to go into conference with my associates here. When we come out of the conference, we'll lift them up and then I'll explain to you how we did what we did. Okay. Back in position, on the count of three. Count of three. One, two, three. Now, all right. Now, let me just explain what we did and how we did it. Energy flows through the body, all right? I already demonstrated that point with this little gadget here. Energy flows into the left side of your body, which is feminine, and receives energy. It flows out of the right side of your body, which is masculine, and transmits energy. Energy also flows through your spinal column into and out of your body through your brain. You know, when a child is born, a newborn child has a soft spot in their skull, that, that's where the skull is not fused shut yet, so that energy is now flowing unimpededly through their skull. So our bodies are designed specifically to receive and to transmit energy. So the first time we tried to lift the brother up out of the chair, we weren't able to do it. By us placing our hands over his head, what we did, what we did was to begin to synchronize our energy with his energy. And then I gave the people in the circle a directive to visualize in your mind an image of us lifting him up, lifting him up out of the chair. Why I visualize it? Because the mind responds, or the body responds, to the, the uh, directions given it by the mind. The 
body can't distinguish between what's real and what's not real. All right? We are synchronizing our energy. We are telling our bodies to lift this brother up out of, the, out of the chair with two fingers, and then our bodies create the energy which allows us to do that. All right? Shows you the relationship between the mind and body. Anything that you focus your energies on, you will be able to gather the energy to accomplish anything, whether it's good or bad. Energy doesn't discriminate. It just exists. So we need to begin to understand that reality. Left hand receives energy. Left hand is feminine. Left side of the body is feminine. The right side of the body transmits energy. That's the reason why our brothers who know will wear an earring in their left ear if they wear an earring. Don't wear the earring in the right ear because that means something different. Okay? <laughs> you all need to know what it means, all right? If you're, going, if you're going to wear a pierced ear in the first place. But this idea, this concept of energy being transmitted into and through your body is not new. You all already know this, all right? How many of you all have seen this image before? You all have seen that image, right? This image illustrates that demonstration that I share with you, all right? You will see in these images Jesus holding his left hand over his heart and holding up his right hand, transmitting the love of the energy from his heart out to you. The left hand is feminine and receives energy. Right hand is masculine and transmits energy. That's the reason why if you go to court, you do what? Place your left hand on the Bible and raise your right hand. You say the Pledge of Allegiance, you put your left hand on your heart. The left hand receives energy, right hand transmits energy. See, we need to begin to understand what this whole thing is all about. Let me show you. The information is all around you, but we just don't know how to interpret and how to respond to it. Here is a photograph from a billboard, and there are dozens of these billboards in Ghana, all throughout Ghana. Images of a blonde hair, blue-eyed Jesus on huge billboards all throughout Ghana. But here in this billboard, it says exactly what I was talking to you all about. The right hand implies power. Right hand transmits power. The left hand receives power. You all are instruments through which the creator works through. If you don't know that, then you'll be an instrument for your own destruction because other people will utilize you against your own best interests. This stuff is too important and too powerful to take for granted or to leave in the hands of people who have historically shown themselves not to have your best interests at heart. So step number three, one of the things that you all have got to begin to do is to understand symbolic imagery. Understand symbolic imagery. That's what we're going to be focusing on throughout most of the, uh, the African Center tour in Washington, talking about the symbols, their, their meanings in Africa, why they were developed here in the United States of America, and how they've been designed to specifically create certain energy fields and to cultivate a level of consciousness. All right? What is what is this image here? The caduceus. Okay? What is it associated with? Medicine. All right? Now, the next time you all go to visit your doctor, ask your doctor, ask him or her what this symbol means. What is the symbolic significance of this symbol? And I guarantee you, a hundred bucks, they won't be able to tell you. It is a symbol of the medical profession, and yet most physicians don't even have the faintest idea as to what it actually represents. This is a symbol that represents the same process that I was talking to you all about, about energy flowing through the human body. Okay, The two serpents represent the energy that flows through the right and the left side of your body. The staff represents your spinal cord. The globe at the top of the staff represents your mind, your brain. The wings on either side of the staff represents the process by which you are able to free your mind based upon your understanding of this principle, this process. That we live in a world full of energy, different types of energy, which flows to us and through us. 
And if you understand that relationship, then you can begin to live in harmony or at ease with your environment. If you don't understand it, then you will begin to live in a state of dis-ease. Okay? And then you will need to go to a physician to try to get healed. So all of these things are critically important. The human body, like the mind, is being transformed every second. Right now, as I'm speaking to you, there are six trillion reactions taking place in your body every second of every day for the rest of your life. You are generating energy, new energy, life within every cell of your body. It's been said that the skin, your skin, which is the largest organ in your body, replaces itself once a month. You get an entire new layer of skin every 30 days, approximately. You get a new stomach lining about every five days because of the, um, because of the, uh, the, the, uh, the gases uh, and the acids in your stomach. It would destroy you. You would get ulcers if your stomach lining did not reproduce itself about every five days, all right? You get a new liver every six weeks. You get new skeletal system every nine months, or every 90 days, excuse me. By the end of this year, 98% of your body is going to be transformed with new parts. 98%. This is the beauty of this body that we have, and this instrument that we have. So the question is, why do you all keep getting sick? Your body has everything it needs to heal itself. So why do you get sick? You get sick because you are out of harmony with this instrument here, and it needs to be tuned up, okay? We're amazing creatures with unlimited potential, but the potential means nothing if it's never cultivated, if it's never tapped into. This symbol here represents the process by which we can tap into You all, this is Jehudi, who is the comedic nature who is associated with science. He's associated with medicine, all right? The staff that he holds in his hands was the precursor to the caduceus. Jehudi represents the process of divine articulation of speech. He was known by he was known to the Greeks as Toth, T-H-O-T-H. -H. And it is from the word Toth that we have derived the word thought. Every thought that you think is a manifestation of this process of divine articulation of speech, the attributes of Jehudi. The Greeks took this concept of Jehudi, took this concept of Toth, Hellenized it, and then Jehudi became Greek god, Hermes. And the staff that Hermes carries in his hand is referred to as the staff of Hermes, the caduceus. Hermes was the Greek god associated with medicine. When the Romans conquered Egypt, took it away from the Greeks, the Romans also took the Greek gods, which had been taken from the Kemetic gods, and so they took Hermes and transformed him into Mercury. Mercury represents the same process, the same attributes as Hermes and Jehudi. What this symbol represents is the relationship that exists between your mind, your body, and your soul. Look at Greek, look at Roman mythology. Who is Mercury? Any of you all know who Mercury was? Messenger of the gods, exactly. He was the messenger of the gods, all right? The Romans name the planets after their gods. And the sun is a symbol for the mind. So what is Mercury? Mercury is the messenger of the gods. He moves, he is the closest to the sun and moves the fastest around the sun. I think that the year on Mercury is about 90 days, all right? It moves that, that fast around the sun, all right? So understand this process and how it relates to you. This process symbolizes a process that takes place within the human body. Mercury was derived from the Greek god Hermes, 
who is also associated with medicine, all right? It is from the word Hermes that we have derived the word hormones. And what are hormones? Hormones are chemical messages which are secreted from God or the brain. And what do those chemical messages do? When they are secreted by the pineal and the pituitary gland, they then send chemical messages to every part of your body, telling you what to do and when to do it. All right? When you go through a stage of, of puberty, hormones are secreted that begin to tell your body, if you're a female, to begin to go through the process of having your cycle. Your physical structure changes. Your breasts begin to enlarge. If you're a male, you begin to have a wet dream. Your voice begins to deepen. Hair begins to grow on various parts of your body. Why? Because of chemical messages which were secreted from the brain. So this process symbolizes the human body. What we have to begin to do is become conscious of how our ancestors identified this relationship between our body, our mind, and our soul, and the environment. They were aware of the fact that when we sleep at night, our spirit has the ability to communicate with the ancestors. They come to us in our dreams. Some of you may not be very conscious of it, but go talk to your grandparents or an elder in your family and ask them how it was that, that when they had a problem, a very important problem in their life and were kind of hesitant to make a decision, they would say, well, child, let me sleep on it, all right? And when they would awaken in the morning, they would say, well, you know, Aunt Jean came to me last night in my sleep and told me that, that I shouldn't sell this house. The ancestors would come to them in the sleep. Why? Because when you are sleeping, a part of your consciousness begins to commune with the ancestors. We have a very special relationship with the, with the universe with God, if you will. Our bodies are designed as vessels to receive the energies and the information from God. That's why we call soul people. That's why we move a little differently, talk a little differently, dance a little differently, because we hear, we feel different forms of energies than other folk. You all are familiar? <clears throat> they say the black folk have this tendency to, to vibe on other folk. You know, you come into a room, and you just feel the vibes aren't right, right? What are you talking about? You're talking about, you're talking about your body being able to, to feel the energy in the room that is being disseminated by folks who don't have good will on their mind. So if you are in tune with your body, it tells you, get the hell out of here, man. You don't want to be here. If you listen, you go. If you don't listen, then you read about what happened to the person who stayed the next day. Have you ever wondered why there's this jazz label called Blue Note Records. You ever wonder what, what the Blue Note, what the Blue Note is, what it means? Understand what it means. I had, when I first came to Howard, back in 71, I took a class by uh, Donald Byrd, who was then a professor at Howard, a class entitled The History of Jazz. And he would talk about uh, music and some of the things that they dealt with um, um, as musicians. And he, and he told us this story of when he and some of his partners were playing at a club in France. And every night they would come and jam and there was this guy who would, who would sit in the front row, listen to him play and take pen and, 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 and paper and write down what, 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 what Bird was playing. And he said he came to him one evening and said, you know, you know, I've been coming here for the last four or five days listening to you play, writing down the music, but when I go home and play it, it doesn't sound like what you play. And Burr laughed and said, well, that's because, my man, you can't hear the blue note. The blue note is a level, is a, is a range of music that Europeans cannot hear. They cannot hear. That's the significance of Harold Melvin and the Blue Notes. We vibe to a different frequency than other folk. We hear things they don't hear. We see things they don't see. We feel things that they don't feel. So as long as you strive to be like them and not be like yourself, you're going to hear the wrong thing. 
you're going to feel strange, strange feelings because you aren't in tune with yourself. So what we have to begin to do for the fourth step in this process, we have to begin to nurture our spirit. We have to truly begin to understand what this energy is that exists within us. We all are in possession of aspects, spiritual aspects of the creator that manifests itself within us. So to that extent, each one of us is sacred. Every person in this room is sacred, is a reflection of the creator. Whoever you perceive the creator to be, you are a reflection of the creator. So then you have to treat yourself with respect. There is a part of your body, there is a part of your brain right here that's called the temple. It's called the temple. Why is it called the temple? Because this point here, if you go through here and straight down, where these two lines intersect is where the pineal gland is. And the pineal gland is referred to as the seat of the soul. It is the source from which hormones are secreted. It is your direct line of communication to the ancestors and to God. Okay? That is where you go to commune with the ancestors, with the creator. So just as the temples in Kemet are sacred places not to be desecrated, this temple here is a sacred place. You desecrate it by thinking certain thoughts, by saying certain things, by putting certain things into your body that human beings ain't supposed to eat. Every time you do this, you put your body out of harmony with the Creator and aren't able to function as human beings are supposed to function. So we function on a subhuman level and have been doing it for so long, we are comfortable with this inability to live as we're supposed to live. What do you see when you look in the mirror? Do you see a reflection of the Creator? Do you see God manifesting itself within you? What do you see when you look at the brothers and sisters next to you? Do you see a reflection of God in them? which says, if I see God in you, then I've got to treat you the same way that I would treat myself. If we truly understand or understood this relationship, then our relationship to each other would be profoundly different. We have to begin to strive towards that. If you are not in control of your perception of God, if you are not in control of your perception of God, then you run the risk of being spiritually molested. Whoever controls the image of God in your mind determines <clears throat> your ultimately, ultimate ability as a human being. Right now, there's a move afoot to begin to portray Jesus as an African, <clears throat> which is good on one level, but you still have to understand that this concept comes from the Nile Valley comes from, is directly related to the story of Asar, Aset, and Heru. So we have to be able to take it all the way back to the source, not to the European interpretation of the source, because the information is available to you which will help you to unlock the keys that are in Christianity, or the keys that are in Islam. They are keys to wisdom and power. Now this, this issue is so critically important for us as a people, because we call ourselves very religious people, but we never stop and ask a very basic question. If we are truly as religious as we think we are, if we have the ability to communicate with God like we say we do, then why are we suffering? See, because from my standpoint, if you are in harmony with the Creator, then you do not experience illness, because your body is able to heal itself in very short periods of time. You do not experience physical, mental, or spiritual distress because your body is in harmony with the Creator. You do not experience times of financial difficulty. Why? Because you understand that money is a tool. Money is an instrument. Money is energy, which allows you to bring things into your environment which will improve the quality of life. That's why the European the European American puts on his currency in God we trust. United States of America is the only country in the world that puts that on his money. Why? Because they understand that God is them and they trust nobody but themselves. I had an experience a couple of years ago where I was talking to an audience. Some brothers from an Air Force base in Japan had invited me over during the month of February to give a lecture for Black History Month. 
It's talking about African history and culture, the African origins of the concept of religion, and made a comment that um, when I was being, just prior to my being introduced, the pastor at the base, who was a brother from Chicago, my hometown, closed the prayer, closed the, uh, his, his prayer with the word amen. And I asked for a show of hands of the people in the audience. There must have been about 300 or so people in the audience. I asked for a show of hands of the people in the audience who knew that when the pastor said the word amen, he was calling the name of an African God. And maybe three or four people raised their hand. And I went on to explain how this concept of a man came from Kemet and what it really refers to, the unseen presence of the Creator. I understand that the following day, Sunday, when some of the people who attended my lecture, and these were brothers and sisters primarily, some of the people who attended my lecture went to church service, they asked the pastor if my comments were correct, if the word amen was the name of an African God. And the pastor told them, well, well yes, I, I do believe that Brother Browder was correct. The word amen is the name of an African God. And do you realize that given an opportunity to begin to see themselves in the image of God, these miseducated Negroes turned away and said that they were no longer going to use the word amen. We're talking about the height of miseducation, self-hatred. And as a result of this self-hatred, we turn on ourselves constantly. So the fifth step that we have to deal with is that we have to begin to understand who we are. Specifically, we have to remember the Ma'afa, the great disaster, the Holocaust of the African enslavement. We have to begin to, to honor the memory of the millions of men, women, and children who died for over 400 years during this process of the enslavement of African people and begin to hold these people up in high esteem to honor their memory. Because the only reason why we exist is because of their strong will. Theoretically speaking, we should, be, we should have been wiped off the face of this planet. No people on earth have gone through what we've gone through. We should be extinct. Or those of us who, who are alive today should be star raving lunatics. But the fact that we are here and here in great numbers and still have our minds intact is an indication of the relationship that exists between the Creator and us. So we need to understand that. And we need to give honor to those brothers and sisters who knew that, who preserved the history and culture and passed those traditions on to us. If we truly honored our ancestors and respected them, then we would do what every ethnic group in this country has done. I heard Brother Maddox make reference to uh, a brother here who has in the area who has a collection of slave artifacts which he said should be in a museum. Why is it that we don't have a museum to commemorate our, our Holocaust, our Ma'afa? When you all come to Washington next Sunday, we're gonna drive past the United States Holocaust Memorial, which was built two and a half years ago by Jewish American citizens who had the sense, who had the sense to collect $150 million of their own money to build a monument to memorialize their ancestors. They hired a Jewish architect to design a building that would symbolize in every detail their horror and their atrocity, which took place thousands of miles across the ocean in Germany. Even though they're here in America, they understand the importance of honoring your ancestors wherever you are. And as a result of them building this monument, building this memorial to their ancestors, here in the United States of America, in Washington, D.C., as of last year, January the 1st, 1994, your tax dollars are now being spent to maintain this institution. Where is our museum to memorialize our ancestors? We won't have one as long as we don't believe that they are worthy of honoring. They even got a stamp museum in Washington, D.C. Every ethnic group in this country maintains their history and their culture by connecting with their ancestors. The Italians do it every year they have the Columbus Day Parade, they're connecting with their ancestors. Every year the Chinese have to celebrate Chinese New Year, they're celebrating with their ancestors. Kwanzaa is something that is relatively new. Black History Month is something that is relatively new. But we've got to move beyond that and build institutions that, that our children and grandchildren 
we'll be able to look back on and say, yes, my people cared enough about the history and culture to create something, to preserve something for me. Right now, we ain't got it. And we wonder why our children don't listen to us. The sixth point that we have to look at, sixth issue, is that we have to begin to prepare ourselves for war. Based on these five steps that we've talked about earlier, we need to begin to understand that we have been under attack from the moment we set foot on this land. And, and the war takes on, war takes on different forms. You know, you have low intensity warfare. You have psychological warfare. You have germ warfare, drug warfare, alcohol warfare, spiritual warfare, mental and cultural warfare. We have been under attack. And so what I want to focus on briefly is what we need to begin to do in order to fight a war and win. A few basic steps. First step is that we have to know our objectives. We have to be able to have a clear vision and a goal. Know what it is that we need to begin to do and move towards achieving that goal or that vision every second of every day for the rest of our life. You know, there's, an, there's a, uh, an African proverb that says, if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. Well, we've got to be very clear about where it is we want to go and what it is we need to be able to do in order to get there. The next, the next phase is that we've got to have a plan. We've got to do more than just have a vision or a goal. We've got to have a plan. How do you achieve that goal? You achieve that goal by analyzing every aspect of that goal, breaking it down into achievable uh, components and begin to work towards fulfilling each one of those components completely so when you complete the entire task you've got something that will last and not something that will fly that will fly in the face of the wind or any strong opposition you've got to work towards that the next step is that we've got to master deep knowledge we ain't talking about superficial understanding and let me say that we got to move beyond hotep and just wearing African clothing and kente cloth and thinking that we hip or we cool or culturally correct, we got to move beyond that. And you've got to begin to understand that the mastering deep knowledge allows you to increase your awareness of nature, God, and yourself. Focusing your energy. It's been said that a picture is worth a thousand words, where deep knowledge is worth a thousand pictures. Intense study. Some of us are going to have to kill our television. Sit down with a book. Sit down with a book. Read to our children. Discuss what we've read so that we can begin to understand what it is we have to do in order to save ourselves. We have to become invincible. How do you become invincible? Studying your enemy and knowing your enemy better than he knows himself. Know his weak points. You know that your enemy is only able to stay strong because he pimps you. He lives off of you. He's a parasite. Hey, don't support him financially. Don't support him culturally. Don't support him spiritually. You know what will weaken him if you understand his nature and move to defend yourself. You have to move with all deliberate speed. You can't be unsure. You don't have to move with haste. You don't have to be in a hurry, but just move consistently. Consistently, okay? On one level, you've got to learn to be invisible. What do I mean by that? You've got to learn to shut up and not put all your business in the street. See, because understanding this, Understanding this relationship with energy. See, when you, when you go out and, and put all your business in the street, people have an idea as to what you're up to. And if the people don't like you because they don't like themselves, they will begin to place roadblocks in your way. So if you're cool, if you keep your cars close to your chest, develop a plan, work your plan, and begin to implement that plan and keep it to yourself or a handful of people who agree to work with you to implement a specific plan. You ain't got to brag about what you're doing. Just do it. That's what counts. You have to be strong. 
be strong and develop mental, physical, and spiritual strength. And realize that the only way that you're going to survive is if you take care of this body here that was given to you by God. Treat it as if it is a sacred structure. The last point in this series of how to win a war is that you've got to be able at the appropriate times to win without fighting. See, you don't always have to wage a war by dropping bombs and killing folk. Most of the wars are, are won without even firing a shot. You can win without fighting if you analyze the situation and move swiftly to nip a problem in the bud when it begins to surface so that you don't have to worry about confronting a bigger problem three months down the road or three years down the road. If you're taking care of business, you got everything under your control and you don't have to worry about folks surprising you because you are on top of your game. The seventh point, seventh step, is that we've got to begin to prepare ourselves for freedom. Freedom is not guaranteed to any person, but it is only achieved and maintained by the judicious use of power. Who are you giving your power to? Every time you turn on the television, you're taking power away from yourself. Every time you're listening to the radio or participating in some activity that is not going to advance your development here in New York City, advance your development here in the United States of America, advance your development here on planet Earth, you are committing suicide. You have to begin to cultivate the power of your mind, the most great, the greatest instrument that you have. You do that by reading and studying. You don't submit your mind and your free will to the television because the people who control it know how to manipulate your subconscious mind. They got you programmed to the point where you walk into a grocery store and purchase items based upon the jingles that you remember because they understand how music embeds images into your memory. You have to begin to, to form study groups, become active in organizations such as this, so that you can be clear as to what your goals are and, and clear about the strategies that will allow you to achieve your goals. You have to develop a way of protecting the people in your community, particularly the elders and the youth. The elders, when I came into town today, I went to sit at the feet of Dr. John Henry Clark. The man is a genius. He is a genius. We can learn something from the elders in our community. Why? Because it's our responsibility to protect the young. See, when you don't protect the young, then they're going to turn on you because you haven't created the environment that was necessary for their survival. We've got to do our job. You've got to use the power in your body. Realize that it's a temple. Be aware of your thoughts and understand how your thoughts influence your body. Be aware of your thoughts and do not allow them to be unduly influenced by people on television, in the movies, on the radio, that are only, their only desire is to create or to perpetuate a certain image of black folk. You can't be serious on television or in the movie. You can only be a comedian. You can only tell jokes and laugh at, at your sisters and brothers. You can't be serious. And the more, the more often you watch these images, the more this reality will be impressed into your conscious mind. You've got to replace it with, up, with images that tell you who you are. You've got to begin to be more conscious about your diet. Soul food probably killed more black folks than the Ku Klux Klan. We got to understand the diet, exercising, learning how to breathe properly will allow you to perpetuate your life. Anything else will kill you. You've got to begin to use the power of your spirit and realize that everything that happens to you in your life serves as a barometer of where you are in your relationship to the Creator. As I said before, if you haven't male or female problems, having financial difficulties, if you're having one illness after another, after another, after another, means that you're out of sync with the Creator. And you need to begin to take the 
some time to understand this relationship that exists between your mind and your body. You may need to fast. You may need to do some serious meditation or some serious prayer in order to ask the ancestors to tell you what it is you need to do in order to correct those problems so that you can manifest God -like, a God-like consciousness here on earth. That's what you're supposed to do. Everything that has been created on this planet sprang from the minds of the consciousness of human beings. Everything begins first as an idea in your mind, the seats that you're sitting in, the building that we're in now, that video camera, the cars that you would drive home, the airplanes that fly through the air, all began first as an idea in somebody's mind. What we refer to as nothing is the source of everything. And those people who are involved in the process of bringing things into creation understand that the mind is the most fertile instrument on the planet. And by putting yourself in harmony with the consciousness of other creative people, ideas will pop into your mind. They will pop into your consciousness. And then you'll sit down with pen and paper and put them into a, a two-dimensional form. And as you meditate on them and cultivate and refine this idea, you begin to manifest it in a three-dimensional form. That's how everything came into existence, through the utilization of your mind. The Europeans understand that. That's why they have waged psychological warfare on African people for the last 500 years, and they are not about to stop because they understand who you are. They understand who you are. They understand the potential that exists within you. You've got the power today just by changing your mind to change the course of planet Earth for the next 2,000 years. You got the power to do that. The European knows that. That's why he has liquor stores in every corner in your community. That's why you can go to any black community in the United States, and within 15 minutes, you can find out where the drugs are being sold and purchase whatever you want. They are there by design. They don't have to be there. And if you truly care about yourself and your community, you can do something about it, as opposed to waiting on the Lord or asking the white man to please lift his foot off his back. He's already shown you that he's not going to do it. He's not capable of doing it. So as you engage in this process of rescuing and reconstructing your mind, begin to realize that there's no such thing as bad luck. There's no such thing as chance, coincidence, or accident in the universe ruled by law and divine order. Everything happens for a reason. You can create paradise in your life, in your community, if you focus your energies on creating paradise. You can also create hell if you focus your energies. What do you want? What do you want? You're capable of anything. What do you wish to do with the power that God gave you? That's the issue. That's the challenge. So then you all have to begin a process every day. I mean, if you're serious about your life, if you're serious about resurrecting your, con your African consciousness, you've got to begin every day to take at least 30 minutes for yourself. You figure the average person spends eight hours a day, those people who have a job spend eight hours a day on the job, about two hours preparing to go to work, two hours coming back from work, and about eight hours sleeping. So you spend approximately 20 hours every day engaging in activities that, that someone else is profiting for. How much time are you going to spend for yourself? Start by just giving yourself 30 minutes a day. Within those 30 minutes, what should you do? You should take some time to analyze yourself. How did you act throughout the course of that day? What did you do? What, what were your objectives? Were your objectives? I mean, you need to be easy with yourself in the beginning as you begin to participate in this process. My goal is to stop saying derogatory things about my own people because I understand that everything I say about someone comes back to me. And if I truly love me, I want to change my consciousness change the quality of energy that's going to emanate from the seat of God that rests within me. So make yourself a promise that I'm going to monitor my thoughts and, and only limit myself to saying five negative things about people every day. And then check yourself at the end of the day and see how well you did. Be kind to yourself, you know, because <laughs> we're going through 400 years of brainwashing. Be kind to yourself. But then once you get it down to, once you begin to become conscious, of what you are thinking, then how you are thinking. Then you can cut that down to three times a day, four times a day, and then get to the point where you say, I ain't saying nothing negative about nobody. 
I'm going to think positive. I'm going to project creative thoughts for myself and my people and watch your world transform itself instantaneously. You've got the power and the ability to do that. You've got to also take some time within every day upon assessment of how you perform during that day to plan strategies for tomorrow. If you did well today, you're going to do better tomorrow. Set reasonable goals and objectives for yourself. Be kind. Again, be kind. Understand that it took, it took 500 years to create a Negro, you know? So it's going to take us some time to work through that. Be kind to yourself in the process, but be deliberate. Plan for tomorrow one day at a time. And then, at some course during the day, you got to take time to pray or meditate. Doesn't matter on one level, I'm telling you, it doesn't matter who you pray to as long as you do it seriously and deliberately. Because you can't be a hypocrite. Pray for this and then go out and do something that's going to counteract your prayer. Prayers generate power and energy. And the more in tune you are with your prayers or your meditation, you will literally begin to tap into that, that creative source of everything and then begin to manifest it in your environment. That's what you have the ability to do and the right to do. So on a serious note, the things that I've outlined for you are things that you can begin to implement in your life. And in as little as 28 days, you can modify your behavior and create the person that you want to be. That's the power that you have. You're not going to learn this information in school. Not going to learn it in most churches. No fraternities or sororities or Masonic organizations. They should be about teaching you this, but they ain't. But you have the ability to begin to transform the quality of your life. And it begins with the decision that you make today. So in summary, in closing, we've identified racism as one of the primary problems that African people will be confronted with in your lifetime, one of the primary obstacles to freedom. We've discussed how racism distorts your perceptions of history, distorts your perception of reality, and how you have to begin to create a new perception of reality in your mind. We've discussed the need to see the world through African eyes as opposed to European eyes, eyes and understand how things, what things mean to us from an African worldview and not a distorted, inhumane perspective. We talked about increasing the power of the brain by developing your evalu evaluative thinking skills and learning to function at the level where you become conscious of everything that goes on around you. Assess it to determine what information you're going to allow to be stored in your temple. Talked about your body and how your body is a sacred instrument and should not be violated with foods that are going to counteract the, 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 the basic design of your body it should not be polluted with thoughts which are going to link you with negative thought forms and negative energy and negative people and actions that help to ultimately determine the type of person you are. We talked about the relationship between the mind and the body and the importance of understanding that this relationship does affect and influence everything that you do. You have the power to create life, to maintain life. You have to begin to understand the importance of honoring your ancestors and realize that they are real. When you all pour libation and call the ancestors to come into this auditorium, y'all ain't playing no games. And if you do not have a purpose for calling them here, they're going to get angry. They're going to do two things. One, they may come and work against you in a manner that's going to be detrimental to your, to your well-being because you are misusing their time and their energy or they may stop coming at all. And the last thing in the world you want is to be disconnected from that source of power and consciousness. The last thing that you want in this lifetime. We've also given you a basic prescription for freedom. On one level, it's very simple. All you have to do is follow the program. Implement the various steps every day of your life and watch your life transform itself right before your very eyes. When all is said and done, 
The information that I've shared with you this evening means nothing if you all walk out of here and go back to your old habits. This is your opportunity to make a commitment to yourself, to make a commitment to your ancestors and say, yes, I am ready for a change, and the change is going to start today. The change begins to me. I want to close with the poem that I had in Nile Valley Contributions. Excuse me, not Nile Valley Contributions, uh, the Browder file. Transition 13, which represents the process of spiritual transformation, process by which we can begin to do all of the things that we talked about. In the beginning, we knew not. We studied. We learned all there was to know. We taught others. But then we forgot what we had learned, and then forgot that we had forgotten, so that now we are taught information that we already have. So what do we do? We study, we come here to the slave theater to study, to learn all there is to know, and to teach others. And the challenge that awaits us as we prepare to move forward into the 21st century is, will we forget again? Thank you all very much. Let's give Brother Browder a warm applause. Anthony Browder, let's give it. Let's give it, Anthony Browder. Let us hold hands, those who are running out. One day, let's make an affirmation to our people. Let us. make sure that as we leave, seriously, I'm sure y'all still have a lot of money in your pocket because you certainly didn't leave it here. We want you to use that money at least for no other reason to get now valid contributions to civilization. Uh, it is a monumental book, believe me. It is a monumental book book. It's an opportunity to get it, have it autographed. It's a major work. And I think that you can tell just by the presentation this evening of the profound research that this brother has really put into this publication. There are a lot of people who write books and don't give us that much. Uh, but I'm telling you, nobody, no African person, I don't care who you are, and it's really sad uh, to be a doctor or a lawyer or, and not recognize the symbols of our profession and the African origins of those symbols. That's real serious. Or to be a minister and not understand the African origins of religions. And more than 95% of our preachers do not. Do not know their history. And so Malcolm was absolutely correct. Of all the disciplines, history best rewarded to reward our research. And so um, as you leave, regardless of whether you make a contribution to UAM, certainly make a contribution to yourself and stop by and get now valid contributions to civilization and from the Browder file. That's important more than anything else. We need to revolutionize our own minds. And the only way that we're going to do that is with information. And that's the reason why this country spends more money on information than anything else, including the snitches that are in here tonight. All right? Including the snitches that are in here tonight. America spends more money on information than anything else in the world. 
and uh, all stitches should make sure that you make a contribution so you continue to have your job. It is not wise to be a snitch and not support the movement. Because when the movement is alone here, I will assure you, Cracker will have no further use for you. So you should absolutely encourage people to come out here to guarantee you your job if you really want a job and may possibly get a pension at the end. So we all have to work together. If you do not know how to be a good snitch, then I will conduct a course for you. All right? That's all you got to do is to make a suggestion in the back, and we will hold a course on the business of snitching. See, you not only must be a snitch, you must also understand the business of snitching. All right? So I don't want you to lose your job. So uh, you should definitely make sure that your contributions are here every week. Please repeat after me. We're an African people. We're out from our homeland. We're out of our names, our languages, our cultures, our religions, our womanhood, our manhood, our sisterhood, our brotherhood, and our self-respect. But we shall rise, never to fall again. Up, ye mighty race, you can accomplish what you will. No justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. Hug the person again and let them know you're still glad that they're an African. to just share some information with you about um, you know, a subject matter that's very near and dear to my heart, history and culture and all those things that make us who we are. Uh, I was over at UAM last night <coughs> giving a presentation and uh, I'm going to share some information with you. All right, I remember. You retired? You've been retired now for a couple of years. You look so much happier. <laughs> um, and, and uh, something that I'll be sharing with you all this evening is uh, something that we, um, I shared with the audience last night. Uh, as Reverend Brown just mentioned, I just got back from Egypt last month, and we're currently working on excavation in Egypt, an excavation of um, 25th Dynasty tomb. And last Wednesday, the Egyptian government finally issued a press release about the findings that we made uh, last month. So now I'm free to talk about what we've done and to share pictures about what we've done. As a matter of fact, uh, I started receiving a slew of phone calls and emails this morning uh, and was informed that, uh, I forget the sister's name, who does the weekly commentary on the Tom Jordan Morning Show. She did a commentary on our discovery this morning in Tom Jordan's Morning Show. So it's about to go national. And what is about to become nationally known I feel it's our opportunity to begin to find our proper place and to assert our proper place, not just into this society, but into the world. So everything goes uh, in cycles. And I came in on the tail end of Reverend Oliver's uh, talk. But uh, what he was sharing with you all is so meaningful to me because um, I'll be heading to Selma next, next Tuesday. And this will make my third trip to Alabama since April. 
Um, I was there in April to do some presentations uh, at Selma, and uh, while I was there, actually I was at um, uh, University of Alabama in Huntsville to do a presentation, and then went down to Selma. And on my way to Selma, I stopped down at my uh, mother's and grandparents' hometown, Vernon, Alabama, which gave me an opportunity to meet family members that I never knew I had. And the beautiful thing about going down there and meeting family, the place where my mother was born, uh, my, both my maternal grandparents were born, uh, to get to <clears throat> the place where the Walker family lives and to see that my, I guess he's my cousin, my distant cousin, who's John Walker, and his brother lives around the corner, Ed Walker, lives on a street that is named after them. Lives on 200 and acres, 280 acres of land that was owned by their cousin. So when you have your own, you can name things after yourself. You can retain your history and your names and your language and your culture. And those are things that are so crucially important uh, to our ability to remember who we were and to be able to move into a future that we designed because we understand who we were. So this is so critically important to our essence as, as, a, as a people. So I truly appreciated what Reverend Oliver had to share. And with regards to Alabama being, uh, tourism being a major component of the economy of, of Alabama, I can attest to that. Uh, specifically in Selma, where I have been spending a lot of time, there's a powerful and dynamic couple, uh, Sister Rose Sanders, and her husband, Hank Sanders, they're both attorneys, uh, been involved in the civil rights movement from, from the onset. Uh, Hank Sanders is a member of uh, the state legislature. They are a powerful couple. Uh, they own uh, two museums. They sponsor the annual march across the Edmund Pettus Bridge um, every year. They have started a <coughs> civil rights museum, which is right at the foot of the bridge. They have a slavery and civil war museum, and they're about to start an African educational museum. So they're movers and shakers. But they don't move and they don't shake without stirring the wrath of others who want to quiet them. They have a radio station in which they play music, but also talk about our struggle for liberation. And their antenna has been bombed by the Klan on at least three occasions. They have a camp. They brought property where they have a camp called the 21st Century Leaders where they bring together dozens of teenagers during the summer and take them in an environment outside of Selma, which is certifiably insane. Take them into the country where they have this wonderful facility, uh, lodging facilities, uh, eating facilities, and meeting facilities uh, where they have been organizing these events for several years. The Klan came in and vandalized that environment. Bricks have been shown, thrown through their office window on Main Street in Selma. So they're fighting a good fight. And there are people who, if they have the opportunity, will put us back into slavery yesterday. So what my brother was saying about us beginning to understand the power of our dollars and using this currency to our benefit is the key to our liberation. And you said if we can withhold our money for a month, we would change the whole power balance, not just in Brooklyn, but all over this country. If we withheld our dollars between Black Friday and Christmas Eve, mm -hmm. we would have the European in the palm of our hand. Because that is when, that is when they get out of the red on Black Friday. That's why they call it Black Friday. That is when they make a profit. So if we did not participate in this Christmas celebration, spending money we don't have for people that we often don't like, we would not be in debt, and folk would begin to listen to us and pay us more attention because we are using our dollars wisely. Makes common sense, but common sense is not a common commodity. So I want to talk today about the economics of cultural memory and uh, why our history is important. Uh, history is, is a subject matter that is very near and dear to my heart, and I'm always pleased to have an opportunity to talk about what is on my heart. 
Now, Malcolm X uh, once said that of all of our studies, history is best qualified to reward our research. And I feel very strongly that Malcolm came to this conclusion as a result of his regular consultation with one of his advisors, Dr. John Henry Clark, who's no stranger to you all. Dr. Clark, as you know, was a professor at Hunter College, a dear friend of mine, wrote the introduction to my second book, Now Valley Contributions to Civilization. And one of Dr. Clark's most favorite, favorite quotes, the most famous quotes, is a quote that history is a clock that people use to tell their political and cultural time and date. That history is the compass that people use to find themselves on the map of human geography. History tells the people who they were and where they were, who they are and where they are. But the most important role of history is to tell the people where they still must go and who they still must be. And that the relationship between a person and their history is the same as a relationship between a person, a child, and its mother. So history is something that we cannot afford to take for granted. So the life of a historian is built on a foundation of memory. And memory is nothing more than the collection of images and information that have been printed indelibly on the brain. And when properly accessed and sequenced, historical memories helps one understand what Dr. Clark meant when he said that all history is a current event. If you understand clearly what happened 5,000 years ago, 500 years ago, five years ago, or five minutes ago, that helps you understand how you got where you are today and where you will be five minutes from now, five years from now, 500 years from now, 5,000 years from now. History is cyclical, and it follows specific patterns and cycles. And once you study history and begin to discern the very subtle changes in those patterns and those cycles, then there is no mystery as to why you're in the shape that you're in. You know how you got there, and you also know what you must do to get out of that situation, because history tells you what you have done. It repeats itself. So what we have to begin to understand is that we must become serious studies of history. Unfortunately, if you talk to the average person, they won't have an interest in history because of how they have been taught to approach history. They think it's just names and, and dates and this and that, but history is life. History is as important to you as the air you breathe. And as someone who has spent 33 years of my life researching African and African American history and culture, I've come to see myself as less of a historian and more as a memory recovery specialist. See, over the years, I've come to understand that many of our people suffer from um, EH, MS, excessive historical memory loss. We don't think history is important. We think it's irrelevant. So we wind up repeating the mistakes of history over and over and over again. So my job is not to come to folk as a historian, but to come to them and help them retrieve their memory of the past so that they can begin to understand why this stuff keeps happening to you over and over again, the role that you're playing in making the same mistakes, which draws the same energy to you again and again and again. Once you understand the dynamic and change your relationship to that dynamic, you then become the creator of your own story, which then becomes your history. That's how the process unfolds. And so, when I think about the power of historical memory, I can't think of any better example to illustrate that point than the city where I've been living for the last 39 years, Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. is the capital of the wealthiest and most powerful nation in human history. And it did not achieve that status accidentally. So I want you to do me a favor. I want you to uh, close your eyes for one minute. And I want you to access your historical memory banks. I want you to think of one singular image that best represents Washington, D.C. One singular image. Access your historical memory base. Now I want you to bring that singular image to the forefront of your mind. 
Now open your eyes. How many of you all saw that image to watch the mighty man? Yeah, that's it. Okay. You saw that image because it is ingrained in your memory banks. It's there. And your ability to access that memory then helps you begin to recall the history that is associated with it. So by virtue of the education that we all receive here in this country, then what you associate with this structure is one, its name, the Washington Monument. And then you also associate it with a man, George Washington, who is a founding father and the first president of the United States. All of you all know that. How do I know you know that? Because you all were educated by the same folk who educated me. And we were all given the same memories, which we access the same way. Throughout this country, cities and streets and universities and institutions bear the name of this fondling father. They bear his name in order to ensure that his legacy would never be forgotten. That is why you name institutions and organizations. It's one example of the importance of memory and culture. The Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. is the oldest cultural institution in the city. This building contains the largest collection of knowledge in the world. It has in its collections over, over 25 million artifacts. It receives on average 11, 13,000 items every single week. It is an ever-expanding collection of images, knowledge, and information. The idea of a congressional library was first suggested by James Madison in 1783. Madison, as you all know, was the father of the U.S. Constitution. Madison understood very clearly that if the United States, he, well actually he, he understood very clearly um, the words of the Roman philosopher Cicero who said that to not know what happened before one was born is to always remain a child. So if the United States of America was to take its place among the pantheon of the great nations, then she had to have access of all of the knowledge of the great nations that preceded her. So in 1800, President John Adams signed the bill authorizing the establishment of the Library of Congress. And he purchased 740 books from booksellers in England. And in an effort to create a national identity, America's founding fathers returned to their motherland, England to access their ancestral memory. They read books on English history in order to find their way. They also read books on ancient Rome. Why? Because England or Great Britain was given its foundation by Rome. Julius Caesar conquered Great Britain and named the country Britain. They studied Rome, the nation that gave birth to England. They studied books on ancient Greece, the nation that gave birth to Rome, and by extension, the United States of America. So this multicultural heritage has been artistically integrated and expressed historically in the Greco-Roman architecture that we find in Washington, D.C., and every major city throughout the United States. The architecture of all of your state buildings is Greco-Roman architecture, because these people understand the need to access these historical and cultural memories so that they can be who they were. It's a very simple process. It is a way of preserving cultural memories in stone, glass, and steel. So architecture is more than just architecture. A building is more than just a building. A building contains the soul of a people. And once you begin to understand that, you, you begin to see on a basic level that these are sacred institutions that affect everyone who moves through that structure, whether you understand it or not. So I'm going to use the Library of Congress as an example to illustrate how people preserve memory in stone, glass, and steel. So 
I want you to imagine that you are a scholar who is coming to the Library of Congress to conduct some research. And you're going to walk through the building in order to get to the main reading room. The Library of Congress <coughs> was named in honor of the Roman goddess Minerva, goddess of wisdom, knowledge, and power. And the architects in Washington, D.C. referred to this building as Minerva's Temple of Learning. I have a book uh, that I wrote five years ago called Egypt on the Potomac, A Guide to Decoding Egyptian Architecture and Symbolism in Washington, D.C. And based on my analysis of the layout, design, and development of Washington, D.C., I can prove to you beyond a shadow of a doubt that the people responsible for creating the nation's capital, the first planned capital in history, literally sought to create the essence of ancient Kemet, the Nile uh, River Valley, on the, in the Potomac River Valley. They were very clear about what they were doing. And so by extension, the Library of Alexandria was during the time of the Greeks and the Romans the greatest repository of culture and knowledge in the history of the world. The Library of Congress is by extension today the greatest repository of culture and knowledge in the history of the world. It is the American version of the Library of Alexandria. History is repeating itself. Why? Because folk who understand history are writing it. So imagine you're coming into Minerva's Temple of Learning. You enter the building by coming up these stairs, and you can come in through one of three doorways. And above each of the doorway is a, a sculpted image that depicts three ways that knowledge is transferred intergenerationally. The first way is through the oral tradition. The second way is through the written tradition. The third way is through the printed tradition. Three ways of preserving memory, culture, and history and passing it on to those who come behind you. As you walk inside of the vestibule of the, of the building, you're greeted by 16 statues of Minerva in two different forms. One statue shows you Minerva holding a globe um, and a scroll. It represents Minerva, goddess of knowledge and wisdom. The other statue shows you Minerva holding a torch and a sword, representing Minerva, goddess of war. And combined, they symbolize the idea that knowledge is power. And they serve to invite you into Minerva's temple of learning. Certain things are being reinforced over and over and over again. As, as I mentioned in last night's presentation and talking about the U.S. Customs House, these symbols are there in order to tell those with eyes to see the mind to comprehend what is really going on. They are a way of literally encoding secrets that are hidden in plain sight. White folk don't have to hide knowledge from you. They can put it right in front of your face. But if you're too lazy to read or to study, then you'll never be able to understand what has always been right at your fingertips. So then when you continue walking into the building, you come into the Great Hall. And <clears throat> you walk to the Great Hall, what you find in the center of the floor is this radiating starburst, which is made out of three different colors of marble. And in the center of the starburst is a brass medallion in the form of a uh, sun. And that sun is specifically serves as a compass, a compass rose. You see the four directions of the compass. Uh, north, south, east, and west. So it begs the question, why is there a compass in the center of the floor of the main of um, the great hall in the Library of Congress? Well, we, we all know that a compass gives one direction. So the idea that it's suggesting here is that this building gives direction. The question then is, to whom does the building give direction? The building gives direction to, and on the floor, there are a series of 12 circular medallions. And in each of those medallions is one of the 12 signs of the zodiac. So the building gives direction to everyone born under the 12 signs of the zodiac. There are also uh, a pair of sculpted images here and here. Those sculpted images also reinforce the fact that this room gives instruction or this building gives instruction to everyone from the four corners of the earth. It gives instruction to the Native American and the African. It gives instruction to the Asian and the Caucasian. It reinforces the fact that this building contains knowledge from all over the world. And those who want to know the world or master the world must come to this place.
to access these cultural memories. So as you continue walking to the building, you come into the main reading room, which is in the center of the building. In the main reading room, which sits under the, a dome in the center of the building, there's a painting in the collar of the dome. The painting is, was done by an artist by the name of Blashfield. It is the most famous work of art in the Library of Congress. And that painting <coughs> depicts the 11 epochs or great civilizations or cultures that contributed to the development of the United States of America. This painting is the clock that Dr. Clark talked about. The clock that people use to tell their political and cultural time and day. The compass that people use to find themselves on the map of human geography. This is the most famous work in the Library of Congress. And that clock consists of 12 figures. First figure here represents America. The last figure here represents, uh, excuse me, the first figure here is Egypt. The last figure here is America. And the clock moves counterclockwise, moving back, actually um, actually moving back into the future and the present. Beginning in Kemet, we have here 12 figures. Next to the figure is the name of the country uh, that uh, they represent, and below that name is that nation or that era's contribution to culture and civilization. So I want to run through these figures very briefly so that you can understand the significance of this painting. Egypt is the first figure. Kemet is the first figure. Egypt gave the world written records. Then comes Judea, which gave the world religion. Greece gave philosophy. Rome gave administration. Islam gave physics. The Middle Ages gave us our modern languages. Italy gave fine art. Germany gave printing. Spain gave discovery, France, England gave literature, France gave emancipation, and America gave the world science. And the person who represents America is the image of a young, beardless Abraham Lincoln. And the reason why the artist selected Abraham Lincoln was because Abraham Lincoln was born poor. Abraham Lincoln didn't know his dad. Abraham Lincoln was a failure in every activity that he attempted as a young man until he finally found his footing in politics and then went on to become the 16th president of the United States. Some say the greatest president in the United States. It's all relative. But the important thing is that Abraham Lincoln is depicted as an electrical engineer. America represents science. The representation of science in this instance is the literal definition of science from the Latin serre, which means to know. So America represents, uh, America is then the beneficiary of all of the knowledge that preceded it, and it is applying this knowledge in order to move forward and create its own history. So Lincoln is an electrical engineer. He's making a dynamo, and he's stumped. He's, he's, he's got to a point in the construction of this object where it, it can't work, and he doesn't know how to move forward. He's holding a book in one hand, and he's resting his chin, uh, his, his, his chin in his hand, and he's thinking, he is literally tapping into a stream of consciousness that goes back through the ages all the way to Kemet in order to define uh, the answer to the problem that he's stuck with. So we see here in the greatest institution of memory in the world that they acknowledge Egypt or Kemet as the source of all knowledge. So then let us move forward to Kemet and let us look at what we know about Egypt. The reality is the same people who taught us about George Washington taught us about Egypt. And so we're faced with a dilemma where we have to begin to unlearn what we have learned which is a process that requires deliberate and consistent effort. For example, and for those of you all who had the lecture yesterday, you all be quiet, okay, because you all know the answer. I just want to quiz folk in the audience tonight. What is the name of this structure here? Pyramid. Pyramid. Pyramid, all right. Uh, what is the name of this structure? Sphinx. Sphinx. What is the name of the 
country where these objects are found? Egypt. Egypt. Right? By virtue of your education, you all gave me incorrect answers. Because those words, pyramid, sphinx, and Egypt are Greek words. Those words came into existence thousands of years after these structures were already made. So we have to be able to put history in context so that we know whose history we're talking about. And what we'll find is that in most instances, we have been written, written out of our own history. Our history has been interpreted by the invaders of Africa. So we see our world through their eyes. We interpret our world, our reality, through their language, which is inadequate to describe our reality. So then the process of reclaiming our reality, reclaiming our ancestral memory, requires serious effort on our part. So for example, this building is not a pyramid. The Kemetic name for this structure, Kemet is the original name for the country that the Greeks call Egypt. Kemet means the land of the black people. Not the black soil, as National Geographic would have you believe, but the land of the black people. They were very clear about who they were. The structure is not a pyramid. Pyramid is a Greek word which means a little black cake, like a mm. pancake. Mm. That was the Greeks' way of disparaging the architectural accomplishments of the ancient Kemites. Oh, this, this building is nothing. This, this uh, what, 45-story building is nothing. It's just a little pancake. The Kemetic word for this structure is mir, M-I-R. Mir means place of ascension. Mirror were built over tombs. Some people were actually buried underneath the mirror. Why? Because this structure served symbolically as a resurrection machine. It was a place where the souls of the departed were resurrected into the afterlife, into the beautiful West. Totally different concept from pyramid, isn't it? So if you can't understand your own terminology and the history associated with your terminology, you will walk away believing that the Egyptians were pagan that they were evil. You won't know, you won't be able to access your historical cultural memory. This statue is not the Sphinx. Sphinx is a Greek word. A word that means to strangle or to hold. The story of the Sphinx, the name Sphinx comes from the story of um, uh, King Oedipus and the Sphinx, written by Sophocles. It's a story which literally turns the comedic story upside down. The image of Hera, the statue is called Her and Maquette, Heru on the horizon. It is the face of Heru, the son of Asar and Aset. If you understand the comedic story of Asar and Aset, you realize that Asar is the personification of the person that Christians will later come to know as the Christ. His is the first story in the recorded history of humanity of a person who was resurrected from the dead. And this is his son, who was conceived by the spirit of his father after his death. The spirit of father saw impregnated his virgin wife, Aset, and she gave birth to Heru, on December the 25th, at least 3,000 years before the birth of Jesus the Christ. So if you don't know your history and your story, it will be very difficult for you to begin to understand when someone has taken your story, turned it upside down, changed the names, and then presented it back to you as your only way to salvation. It's important that we understand the value of restoring our cultural memory, our cultural memory, not someone else's cultural memory. So this is a process. And so, you know, I, I, don't, I don't want you to feel bad if you don't know this. Just understand that we have been educated by people who have a vested interest in keeping us separated from knowledge of our history and culture. So once we know that, then it's our obligation to do everything within our power to free our minds by reading as much as we can about our history that has been written by our historians. 
and not someone else's historians. That's the only way we can move forward. So now with your minds partially restored, I want you to access your memories and let us return to the present moment. Hold on one second. And let me just ask you to identify a few things. Who is this? George Washington. George Washington. What is that? Washington's Monument. Who is that? A SAR. That is a SAR. And what is that? Obelisk. That is, no, it's not an obelisk. Obelisk is a Greek name. That is a SARS monument, which is known as a Tekken in Kemet. That, brothers and sisters, is the oldest symbol of resurrection known to man. I told you all that a SAR was the first person in recorded history who was resurrected from the dead. And that is the symbol that represents his resurrection. So you can begin to see how others have literally co-opted our history and the symbols associated with our history and use that knowledge in order to insert them in a place in history where they don't belong, where they have never belonged. Hijacking our historical and cultural memories in order to create an inappropriate place for them in history and in the consciousnesses people all over the world. So this is an important process, something that we can't take lightly. And so it is because of this that Dr. Carter G. Wilson established Negro History Week, and an opportunity to create a time and a space where we can become actively involved in the process of restoring our memory. And what we've come to understand in the years since that celebration was set in motion, Negro History Week evolved to become an entire month, and now it's known as, as uh, Black History Month, and some refer to it as African Heritage Month. It's an opportunity where we mentally and spiritually engage in restoring our cultural memory. And what we find is that as we slowly begin to regain our memory, it changes our thoughts and our behavior. Consequently, we no longer refer to ourselves as Negroes or colored people. In the 60s, we began calling ourselves black. In the 80s, we began calling ourselves African Americans. And in the 21st century, it's time we started calling ourselves Africans, because that is who we are. And if we identify ourselves as anything less, we will be less than who we are. And so what I've come to truly understand is that if the story of African people were a book of a thousand pages, then the story of our enslavement would begin on page 997 and would only be two pages long. But we have been conditioned to believe that that is when our story begins. And as a consequence, we have, as Dr. Clark has stated on numerous occasions, been written out of the respectable commentary of human history. And so I want us to think about the first 500 pages of this book of African history. They detail the birth and the development of human beings, humanity, homo sapiens sapiens. It's a Latin word that describes man with thought and with the capacity to know that he's thinking. Thinking, thinking man. Sapien means wise, a man with wisdom and has the wisdom to know that he's wise. So the first person with the capacity for thought were us, our ancestors. They only live in Africa. The oldest skeletal remains of Homo sapiens sapiens have only been found in Africa. It has been proven genetically that Africans have the oldest DNA of any human beings on the planet. And last year, October, 20, October 9th of last year, the Washington Post was an article that talked about um, what is now acknowledged as the oldest skeleton of a human being. Uh, that was found in Africa a decade ago, but they sat on this information for 10 years. It was the skeletal remains of a person that they have named Artie. Artie. Prior to that, the oldest skeleton was one that they named Lucy. <laughs> All right? Um, but the skeleton of Artie precedes Lucy by 1.5 million years. Geneticists have proven beyond a shadow of doubt that every human being on this planet carries within their 
bodies, the mitochondrial DNA that links them to a group of women who are still living in Africa today. So, as John Jackson said in the introduction to African civilization, there's only one race, the human race, which is African. There are those who have retained the African phenotype and others who have especiated or evolved to become the other so-called races that now populate the planet, but we were the first human beings to develop the first cultures and the first civilization. I want us to think about the fact, you know, uh, America's first so-called black president, Bill Clinton, moved into Harlem, right? And he was the first wave of that effort to, to bring Europeans back to Harlem. And as you said, brother, uh, Europeans are now the dominant population in Harlem. More white folk in Harlem today than there are black folk. They have taken over the hood. But I want you all to remember in um, 1998, when Clinton made one of his last trips to Africa, he landed first in Accra, Ghana. And when he stepped off the plane in Ghana, CNN showed it, but they didn't really broadcast what he said. But when he stepped off the plane in Ghana, he said to the world how proud he was to be in Africa, the birthplace of humanity. And then a week later, he was in uh, Cape Town, South Africa. He was interviewed by Tavis Mount. And he shared with Tavis that just uh, less than four months ago, um, scientists found uh, less than 100 miles from where they were taping that interview, the oldest human footprint on the planet. They didn't talk about that, but, but Clinton knew where he was. And he shared with those who had ears to hear the importance of African history and culture. I've traveled to, to Kemet 45 times since I made my first trip with Dr. Ben in 1980. And I want to share with you what I know, not what I believe. Belief is something you accept without proof. But knowledge is what matters. And what I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, that Kemet is the oldest documented nation state on record. Kemet was responsible for creating and giving to humanity, whether she did it intentionally or not, everything that is the foundation of culture and civilization and liter literacy and architecture and science and philosophy. It all sprang from the minds of African men and women on the Nile Valley. I want us to understand very clearly that African civilization thrived in the Nile River Valley for 3,000 years before the first Europeans came in and got a taste of civilization. And they took that small piece back to Europe with them, and only then did Europe begin to rise as a nation. And they conspired to marshal their forces and come back into Africa and take as much as they could. And in the process of taking, they had to erase the memory of what ancient Kemet was. And that's the reason why, in that historical clock, the ceiling of the Library of Congress begins with Egypt. It begins with Kemet, because they know. So if we look at pages 850 to 996, we would read about the great civilizations in Southern Africa, in Central Africa, in West Africa. Civilizations in Zimbabwe and Timbuktu and Songhai and Nigeria and Ghana and Mali. Great African civilizations that were literally erased with the onset of the European enslavement of African people. So on page 997 of this book of African history, we would begin to read about the European enslavement of African people, which lasted from 1444 until 1888. So within that period of time, we can say conservatively that 55 million African men, women, and children lost their lives. And that's a lowball figure. But let's just look at that figure. 55 million African men, women, and children stolen from their homelands, taken to Europe, North America, South America, and every island of the Caribbean where they were used to build up these nations 
at the expense of Africa, at the expense of this, of the African homeland. So this loss of life is, is almost impossible to, to calculate, but it is possible. And I submit to you that the loss of African life through the Maapa is the equivalent of the loss of life that America experienced on September 11, 2001, which is approximately 3,000 lives, is the equivalent of September 11 happening every day for 44 years and eight months. Can you imagine this continuous onslaught day after day after day after day for 44 years and eight months? That's what happened to us. That is the effort, the ongoing effort that, that went on to ensure that our memory was erased and that the erasure was forgotten. So that when somebody who looked like you tried to retrieve your memory, you said, nigga, you crazy. Here you come talking to that black stuff again. As if there's something wrong with you identifying with your essence. So we struggle to overcome these odds. And what I want to do is to take a moment and give you a a, a, a more dynamic visual representation of this comprehensive overview of history. And I want to share with you a, a, a timeline that a colleague of mine in the UK developed that uh, really helps to explain uh, who we were and where we were. And can I ask, can I have about uh, five brothers to come up here to the front of the room? I want to, uh, I want to uh, take this timeline and share it with the audience. I'd like for you all to hold it out. Okay, so you can start here on this end. And if you all can stand behind. Yeah, stand behind me, close to the stage. You always move down, so move down as far as you can. Stand behind me. Stand behind. Okay, that's good enough. That's good enough, brother. And Spike, can you move down a little bit? Okay. This is a timeline that my colleague developed in the UK. He was a history teacher. And so high school history teacher. So he found it's kind of difficult to get his students to relate to history. So he created this pictorial timeline that showed you African history and then related African history with specific individuals doing that, doing specific points in time in history. And then he begins to contrast African history with other aspects of world history and culture. So then we began 5200 BCE here in Kemet, in Africa, the oldest documented civilization on Earth. We have the beginnings of Medunetra, we have the beginnings of Kemetic concept of spirituality, the beginnings of writing, the beginnings of architecture, the beginnings of philosophy, and then uh, right here, we begin to have images of personalities who are responsible for developing the nation. We have Narmer here, who unified the two lands of Kemet. We have here Ptah, who is a nature associated with creation. We have here the pyramid buildings. We have Imhotep, who is responsible for creating the step pyramid, the first man-made structure of stone. We have an image of Zoser here. So we can see the people associated with these moments in time and history. Then we have the, the mirror at Giza, and images of Khufu, Khafra, Menkara. So we can see the African faces of the African people who are responsible for creating their history. This is the first golden age of Kemet when all of the pyramids were built, dynasties three, four, five, and six. We see here images of other historical African personalities, and you can see their faces. They're all African people. The Greeks haven't come into Kemet yet. The Romans have not come in yet. The Arabs have not come in yet. So by going to the historical records, we can see clearly who these people were. We don't have to make up history. You just go to the records. The records are still here. Kemet suffered a period of uh, internal disorder, uh, the second period of, of confusion, when Asiatics invaded Kemet for the first time in its history, approximately 150 years. And then we had, uh, well, actually, I forgot the second golden age, uh, dynasties 11 through 12, when all of the great literature of Kemet was written. The spiritual text, the great literary text, the wisdom text, it's all documented, it's all there. For anybody with the mind and curiosity to seek out for themselves and empower themselves, 
Here's a period of uh, internal disorder and invasion of Kemet. The Europeans or the Asiatics only conquered the northern part of Kemet. They never went up south. They never went into Waset, the capital. They never went into Nubia. They only controlled a very small portion of the nation. And when they were driven out, they left Kemet. It was only then that they left with the God concept. They didn't have it before they went, were in Africa. And then we have here the third golden age, dynasties 18 and 19, when all of the grand temples were built. Temple of Luxor, Temple of Karnak, Abu Simbel. Period of great uh, engineering uh, and, and temple construction. And then we have here, uh, again, all the personalities associated with African history and culture. And as we see on this timeline, we have a third intermediate period when civilization in Kemet fell again. And then the last great walk in the sun for African people was during the fourth golden age when the 25th dynasty conquered Egypt and restored the land and allowed Africa to experience, allowed Kemet to experience what Dr. Clark referred to as its last great walk in the sun. And then when the 25th dynasty ended, the end of Kemet began to exist. Foreigners then occupied Kemet from that point on. First the Persians and then other Europeans. And if we look at this timeline, it is only here, around 832, that Homer, the first European to write a book, comes on the scene. Thousands of years after the great literary period in ancient Kemet. So we can contrast our story to their story and turn our world right side up. It's only here in 753 when Romulus and Remus found the city of Rome. So we can put them into their correct historical context. And then it's only here when uh, Alexander conquers Egypt and the Egyptians begin to become white, non-African. And at the end, after the end of Black Kemet, after the end of Black Kemet, and then there's other periods of Kemetic history. Another important point that uh, my colleague noted in this map is that 1200 BC, according to the research of Dr. Ivan Van Sertima, 1200 BCE is when Africans from the Nile Valley began to build ships, navigate the Nile River, the Mediterranean Sea, the Atlantic Ocean, and began coming to America. So Africans traveled to the Americas between 1200 and 600 BCE. We did come before Columbus. So then, this is when Jesus was born in the year zero. So all of this happened thousands of years before the birth of Jesus Christ. The story of Asar set in Heru preceded the story of Jesus the Christ. And it's all there for us to see. It's all there for us to understand if we are courageous enough to take this leap of consciousness to free our minds. And it is a, 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 a leap of consciousness. And then the important thing that I want to share with you is this period right here in blue. From here to here, 1444 to 1888, this is the period of enslavement, the European enslavement of African people. So for most of us, this is where our history begins, with the slave trade, with slavery. So if we allow others to establish this as our point of cultural memory, it means that we are missing out on all of this knowledge all of this science, all of this philosophy, all of this data that can empower us to become the men and women that we truly are. And unfortunately for many of our folks, we're stuck here. We're still lamenting what happened to our ancestors two, three, four hundred years ago because we don't know that we have the capacity, we have the right to tap into all of these memories. That's your birthright. So the purpose of history is to help us restore our memory so that we know where to go in this clock of human history, where we can go to retrieve information that will help us to move forward to create a future that we design mm -hmm. and stop living somebody else's reality, which is our nightmare. Cool. And then the other thing that the brother did was, you understand that all history is a current event. You study history in order to understand where you've been, where you are, and where you're going to go. You apply the knowledge of the past in order to determine where not only you're going to go, but where your great, 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 great grandchildren are going to go. If you can't think and plan for seven generations in the future, you are wasting air. If you can't begin to plan now, 
for 150 years into the future, you're not living. You're not free. You're not doing what free men and women are supposed to do. So he extends our timeline into the future by tapping into the knowledge of, of our scholars, Dr. Ben and Dr. Clark and Obinga and, and, and Sister Marimba and a host of others who have given us the knowledge that will show us the way forward. This is where we are. And we have to make a conscious choice today whether or not we're going to begin to embrace the memories of the past and they began to use their knowledge to determine where we're going in the future. Thank you. Can you roll that up for me, please, brother? So then, <laughs> how does then become, how willing are we to use the resources that we have at our disposal in order to ensure that our children are prepared for a future that we desire? Everybody in this room pays taxes. And the lion's share of your taxes goes to support a school system that is miseducating your children and everyone else's children. And the only reason that happens is because we are either too lazy or too afraid or too disorganized to do anything about it. Brother Oliver here was talking about what we did back in the 50s and the 60s in order to control our destiny. We're still riding on the coattails of the decisions that they made 40 and 50 years ago. It's time for us to start making some real decisions about our future and the future of our children because the, the, the humanity of the world depends on us beginning, to, just place it right there on the table, brother, depends on us beginning to accept our rightful place as the mothers and fathers of civilization once again. So there is a direct correlation between ancestral memory, power, cultural capital, and health. If you don't know who you are, you won't be able to understand how to live for life. And you will spend your time and energy <laughs> living a life in which uh, you're already dead, you just haven't died yet. There's a brother uh, who is becoming a, a, a good friend of mine Brother Tom Morell, who spoke this morning over at the um, Alpha Conference, authored a book called Brainwashed, challenging the, challenging the myth of black inferiority. It is a book that I would highly recommend that every one of you go out, purchase, and study. It is a book not to be read. It is a book to be studied. Brainwashed by Tom Morell. Tom Morell was one of the first American Africans to started an advertising agency in 1971. And when he retired from his company, Burrell Communications, in uh, 2005, it was the largest uh, black-owned advertising agency in the world. It had annual receipts of almost uh, $200 million a year. He was a major player in advertising. He was the person responsible for producing ads that showed us for the first time in a positive light, not just as consumers, but people who had some value and people who were worthy of some respect. And so since he's retired, he has now taken his energies to begin to look at how we have been conditioned to buy things we don't need. He talks about how we have bought into this myth of black inferiority. And as a consequence, black folks spend more money on household cleaning appliances than any other people in this country. Because we believe that black is inferior, black is dirty, so we spend more money psychologically, we spend more money buying cleaning goods, trying to clean the blackness out of our skin. You know the tidy bowl, this little blue gadget that you put in your toilet to make the water blue? Black folk buy 85% of that product. We have been brainwashed. We have been conditioned to believe in our own inferiority. And what he does with, with, uh, with, with great intelligence and with a plethora of facts and details is shows how the media has conditioned us to work against our own best interests. And he shows in each chapter of the book the short-term and long-term effects of our ignorance. He has chapters on black-on-black uh, -black relationships, why we can't stay together. He's got a chapter on 
um, why we uh, eat ourselves to death. And being the advertising genius that he is, he comes up with these magnificent catchphrases uh, that, that really uh, allow the, the concepts to stick in your mind. He talks about how black folks suffer from, uh, we're at the top of every worst disease list in the United States. We have the highest incidence of prostate cancer. Black men in the United States have the highest incidence of prostate cancer. Black men in Washington, D.C., the capital, the wealthiest, most powerful nation on earth, have the highest incidence of prostate cancer on the planet. So with all the education we got in Washington, D.C., with all the money that we got in Washington, D.C., we are dying more. Black men are dying more in greater numbers than any other black men on the planet. Black women have the highest rate of cervical and breast cancer of any females on the planet. We have the highest incidence of diabetes. We have the highest incidence of people on, um, on kidney dialysis. Because of diet one, and he refers to this process of us killing ourselves through the food that we eat as suicide. We literally eat ourselves to death. Eat ourselves to death. And you can drive through any black neighborhood in the country and you see evidence of us eating ourselves to death. All this fried food, all this pork. That's suicide. And we don't have enough historical awareness to realize that that's slave food. That's not food that we ate in Africa. That was part of our diet when we were enslaved here in America because as Malcolm said in one of his lectures, white folk ate high on the hog. They ate the best part of the hog. If you're going to eat hog, eat the best part of the hog. But we eat everything but the oil. We, we, we ate low on the hog, the feet, the tail, the snout. And what's lower than chitlin? We ate that stuff, but, but mama cooked that with love. She infused all that funk with love and made it taste good, but we didn't realize we were eating ourselves to death. Sugar runs in the family. Diabetes runs in the family. That's because you're eating the same stuff that your mama ate, your grandmama ate. Change your diet and you change your relationship to health. It's Sesame Street simple. It's not rocket science. Change your diet, change the intake of the things that come into your body, you change the chemistry of your body. It is simple. But we've been conditioned to be a people who are moved by emotion and taste, appetites. And this is a false way of living. This is a faulty way of living. This is a disastrous way of living because as Brother Alva says, next year we'll have a net worth of over a trillion dollars. We'll have a net worth of the seventh largest nation in the United States. In the world. In the world, I'm sorry, in the world. Spain. We got all this money. What do we own? What institutions do we have? So we're at a point in our lives where we can no longer afford to act like we don't know. Because folk have a plan for us. They don't need us anymore. Because they got Hispanics to do what we used to do. So they can escalate the process of us killing ourselves. There's a chapter in, in Tom, uh, Tom Morell's book called Homicide. Why black folk kill each other. And the numbers are startling. You all see it right here in Brooklyn. Every single week, you're reading stories about black folk who are killing other black folk for no reason whatsoever. There's a chapter in there about uh, comedians, who, which he refers to as the new neo-coons. Why the laugh is always on us. Why are we the only people who laugh at things that are embarrassing? We're the only people who will pay money to listen to comedians curse you out. Every other word is profanity. B and H and S and all of this nonsense. And we, and we laugh as if it's funny. So we've got to do a serious reevaluation of what it means to be the descendant of kings and queens and artisans and craft persons and nobles. And either we're going to start acting like it or we need to shut the hell up and stop pimping our ancestors. Because they don't deserve to be pimped that way. We got the best in us. And it's time for us to start acting like it.
I want to share this good news with you uh, to, to wind this session down because I can talk about this stuff you know, forever. But I just want to encourage you all to go out and buy Brainwash. My time, but I'm not even pushing my own books. Go out and buy Brainwash. Uh, it's a book which... Brainwash me first. That's my bookstore. Brother, where's your bookstore? It's uh, 492 <laughs> Nostrand Avenue. And what is the name of your bookstore? True South. True South Books. Are you open now? Uh, <laughs> you know, open now. Brainwash. Buy that book and study that book. We're going to talk about, uh, oh, the sister's got a copy. Sister, sister, can, can, can you bring the copy of the book up here for a second? Have, have a brother bring the book up here. Don't walk up here. Have a brother bring the book up here. You know. Can I say that he will be at Abyssinia? Oh, that's right. On Sunday. 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. Sunday. Go see. Go see Tom Morrell, all right? Go see Tom Morrell. And when you see him, tell him Tony Browder sent you, all right? Tell him Tony Browder sent you. This is a magnificent book. The first 11 chapters, he talks about the problems that we're confronted with. In the last chapter, the 12th chapter, he deals with solutions to the problems. All right? So this is an unusual book in that regard. It is, I, I shared with Tom last week, that in my humble estimation, this is the 21st century version of the miseducation of the Negro. The brainwashing of the Negro. And he gives us the blueprint for how we can begin to dry clean our minds. Right. Chapter 12 talks about using the media, the most powerful form of mass communication, mental manipulation, mental mani manipulation ever devised. How we can use the media, the internet, social media networks, cell phones, web pages, YouTube, how we can use this to spread truth and light all over our communities. It's a powerful tool and it's cheap. So we're going to give you some suggestions as to how you can become involved in this process of freeing your mind. I love the fact that he begins the book with a quote from Malcolm in the introduction. And that quote is a quote that you all have heard dozens and dozens of times. You've been misled. You've been had. You've been took. You've been brainwashed. And it's time for you to dry clean your mind. You've got to do it. White man's not going to do it for you. Your mama's not going to do it for you. Your daddy's not going to do it for you. Jesus ain't going to do it for you. You've got to do it because you have within you the power and the ability to determine your own destiny. It is your birthright. It is in your DNA. Once you understand that, then it becomes a simple thing to do. So let me share with you this news that I'm very excited about. You all are the second audience that I'm sharing this information with. Um, in 2008, I was in Egypt uh, working on, uh, doing some research for a new book, and a colleague of mine, an Egyptian colleague of mine, uh, came to my apartment and said that, uh, that there's a person that, uh, that I should meet. And this person is a, uh, a Russian Egyptologist by the name of Dr. Lina Kishtakova, who lives here in New York City, who was trained, came to the United States in 1990. Uh, got a degree from NYU in Egyptology, trained under Bernard Bothmuller, who was at that time the foremost authority on the art and the architecture of the 25th Dynasty. The 25th Dynasty is that era in Kemetic history. It is the era of the, the last of the four golden ages, Africa's last great walk in the sun. It is the only period in Kemetic history that European Egyptologists acknowledged was ruled by black pharaohs. We know better, but they give us the 25th dynasty. Why? Because the kings from the 25th dynasty came from Kush. Kemet, <laughs> Kemet was as knocked out as, as uh, George Foreman was in the Roman in the jungle. Right. Kemet was flat on his back. And so the Kushite kings came into Kemet, drove out the Libyans, drove out the Assyrians, and restored order from the south to the north. And then they underwent a massive rebuilding project. First, Pianke, then his brother, Shabaka. And then their sons followed in their footsteps. They gave us an example of what black men did when they were in control of their destiny. It is a model that we can use today, that our black men throughout the United States can use today. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. 
The information is already here waiting for us to tap into. So Dr. Lena Pistakova worked for the Metropolitan Museum. She was involved in excavating and conserving a number of, of, of tombs uh, in Egypt, specifically in, in Luxor. In her spare time, she was looking for these tombs, these 25th Dynasty tombs that she had read about in a 19th century book written by uh, a couple of uh, British travelers who had seen the tomb. She also had read a book by a uh, German uh, architect by the name of Eigner, who had visited that tomb in the 1970s. She knew that these were important tombs, built in the early part of the, of the 25th dynasty. She had a general idea of where they were. So in her spare time, working for the Metropolitan Museum, she began to use her money to hire workers to dig in an area known as South Assisi. And in 2005, she found the tomb. And so when she came to her employer and told her employer of her discovery, this 25th Dynasty tomb, the 25th Dynasty tomb is an era of, it is the era of Ibrahim and Misu, the repetition of the birth. It is documented as the first renaissance in recorded history, where Africans were physically involved in reconstituting the land of their ancestors. And in these images that she found, in this tomb, specifically the tomb of Karakamun, who was the first Ak priest of the Temple of Karnak. In this tomb, built 2,700 years ago, she found images of this African wearing the same clothing of his ancestors who were the pyramid builders in the first golden age who lived 2,000 years earlier. She found him sitting on the same furniture, same style of furniture as his ancestors had 2,000 years earlier. So it represented what they already knew, that the 25th dynasty was an era of retroactive remembrances. Sankofa, going back and, and accessing the memories of the past and bringing them into the present moment so that you can create a future for the children who are coming behind you. And it's all documented and it's all African. So she went to her employer, Metropolitan Museum, told them of her discovery, and they told her, leave it alone. Walk away from it. But, but this, is, this is history. It shows you that the black people from Kush were the same black people as the ones who built the pyramid. Those are not your people. Leave them alone. So this courageous woman quit her job. Used her own money, her 401k, to finance the excavation. And when she ran out of money, she used her daughter's college fund to pay for it. So when I met her in July of 2008, she had run out of money. And she was afraid. Maxed out her credit cards, didn't know where she was going to turn. I was introduced to her by a colleague. She was apprehensive of me at first. You know, who are you and what are you? And we talked a little bit, and I felt her heart, felt that she was sincere. And then she took me down into the tomb, and when I saw what was there, I knew that this is something that I needed to get involved with. And I made a commitment to her that I would get the word out. I would let folk know what you have here. That I will raise money so that we can see to it that this history is restored. So we cultivated a relationship, and in 2009, I took a first, my first group of folk over to Egypt to participate in this process, in this excavation. We financed the excavations of 2008, 2009. We made some incredible discoveries. 2010, we financed that year's excavation. This past summer, we took a total of 13 people over to participate in the excavation. She's got students coming from, from all over the world to participate in this. PhD students, master's students from universities in Arizona, universities in England, white folk coming to learn about our history so that they can become the experts to tell our story. We were there for a different purpose. And we were there because we financed all of the work that was going on. And we struck pay dirt last month. So I want to share with you very briefly what we found. And this project that we have, uh, this is the image of Karakamos, the priest, the first Ak priest of the Temple of Karnak. The project is called the Asa Restoration Project, named in honor of Dr. Asa G. Hilliard who passed in Egypt 
August 13, 2007. He was there for the ASCAT conference when he fell ill. He was hospitalized in Cairo and passed in Cairo. So Dr. Hillier was my colleague. Dr. Hillier was my, my spiritual father, my guide, my brother. He wrote the introduction to my first book on the Browder file. And so I felt, what better way could I honor my brother than to name this project after him? I went to Atlanta, I spoke with his family, I received their blessings and their permission, so we established the Asia Restoration Project, which is a nonprofit entity, which means that any contribution you made to this project can legally be written off as a tax-deductible expense. So, this is what we're doing. This is South Ossetia. This is the area where the excavations are currently taking place. South Ossetia is in Luxor, Egypt, on the west bank of Luxor, Egypt. Um, right near the Valley of the Kings. For those of you who have been to Kemet, if you've gone to the Temple of Hatshepsut, you've driven right past this site. There used to be village right here, homes. A village that was run by the uh, Abdullah Rasul family, who was the chief of the village. The Rasuls are the greatest tomb robbers in the history of Egypt. For over 200 years, they robbed the tombs of our ancestors and sold their artifacts on the white market to tourists, financed their lifestyle at our historical and cultural expense. And Dr. Lena found the three tombs there, the tomb of Karabashkin. Karabashkin was the mayor of Waset, Luxor, or Thebes. That was the capital of Kibbutz. He was appointed mayor under the rulership of Pianke. So this is the beginning of the 25th dynasty. Karakamun was the first high priest of the temple of Karnak, the largest uh, temple complex ever built by human beings. He was responsible for doing the morning libations at the uh, chapel of Amun in the temple of Karnak. And then there's the 26th dynasty tomb of Itieru. Itieru was the sister who was the chief attendant to the divine consort of the wife of Amun. Important tombs. So as a result of her discoveries, last year the Egyptian government came in and removed all of the homes so that we would have free access to this site to do our excavation work. So this is what we're doing. This is an image from last year. This is a photograph of the same area from this year, last month. Actually, July. Um, and so what we see here is the open courtyard, the first open um, pillared hall of this tomb. I want you all to see this tomb of Karakamun in your mind. This tomb is 40 feet underground, literally carved out of limestone. So this tomb is not architecture, it's sculpture. So you had in the first pillared hall eight pillars that were four-sided pillars that have um, on three of the four sides three of the hours of the day. So four pillars on one side were the 12 hours of day, four pillars on the other side were the 12 hours of night. So the idea was that the spirit of Karakamun moved through this first pillared hall on his way to the second pillared hall where his burial chamber was. And as he walked along this corridor, he was surrounded by the words that his soul must say that his heart is about to be weighed on the scale of my eye. This is a way of ensuring that this brother will be my Karu, the truer voice. All of this was destroyed by the Greeks, by the Romans, by the Arabs. The ceiling of this tomb collapsed in the 1990s. And that collapse probably saved this tomb from further destruction. So all of this was covered with sand. It all had to be removed. So you got to pay for the workers, got to pay for the supplies. Here is the pillars in the first pillar hall. This is the excavation that we did last year. This year, we are focusing our energies on the second pillar hall, which is right through this entranceway here. So we've covered uh, seven of the pillars with mud bricks in order to protect them as the workers are moving back and forth so that they aren't damaged. They're all covered with metal netrics. They were originally about 10 feet high, they're now stumps maybe about three and a half, four feet high because they've all been destroyed. When the ceiling collapsed, they fell. So we're going through all of this debris to find the fragments so that we can reconstruct 
this tomb. And here is one pillar here that we're literally in the process of reconstructing right now. That was one of the goals for this year. So here's a detailed shot of that first pillar. We have a group of conservators who are consolidating the stone so that we can have new limestone placed on top of the missing pieces so that we can reconstruct this pillar and then insert the pieces of the metanetra that we found within the debris so that ultimately we can reconstruct the entire tomb and open it to the public. So here's a shot that was taken in early July. Uh, we hired uh, a stone cutter to cut the blocks of limestone <coughs> to specific dimensions so that they could be inserted uh, onto this pillar. Uh, the workers are drilling holes into the stone, inserting steel rods, cementing these pieces together so that it will be consolidated and be able to ultimately hold a ceiling so that we can recreate this entire environment. And then here's the last shot that was taken in August just before we shut down at the end of the season. So this column now is about 10 feet high. We have to do the same thing to the eight, to the seven additional columns in that first courtyard. It costs approximately $10,000 just to reconstruct this one column. So this is a endeavor that is going to require funds, consistent funds. It's gonna take anywhere from seven to uh, about seven years, five to seven years to complete this work. And Europeans have already said they're not paying for it because they don't want this story to be public. So we have an opportunity right now to spend our dollars to help tell our story. So here's another shot of uh, the first pillar hall. This is the area where we concentrated our, our efforts. And so uh, we're now working in the area of the second pillar hall. This is the view that shows you the first pillar hall, and this is the area where we concentrated all of our excavations this season. And so I'm over there in July, getting the lay of the land, getting the feel of the, of the, of, of the tomb. Over there with, with Egyptologists, over there with uh, students who are, have gotten their PhDs in Egyptology and their masters in, PhD, masters in Egyptology, and I don't have a degree in Egyptology. No, I just have an interest and the information. But I'm here with an agenda. I'm here with money, bringing money to the table to make all of this possible. And I have a vested interest in seeing that the story of Karakamun is told, seeing that his spirit is finally honored after being desecrated for over 2,000 years. Mm -hmm. And so as I'm moving through this environment, I'm literally tapping into the consciousness of Karakamun, tapping into the people who built this sacred space asking them for permission to be there doing this work, asking them to help us, help me understand where it is we should concentrate our energies because we don't have a lot of money. You can't afford to be just digging anywhere. Tell me where we should dig. Tell me where we can maximize our efforts. And so, I don't know if it was Karakamoon or who said, Brother, tell them to dig right in this area. So I tell Dr. Lena, why don't you have the workers here concentrate Right at this spot right here. This is where you're going to find the stairs. Two days later, Dr. Lena, Tony, Tony, we found it. We found the stairs. So by mid-July, we found the first stairs that led down to the burial chamber. By August, they had opened up the entrance to the burial chamber. This is my door at Atlantis. Right? And... Uh, so we went inside of this chamber. Let me just give you a brief overview of what we saw, what we found. And this is what made news last week. As a matter of fact, uh, today they, they announced it on the town during the morning show. All right, so it's going national now. All right, so hopefully our folk will begin to respond. We'll get money, we'll get, we'll get materials, we'll get more people involved in the process so that we can be guaranteed of completing the work. This is my daughter crawling through the rubble, coming inside of this burial chamber. And no, we were not afraid, right? because we're doing good work, because we are protected by our ancestors. We're not here as tomb robbers. We're here as, as tomb restorers. Right? Big difference, big difference. Here's Dr. Lena coming in behind Atlantis. And then you come into the main area of the burial chamber, which is some 10 feet below the ground of the floor of the tomb. Now, the tomb is 40 feet below ground level. This, 
initial chamber is 10 feet below that, 50 feet below ground level. And then we find this shaft, which extends down 30 feet into the stone. So we're now 80 feet below the surface. We didn't have a 30 foot long ladder. We had a couple of 15 foot ladders. So what the workers did was tie two ladders together. <laughs> and we climbed down this ladder into the burial chamber. And again, no, we were not afraid because we were doing our ancestors' work. And we were protected by them. So here, Atlantis is climbing down the ladder. And then this is what we found inside the burial chamber. This is inside of the burial chamber, inside of the tomb of Karakamun. Hey, right. hey, 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 hey. So now, hey. this is what Zahir Watts and the Supreme Council of Antiquities released the press release on last week, announcing to the world this discovery. So it's important for us to understand that American Africans, us, financed this. We made it possible. And so, as my daughter and I had reached the bottom of the ladder, and about to go into the burial chamber, I said, baby, I want you to go in first. Because I want you to be the first American African to go inside of this tomb. Right. So here we are. The tomb, the burial chamber, is about 12 feet wide, 18 feet long. Height from floor to ceiling is approximately 7 feet. But the Rasuls beat us there. They had already robbed the tomb. They had already desecrated the sacred space. Uh, and not only did they steal the artifacts, but in their effort to cover their tracks, they filled the room with debris. Ooh. So we're sitting on a pile of rubble that's approximately four feet high. So we only have about three feet clearance between the rubble and the ceiling in this small environment. So I want, you, I want to show you some highlights of this space. Right? On the ceiling is an image of Newt, the Netcher who represents the sky, who swallows the sun when it sets in the west and gives birth to it in the east as Kepre. Mm. So this ceiling is covered with celestial and astronomical scenes to guide the soul of Karaka Moon as he makes his journey to the beautiful west. Mm. Right? So here is a more detailed image. Look at that African face. Look at that Nubian face. Huh? So when you're in charge of, of telling your story, you can depict your images of your ancestors, of your nature in your image. Because that's what free people do. As Dr. Ben said a long time ago, man was not made in the image of God. God was made in the image of man. Because man created the concepts of God in order to allow his mind to move forward into a world that the nature created. So we create images of the natural that look like us because we're exercising our prerogative. Why? Because we are the natural's chosen king. Because we chose the natural. Right? That's how it works. Can you repeat that, my brother? God is not made of what? Well, the, the, the idea, the concept is free people choose their relationship with the creator, choose their relationship with God. And free people create God of the natural in their own image. So we made the choice to choose our relationship with God. We were the first chosen people known to man. So when you know that, it changes your whole attitude. It changes your consciousness. It changes your relationship with this force, this power that we call God. Because it exists within you. It is in every cell in your body. And when you know that, it creates a relationship that allows you to do anything. And that's why we did and how we did what we did when we were in Kimmy. No people on the planet have done what we've done. That demonstrates our relationship with the natural, our relationship with God. No people on the planet have ever had that quality of a relationship with deity as we have. So we need to stop looking to other people's concept of God and return home. Be true to ourselves. Be true to what? Our God. Be true to our native land. So then, here is 
an image of uh, celestial figures, constellations in the heavens. This is how we go home. These were the first people to give humanity a concept of heaven, a concept of the salvation of the soul, a concept of judgment, a concept of resurrection. These were all concepts that sprang from the minds of African men and women in the Nile Valley when we knew who we were and demonstrated that knowledge every day of our lives. Stars in the heavens. Five for the stars which represent your body, head, two arms, two legs. That's why all stars that we see on the flags of all countries have five points on them. That's a comedic invention. That's a Cushite invention. And what we know through the real study of history, what we know when we study Chancellor Williams, the author of Destruction of Black Civilization, Kemet is Ethiopia's oldest daughter. So the culture really begins further south and further east. And it's all connected. It's all interrelated. I had some wonderful conversations with some Egyptologists from all over the world who are not uh, held in check by some of the racist views in America. And they were telling me things about, about the relationship between the Kemites and the modern-day Sudanese and the modern-day Ethiopians, that they're all part of the same culture. They have the same oral traditions. We don't get that information here. No. But folk know that. So it's time for us to begin to do the research, do the primary research, and share that knowledge with the rest of our brothers and sisters. So here's Aladdin again. Here's Dr. Lena. Here's Hassan. Hassan is the person that introduced me to Dr. Lena uh, three years ago. Okay, Part of our our family, part of our uh, extended family. And then here's Atlantis. Atlantis and I spent a week in this burial chamber excavating, recording, and photographing the objects that we found. I want you all to take note of what she's holding in her hand. She is holding the mummified head of a child. So what we found in this burial chamber were the remains of two adults and a child. So it is our belief that this was the burial chamber for Karaka Moon, his wife, and their child. We found in this tomb two skulls. I told you these were all mummified remains that the Rasul family violated in the worst way imaginable. Mm -hmm. Tore apart these bodies, tore apart the caskets to get to the gold to get to the jewelry, to get to the papyrus scrolls that were buried within their body, that were wrapped within uh, the, the bandages, so that they could sell this to finance their lifestyle. That proves beyond a shadow without that these are not their ancestors. They wouldn't do that to their Arab ancestors. And if they were truly Egyptians, they wouldn't do it to their Egyptian ancestors. They are invaders, and they prove their point over and over and over again. So it is our responsibility as the wealthiest African people on the planet, as the best educated African people on the planet, it is our responsibility to save the motherland. That's right. Mm -hmm. And to tell our story to the world. Speak on it, brother. Right? So that's what we're doing. We found a jawbone. So we're, we're, we're finding body parts. Mm. We're doing what a set did when she went searching for the missing parts of Asar's body. We are literally remembering our history and our culture. Mm -hmm. It was a special time down there. Mm -hmm. We were down there in the studio seven hours a day, a week. Felt his spirit. Felt the, felt the spirit of his family. With their doing their work. Found a mummified arm. You can still see the wrapping, the mm. linen wrapping. His arm, the bone. His arm is still inside. Mm. These people have no respect, no. none whatsoever. Yes, sir. Those are the original colors of the tomb that was created 2,700 years ago. Mm. 2,700 years. 
Uh, a lot of it has been destroyed. You can see the ceiling is flaked. And, and <laughs> we found hundreds and hundreds of fragments of the ceiling. So part of, of our job over the course of the next two, three years is to try to assemble as many of those fragments back to the ceiling as we can to reconstruct this ceiling. Restore this sacred space. So, so here's a shot of uh, the staircase after we cleaned the entire area. So this is what it looked like. Stairs leading down to the burial chamber. There are 15 stairs leading down to the burial chamber. Here's a shot from inside of the burial chamber looking out. 15 stairs leading down. There's a vestibule here. And then there's another uh, ramp staircase with seven stairs, which leads you into the actual burial chamber itself. We paid to have all of this excavated. That happened on our dime. That happened because of us. And I'm proud of what we did. Uh, I want the world to know what we did. So here's a photograph of our team. This was the August team that was there, brothers and sisters who paid their way to come to Kemet to work for two weeks on this site. Right? Um, and as I'm moving around, folks say, you know, you look a lot like the Rocket Moon, you know? So maybe his spirit is working through me to make all of this happen. I can accept that. I like to think that. But this quote here is, 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 is a quote that I just, uh, I paraphrase a quote from King Costa, who was the father of Pianke and Shabaka. And his quote, um, he was the king of Kush, and he initiated the first effort to restore the land of his ancestors. He died before they marched into Kemet, so his son Pianke continued his father's work. And when Pianke died, his brother Shabaka continued his father's work. And then when they died, their sons continued their efforts because they knew where they were going, they knew what they had to do. And so, Costa's uh, statement says that there is no past, present, or future, but they all exist simultaneously. So this, there's this thing, this eternal now, which we are involved in. So we can be as free as we want to be, but we have to want to be free. We have to know that we deserve to be free and know that there is something to protect and to pass on to those who come behind us. We've got the tools at our disposal right now to liberate ourselves. So we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We don't have to invent history of culture. We don't have to make nothing up. We have all the evidence right now. All we need to do is to have the desire to spread the word to as many people as possible. So this is what we're doing with the Acer Restoration Project. We are working to do three primary things. The Acer Restoration Project is dedicated to the restoration of the Kushite presence in Kemet and the preservation of the legacy of Dr. Asa G. Hill. And anybody who doesn't know that Dr. Hilliard's life isn't worth preserving doesn't know Jack. He was a man who gave his life to African people. Right? One of our most brilliant scholars. So, three-pronged project. One, we are looking for 400 people to make a tax-deductible pledge of $10 a month for one year. That will give us the $40,000 a year that we need to work on these tools, to do the excavation, the conservation, and the restoration. 400 people, that ain't a lot of people. So if you stop spending your money at these other shops here in Brooklyn and Chicago and D.C. and elsewhere, you'll have more than enough money to finance our future. And that's what we're talking about doing. What we also want to do, we'd like to be able to take at least 40 people back to Kimmy next year for the excavation season so that you can be involved, physically involved in the process for those who want to go. And I'm telling you right now, we only want people who are willing to work. We work six days a week from 6 o'clock in the morning to 1 o'clock in the afternoon in 115, 120 degree temperature. So if you're not willing to work, we don't need you there. We don't need folk complaining. We don't need folk crying. We don't need Stay here, send your money and stay. We need workers. Workers. And the third component, which is also important, for those who can't go, for whatever reason, what we want to establish are cultural circles. Cultural circles are action-oriented study groups that we're going to establish. <laughs> These cultural circles we have named in honor of Dr. Ivan Van Circle. The whole purpose of the cultural circle is to put together a curriculum where we're focusing solely on three texts. These are action-oriented study groups. 
Black folk been talking forever. It's time for us to act. So these are action-oriented study groups. What we're doing is coming together to study three texts. The first text is Dr. Hilliard's book, Sabre, The Reawakening of the African Mind. The second text is my book, Now Valley Contributions to Civilization. The third, third text is Dr. Hilliard's DVD, uh, Master Keys. So that will be our curriculum. We're understanding the, the four golden ages of Kemet to be able to put that knowledge into a historical context and then once you have mastered that information, we then want to train people to be able to go out into communities and to teach this information. Take the schools and churches and organizations and meetings so that we can begin to tell our story. Right? We want to be able to provide you with the information. We want to be able to provide you with the slides so that you can tell the story. You ain't got to make nothing up. You don't have to argue with white folks. You just tell the truth. And the truth will free our minds and our behinds. And so then, the whole essence of this project, we're, we're future oriented, we're action oriented. You all know this man, right? Will Smith. Will Smith is, 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 is the man in Hollywood right now. Time Magazine referred to Will Smith as the $2 billion man. Everything he touches turns to gold. Will Smith. What did he give back? Brother, Will Smith, his wife, and Jay Z financed, produced Fela. All right? A serious piece. If you ain't seen Fela, brother, you, you, you slacking. Go see Fela. It's a powerful story. They're using their money and doing what they can. They, they're giving back in many different ways. They can't do it overtly because they lose their job. All right? All right? They're using their money, just like many actors and actresses, entertainers during the civil rights era. They couldn't come out publicly and denote and, and donate money to the movement. But they did that thing so they can keep their job, keep their profile, make some money, and they fund, they finance a lot of the work. So we gotta be clear about who's doing what. And we need to kind of temper our, our critiques and criticisms of folk until we check them out thoroughly. We gotta stop gossiping and, and, and stop tearing each other down. Because that's all part of the brainwashing. Right? We're standing on the threshold of a new point in time in history. We ain't got time to be fighting each other. Right. It's time to do the work and work with people who have demonstrated that they are worth working with. Right. So Will Smith currently has in production a film in which he's going to play this man. The film is called The Last Pharaoh. He's going to play Taharka. Taharka was the last major king of the 25th dynasty. So what we are proactively preparing ourselves to do is to train hundreds of people who have an understanding of ancient Kemet and the 25th dynasty. We're going to arm them with the information that we are currently uncovering right now so that when that movie comes out, we can have thousands of people go to the theater the first weekend and support that film so that it could be number one in the box office. If black folk, in our foolishness, could make Medea Goes to Jail the number one movie in America, then we deserve to make The Last Pharaoh the number one movie for at least two weeks running. I'm tired of seeing Medea goes to jail. Medea gets hemorrhoids. Medea <laughs> acts a fool. That is foolishness. We are paying for foolishness. We're paying to put ourselves back into mental incarceration. So we should be willing to stand up now and pay for our liberation. This is an opportunity, brother, for us to stand up for our own liberation. We've got to be forward thinking. All right? So then, part of our goal is to begin to initiate that process and to get folk ready for when this thing comes down the pipe. So then, let me just end on this note so we can take a few questions and we can wind down and get out of here so we don't violate our relationship with the folk who operate this space. We've got to be respectful of every place we go. Mm -hmm. right? Every place we go. Mm -hmm. Everything we need to do, anything we want to do is already inside, but stop looking outside yourself. Thank you. Yes. You are carrying within you the DNA of all of your ancestors, the greatest men and women who ever walked this planet, live in you right now. So it's time to tap into those cultural memories, those ancestral memories. Stop complaining. Stop talking about the white man. Stop talking about the white man, because every time you talk about him, you give him power. As the brother was saying, stop spending your money with folk who don't respect you. Stop thinking and talking about people who don't respect you. Talk about yourself. Give yourself that respect. Give yourself that power. And you'll find that just by changing your thought pattern, changing your conversation, you change the power dynamic. And that's what time it is. 
we are standing on the threshold of a new era of humanity. And we cannot afford to miss the boat this time, brothers and sisters, because if we do, I don't know if our ancestors are going to give us another chance. All right? So take down the web address. You can go to the website. You can, right now, make a tax-deductible contribution to the Asian Restoration Project. I'm, putting, I'm, call, I'm calling our folk out. If Dr. Lena Pishakova can spend her life savings trying to tell your story, y'all can at least afford to spend $10 a month to show your gratitude and become engaged in the process. So there's no excuse, none whatsoever. So I'll shut up now and take some questions. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Brother in the back. Uh, we, we, don't, we don't have time. We really don't have time for the questions. And I tell you, let me, sure, sure. Do your thing, brother. Do your thing. Um, we want to give thanks to uh, uh, Reverend Dillon and uh, the members of this church <clears throat> for allowing us the space. Uh, but they're very um, precise on time. And we were supposed to be out of here really at 9.30. Okay. Now, I'm asking you, don't leave, because we also have to pay. I mean, you know, nothing is really free. Uh, we have to pay our speaker. We have to raise an honorarium. And you cannot pay for what you have received this evening. Yes, Let's give Brother Browder a hand. <laughs> Sacrifice, the work, the commitment, the dedication, you, you, you can't buy that. This is love. But what we can do is give him a token of our appreciation and our love. So I don't want to take up a lot of time doing this, but if there's anybody here who can donate tonight 50 bucks, would you please raise your hand? Uh, Brother Oba and Brother Oba and Sister Yah uh, are co-producers of this event. You know, I've been up here talking all evening and they're quiet, but we work like that together. We, we trust each other, we know each other, so one hand washes the other. So Brother Oba here uh, has a basket in which we want to put something in. So if we, if we can get just two people to donate $50 to help us with tonight's expenses, uh, it'll go a long ways. Can we get two people with, with $50? Uh, just two people. Open your heart. Any hands? Okay. All right. Let's do $20. How many people we can get there? Okay, thank you, Brother Munson. $20 for Brother Munson. Anybody else? A uh, sister who went to uh, Egypt with Brother Browder. I know you enjoyed that trip. Thank you. Thank you, sister. Thank you, Brother, brother Shabazz. Thank you, Brother Shabazz. Uh, what's your name, sister, out of the door there? Grayden. Sister Grader? I hope we're going to see you next week. Yeah, because thank you so much. We, we'll be having these lecture series every week. They're very serious. Next week we will be... Um, uh, dealing with uh, banning the, the N-word, um, how, uh, how the word nigger promotes enslavement and inferiority, and why that word must be banned from our usage. Okay, anybody else with $20? Okay. Okay, in the back, that sister in the back got $20. Didn't you raise your hand, sister? Oh, brother, brother uh, Tyrone, Tyrone. Thank you, brother Tyrone. Uh, let's move down to $10. Let's try to do this real quick. I, I think probably everybody got $10. Uh, thank you. Thank you, brother Moses. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sister, so much. And don't forget to stop by South books. True South. true South. Why is it True South? Because we, we are oriented to the South. That's where our people come from. That's where our culture comes from. That's where our values come from. And if we adhere to those cultures, the cultures and those values, we are True South.
Go by True South. True South. Nostrand Avenue. What's the address? Nostrand? 492. 492 Nostrand Avenue. All right, everybody, you got $10? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let's get all these $10 right quick. We're getting close. We're getting close. We don't want to hold you. We're getting close. Brother Tony has books. He has tapes over here. You, you want to come? You want to you announce this? Uh, everybody with five dollars, please let's let's get your hands. Can we get these five dollars in this basket right quick? We don't want to take the food home with us, so come over and donate what you can. Greetings, uh, brothers and sisters. Uh, brothers and sisters. Brothers and sisters. Uh, coming up November the twelfth and the thirteenth, uh, Reverend Dillon, who is the uh, pastor, the angel of this house. He will be having an uh, empowerment conference. And if anyone wants to talk about economics, Reverend Dillon is the one to talk to because he has written extensive information on how we spend our dollars and where we spend our monies. So uh, at the table as you go out, there's flyers. We'd like for you to take one. We'd also like for you to come out and support this event. This event, again, is on November the 12th and the 13th. I'm We're working overtime to see that we never restore. So this is a precious thing that you all have here. I, I truly hope you all understand, and I'm sure you do. But I just want to acknowledge it, because oftentimes we don't say the things that we should say to the people we should say them to. We wait until they're dead. Yeah. We're saying, well, I should have done this, or I should have said that. So we have to do it now. We have to cultivate an attitude or a consciousness where we can show our love and show our appreciation because the things that you say have a profound impact, not just on you, but the people that you say those things to and the people who are in your company when you express or acknowledge love and affection and appreciation for folk who look like you and me. Amen. So I want to do a couple of things this evening. I want to, I want to talk a little bit about, about history, but I want to spend the bulk of my time talking about the practical application of history. Because you can, what I realized about two and a half years ago when there was a very brief period where I was, I was ill and hospitalized. I don't, I don't get ill, but for a brief period in, in 2005, I was ill. And as I was dealing with that illness and, and, and the restoration of my health, it dawned on me that, you know, I love history. Mm -hmm. I love to travel, I love to, love to lecture, I love to learn, I love to read. But all of that means nothing if you don't have your health. Amen. And so, in my career as a speaker, I've seen so many wonderful scholars leave us and become ancestors. Amen. And that of many of the scholars who have left us, they left well before their time. And there were several contributing factors to them becoming ancestors. One had to do with you know, just ignoring your health, like we all do. You know, I'll, I'll walk tomorrow, I'll exercise tomorrow, or I'll go on that diet later on. We keep putting off those things that we should be doing. And then the other factor is that it's very difficult, it's very challenging to work with our people. Our folk will wear you out. Stress, stress will take you out of here. And so, you know, it, it's so critically important. And I said I wanted to start doing this more often now. As, as, I, as I talk about history, I also need to start talking about health. We need to take better care of ourselves. You know, because it's a shame, you know, last month I was speaking at a, at a presentation at the Justice Department, Martin Luther King celebration. And I made reference to the fact that we're worse off now than we were 40 years ago. So we are worse off now in practically every area of life. We've got more black folk in jail now than ever before. 
Right. You've got more black folk who are suffering from hypertension and yeah. diabetes yeah. and prostate cancer. Right. So when we thought that we were integrated into the larger American society, we didn't realize that these acts were going to result in the deterioration of our health. So it means to me that we've got to begin to pay more attention to those little things that will ensure our survival. Washington, D.C., I've been living in Washington, D.C. now for the last uh, 38, 39 years. And the unique thing about Washington, D.C. is that Washington, D.C., within a 50-mile radius of Washington, D.C., you have the highest concentration of wealth and education in the hands and minds of black folk, the largest concentration within a 50 mile radius of Washington, D.C. than anywhere else on the planet. And with all of that education we got in D.C., we don't own anything. With all of that money that flows through the hands of black folk in D.C., there are very few businesses that are owned by African Americans in the D.C. area. Washington, D.C. has the highest incidence of prostate cancer on the planet. Washington, D.C. has the highest incidence of infant mortality in the United States of America. Washington, D.C. has the highest incidence of AIDS and HIV in America. So don't be fooled. Just because you're close to the seat of power just because you're in the capital of, 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 of the most concentrated sources of information on the planet doesn't mean anything if you don't know how to apply that knowledge in your personal life. Doesn't mean anything if you're making good money if you don't know how to utilize that money to acquire wealth. Wealth. And what is determined not by what you spend, but what, by what you pass on to your descendants when you expire. Yep. See, all these material things that we're acquiring, these cars, and these fancy shoes, and clothes, all that stuff means nothing because it's not generating wealth. So it's important that we begin to talk about some other things so we can begin to see the greater dynamics of the world in which we live and make the most out of the time that we have here on the planet. And I've been studying and researching and talking about African history and culture for more than 25 years. I've written a number of books about history. I've traveled to, to Egypt this past summer with my 40th trip to Egypt, made over 50 trips to Africa. And what I'm really beginning to, to understand, now I'll be 57 this year, and what I'm really beginning to understand now is I look back on my life. Specifically when I first started doing the things that I'm doing back in the mid-70s. And I remember, I remember in, it was 87, I had a conversation with John Jackson. John Jackson, I guess John Jackson is a step below John Henry Clark uh, in terms of people that I adore. John Jackson was one of the most brilliant minds that I ever had the opportunity to, to engage in conversation. Incredible man, incredible mind. And we talked, my first, first telephone conversation, we talked for about two hours. Mm -hmm. And this brother talked about life in South Carolina. He talked about when he came to Harlem and all the things that he did in New York, all the people that he met in New York. And he talked about these events as if they just happened yesterday. Man had a, had a perfect memory. And as he talked about his life and his career, this brother confided in me. And this was crucial because I was just beginning to, to make some decisions to do the things that I've been doing for the last 20 some ideas. And I'm, I'm picking his brain for ideas, for inspiration. And the thing that struck, stuck with me was when Dr. Jackson said, and he was late 70s at the time, late 70s, living in a one-room apartment in the south side of Chicago. And his brother told me that if he had to do it all over again, he would pass for white. He wouldn't do it. And so I had to scratch myself, so wait a minute now. Here's somebody that I adore, and he's telling me that if he had to do it all over again, he wouldn't. 
So I, you know, I had to stop for a second and reconsider what it was that I, that I wanted to do. And one of the things that I realized that made him so angry and bitter was that many of his writings, you know, John Jackson's, my favorite book of John Jackson is Introduction to African Civilization. It's one of the most powerful books I've ever read. And the introduction to that book was written by uh, John Henry Clark. And I remember reading that book in 1980 when I was flying to California, reading it on the plane. And I'm reading the introduction, and I say, if, if the rest of the book is as good as the introduction, this is going to be a, a fantastic piece of uh, material literature to consume. But I love that book, you know. And, and one of the things that I found in talking with both Jackson and Clark was that they, and they expressed their displeasure at the number of times that they were ripped off by publishers. You know, they poured their heart and soul into researching the history and culture, writing the books, and then turning the manuscript over to specific different publishing houses, only to find out four or five years down the road that they're not receiving their royalties. And so one of the decisions that I made in talking to Brother Jackson that afternoon was that I'm going to have to assume, assume responsibility for publishing my own work Amen. to make sure that I'm not in the same position that he's in 40 years from now. So we have to learn from the life's experiences of others because our life is too short to learn from our own mistakes. So the beautiful thing of history is that, you know, history really embodies the whole concept of Sankofa, going back and studying what happened before you first walked on the planet, studying the successes and the failures, analyzing that information so that you can make decisions as to how you're going to negotiate this thing called life. And I found that the further back you can look and study, the more data you can accumulate, and the better your opportunity is to plan for your future. I remember, since this, this is Black History Month, I want to just spend a little bit of time talking about history before I jump into what I really want to talk about. I remember um, growing up in Chicago, I really wasn't exposed to a lot of black history. Uh, and actually, going to Howard University, I wasn't exposed to black history. Um, but I recall a high school principal of mine, history, no, high school teacher, who used to begin each class with the statement that to not know what happened before one was born is to always remain a child. So he would proceed to talk about history so that we could mature mentally and go through life with a clear understanding of where we have been, where we are, and where we're going. Unfortunately, this teacher is the same teacher who told me that black people had no history prior to slavery. Now, I don't believe this man, this white guy, I don't believe that he was a racist. I believe that he was a product of his environment. And that the reality is we only know what we know. So if you have been fed misinformation, then that's all you're capable of repeating. But that statement that black people had no history prior to our enslavement really didn't sit well with me. It didn't resonate with my person. And it prompted me to begin to find out who we were and what we've done. And as I've been engaged in that search and that quest to know who I was, I've come to the understanding that to not know who you were before your ancestors were enslaved is to always remain a slave. And so we study the history of African people that precedes the history that precedes their enslavement so that we can better determine what it is we're going to do with our lives. Dr. Clark told us on numerous occasions that history is the clock that people use to tell their political and cultural time of day, so that history is the compass that people use to find themselves on the map of human geography. So if history is the clock that people use to tell their political and cultural time of day, I have to ask the question, 
do you know what time it is? If history is the compass that people use to find themselves on the map of human geography, do you know where you are? Do you know how you got where you are? And more importantly, do you know where you are going tomorrow? And do you have a clear vision in your mind as to how you can get there? So history is more than just names and dates and, and facts. History can save your life right. if you approach the subject matter from the right perspective. It tells you not only what to do, it tells you what not to do. You know, if the history of African people were a book of a thousand pages, then the story of our enslavement would begin on page 997 and would only be two pages long. So for us to be fixated just on what happened during the Ma'afa means that we are missing out on a wealth of knowledge that can empower us to begin to do things and conceive things that we never thought possible. I like to, this microphone stretch a bit. I want to I just share with you this, um, this product that a colleague of mine in the UK uh, is developing. Okay. And, um, okay, I want to share with you uh, this, this, this timeline that a colleague of mine has developed um, in the UK. And actually, I'm leaving tomorrow and going to England. And I plan to bring some of these back with me. Um, it's too loud. I can talk a little social. I turn the mic up. Can I have about five people to come up here and give me a hand? Five folks to come up here. And young lady, you come up here and help. Yes, you can. Now, if you can hold this and stand behind me and hold this, I want you all to spread this out. As many people as it takes, unfold this. This is a visual timeline of 8,000 years of history. Uh, my colleague in the UK who was a history teacher found that as he was teaching his students, they had a very difficult time um, understanding some of the concepts. They had a very difficult time putting history into perspective. So he developed this timeline. And this is a, a small version. He's got a, a larger version, which I hope to bring back with me. But it begins at 5200 BCE and goes all the way to 3000 ACE. So he talks about what happened in the past. He talks about where we are right now in 2007 and how standing at this point in time in history, if we are able to gain perspective of all of this knowledge and information, we can apply that knowledge in our lives and better determine where we're going to go the next 1,500 years. That's the power of history. That's the beauty of history. And so when you look at certain segments of this timeline, it shows you the beginning of culture, civilization, and science, and mathematics in Kim. It shows you the historical, the political, and the cultural framework that was developed in Kim. 4,000 BC, Africans had already developed concepts of God, architecture, engineering, science, and philosophy. Shows you here with the building of uh, creation of Haram the so-called Sphinx, the building of the pyramids. It shows you the African personality, the kings and queens who are responsible for making great contributions to culture and civilization. All of this is our history. The first European doesn't come on the scene until first European doesn't come on the scene until right around here, right here. Right here. All of this is us. So knowing that puts you mentally in a different frame of mind. So here is where Homer wrote the Iliad and the Odyssey, the first piece of European literature. Africans had already built the pyramids, already had studied the stars, the planets, and built great temples so that they can advance their knowledge. Now, the crucial point is that here, give me a second, let me find it, let me find it. This period right in, give me one second. 
You have a book on the history of the U.S.? Give me a second to find it because it begins, oh, okay, right here, all right? Right in here is a period, I'm sorry, it's right here. This period right here, from here to here, is a period of slavery. The Ma'afa, the Middle Passage. Just a small period in time. All of this is what we can draw upon. All of this is what we can use right now to determine the next thousand years, the next 1,500 years. Wow. So the beautiful thing about Black History Month is that it gives us an opportunity to study our past. But brothers and sisters, I want to encourage you all to understand very clearly that we have to move beyond the Ma'afa. And that today, in this particular point in time, we can't continue to, to obsess over the mafia. Now, the mafia was terrible. I'm not trying to minimize it at all. But mentally, if you stay there, you will never be able to tap into the unlimited wealth that is still here waiting for you to unearth, waiting for you to incorporate into your life. And understand this. This period of time means that there are literally millions and millions and millions of ancestors who are waiting for you to call on them, who have knowledge, who have traditions to pass on to us. And if we're just stuck right here, we're never able to access all of this wealth that's waiting for us. So I just want to give you all this visual overstanding, this visual overview of how we need to be focusing our attention in order for us to create the world that we want our children to inherit. So if you all can roll that up, I'd appreciate it. I'll have, by the end of this month, by the end of this month, I'll have copies of this timeline. So you all can go to my website and we can uh, make arrangements to uh, ship them down to you. Coming down next month. Pardon me? Coming down to see you next month. Okay, so you all coming down in April, right? April, 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 right? April. We'll have some when you come down in April. Yeah. But we'll also have a, a new, um, some other new things for you as well. We're always striving to improve what we do because, um, you know, you can't keep doing the same thing and call yourself progressive. <laughs> the beautiful thing about life is that life demands that we evolve. It demands that we change. It demands that we improve, you know, and and as I stated earlier, one of the situations that we find ourselves in now as African people is that if we are honest with ourselves, we will say, if we're honest with ourselves, we'll, we'll, we'll say that we have regressed over the last 40 years. Okay. We have regressed. So let's be honest. And let's understand the events which have led to our regression. Let's understand the mistakes that we have made and then let's make a concerted effort to stop thinking and acting like that tomorrow. See, the beautiful thing is that once you begin to understand the power of consciousness or the, the power of your mind, you begin to realize that it's not racists who determine your reality. I mean, they're here, and we know that, but there's a power far greater and racist. There's a power far greater than these white supremacists who want to keep you suppressed. And that power is power that you have, that you have, that we all have. That is the power that exists within our consciousness. As Dr. Carnegie Woodson said, if you control a man's thinking, you don't have to worry about their actions. If you control their consciousness, you don't have to worry about them ever defeating you. You don't ever have to worry about them changing their financial relationship with you. Because they will stay stuck in time and be forever your slave. You know, we're in New York, and one of the thoughts that automatically comes to our mind when we talk about New York is September 11, yeah. 2001. Yeah. And if we are very clear about the history of the United States of America, then we know that Americans have historically killed their own in order to implement 
programs a profound change in government. So I want to just put something in context for you with regards to September 11, 2001. They stated that um, a little less than 3,000 people died when the planes crashed into the World Trade Center, when the plane crashed into the Pentagon, and that fourth plane crashed in the field in rural Pennsylvania. About 3,000, uh, almost 3,000 people died. The very first thing this government said is that we need to find out who committed this atrocity. Hunt them down, and then they declared war against them. So let me put something in perspective for you. What happened to African people during the Maafa, during the 444 years of the Maafa, from 1444 to 14 uh, to 1888, conservatively speaking, over 50 million African men, women, and children died. That is the equivalent of September 11th happening every day for 44 years and eight months. And so the question that we have to ask ourselves is, who is responsible for perpetrating those deaths? Have we identified those people? And if we have, then what are we going to do to ensure that that process does not continue? See, it puts the onus on us. Because once we begin to, to understand very clearly how we got into the circumstances that we find ourselves in, then we can determine how we're going to change that relationship so that we can determine what our future is going to be, so that we can determine what the future of our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren is, is, is going to be. And, and so the reality is, if we aren't thinking on that level, if we aren't thinking seven generations into the future, 150 years, we're not thinking. Everything that we think say and do, every moment of our lives determines the quality of life for the next 150 years. That's power. That is too much power to leave in the hands of BET. That is too much power to leave in the hands of institutions that have demonstrated that they don't have your best interest at heart. So it doesn't do a whole lot of good to complain about people who don't mean you any good. All you need to do is to change your mindset, change your reality, and you change everything else around you. Now, there's some points I want to, to talk about this evening. And I'm sorry, I don't have a whole lot of time to, to go over more things because I've got a train to catch, to get back home, to prepare to go to London tomorrow. But let me just share some basic things with you. Any of you are familiar with Star Trek? Yeah. 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 Guess, well, you don't have to be a Trekkie to like Star, to like Star Trek. Yeah. It's good science fiction. Yeah. And it's science fiction, and actually, it's social commentary under the guise of science fiction. Yeah. You see, because one of the things, one of the interesting aspects of the human mind is that it's very difficult for people to relate to things in a contemporary context. And so in order to increase one's understanding of a subject matter, you've got to separate them from the present moment. So before I talk about Star Trek, let me talk about Star Wars for a minute. How many of you are familiar with Star Wars? Yeah, what's right. What is the beginning of every Star Wars movie? How does every Star Wars movie begin? Big giant letters. Big giant letters to say what? They say, uh, once upon a time in a galaxy. Right. A long time ago, right. in a galaxy far, far away. Now, George Lucas created the Star Wars story because 1977, he felt that the spirit of America was depressed, coming out of, uh, uh, out of the um, out of the turmoil, political turmoil from Watergate. People distrusted government didn't believe in the people that we're supposed to put our confidence in. And that what he wanted to do with Star Wars was to create a new mythology for a new generation of Americans. Now what's interesting about, about George Lucas is that he started off, he didn't start off college as a filmmaker. He started off as a 
uh, philosophy major. And as a freshman in college, he read the works of um, Joseph Campbell. If you aren't familiar with Joseph Campbell, you don't need to introduce yourself to Joseph Campbell. He's probably one of the most spiritual Europeans I've ever had the opportunity to read. He did this series called The Power of Myth that's uh, on DVD and well worth uh, renting and watching. There's also a companion book, The Power of Myth. And when George Lucas began to read Joseph Campbell's works about, about mythology and the power of it, he realized that he could have a greater impact on the world as a filmmaker than as a, uh, someone who majored in philosophy. Because films allow you to reach millions of people in a matter of minutes and plant thoughts in their consciousness. So what George Lucas did in the Star Wars trilogy was to tell the story of ancient Kemet. The story of Asar, Aset, and Heru is the fundamental essence of the story of Star Wars. So if you look at it and if you break it down, you see that it's all there. Just presented in a contemporary context. But in order to make your mind receptive to the story, he had to disconnect your conscious mind from the present moment. And he did that with the words that you saw in every Star Wars movie. A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away. So he's telling you that the story about these spaceships and robots is not happening in the future, it happened in the past, a long time ago, in a place far, far away. So he used a technique called disassociation to separate your mind from your body so that you would be more receptive to the information that he's going to plant in your consciousness. Because he understood that this whole thing is about consciousness. Whoever plants the seeds of thought in your consciousness will be able to determine the trajectory of your life. And so Star Trek was so, such a significant television series because Gene Roddenberry, the, the uh, producer of Star Trek, dealt with social issues in the 1960s in a sci science fiction format. So he gave you the impression that he was dealing with issues in the future, but he was talking about things that were happening right now. But the opening line of Star Trek films, Star Trek television programs, goes with the statement that space is the final frontier. These are the voyages of the Star Trek Enterprise, and this mission is to seek out new, new life, new civilization, to boldly go where no one has gone before. But if we examine reality from a contemporary framework, based on the research of scientists and, and neurologists, they now know that outer space is not the final frontier. They understand very clearly that the final frontier is inner space. The final frontier is the mind. And with a properly conditioned mind, you will come to understand that you are the master of this starship. And under your commands, this body, this ship, can take you wherever you want to go. And so if you look at the latest scientific research, research, by, research being done by astrophysicists, physicists, they come to basically the same conclusion. Astrophysicists, those people who study the cosmos, stars and planets and galaxies in the Milky Way, they have acknowledged within the last decade or so that 93% of space is empty. But it's not really empty. It is filled with this substance which they refer to as dark matter. They call it dark matter because they have not been able to define its essence. But they know that it is everywhere and it affects everything. Now, you have physicists who are studying subatomic particles. And as they study subatomic particles with electron microscopes, 
and look into the basic atomic structure of, of atoms, electrons, neutrons, and protons. We all know from science, atoms are comprised of electrons, neutrons, and protons. Well, atoms are just like the universe. 93% of atoms is empty space. And that empty space, on a subatomic level, is also referred to as dark matter. And what these physicists have discovered when they are trying to identify these subatomic particles of dark matter, that they only appear when they think about them. Huh? They only appear, they only become visible when they mentally conceive them. And so what they have become, what they have begun to understand that it is the mind, it is consciousness which determines your reality on a subatomic level. This is powerful stuff. But what I want you all to understand that this powerful stuff that these scientists today are discovering is not really a discovery. It is a rediscovery of principles, concepts, and ideas that were understood in Kemet thousands of years earlier. And so, what all of this means, you know, Dr. Clark used to always say that all history is a current event. All history is a current event. And so if we analyze the current interpretation of history and put it into context with what we understand happened in the past, we will begin to merge these two forms of awareness into one that will allow us to be able to perceive what tomorrow is going to be. So let me give you this uh, a philosophical construct that will help you better determine your tomorrow. There is this understanding that there are known knowns. There are things that we know that we know we know. But we also understand that there are known unknowns. Things that we don't know that we know we don't know. And along the same train of thought, there also exists unknown unknowns. The things that we don't know, that we don't even know, we don't know. All right? So let me give you, let me give you a, a metaphor to illustrate this, this, this train of thought, because I want you all to stay with me now. I want you all to follow me. If the totality of knowledge, what human beings know, the known known, could be condensed into a material form, say, water, if the essence of what we know as human beings to be condensed into water, that water would fill a thimble. Those are the known knowns. Right. The things that we know that we know we know would fill a thimble. The known unknowns would be like taking that thimble full of knowledge and pouring it into an eight ounce glass of water. The unknown unknowns, the things that we don't know and don't know that we don't know, would be like taking that eight ounce glass of water and pouring it into the ocean. Oh my God. Yeah. So I want you to understand, brothers and sisters, where we are at this specific point in time in history. We are standing on the verge of a profound transformation of consciousness that's going to make the flat earth theory of 1491 look as irrelevant as George Bush two years from now. All right? <laughs> so it's important for us to begin to prepare ourselves for what is coming. And the best time to prepare for that is now. You don't wait until you're in the middle of something to start doing what you should have done a minute ago, a year ago, or a lifetime ago. What scientists, 
are beginning to discover, the scientists are beginning to acknowledge, is that their perception of the world is extremely limited. Now there's a saying, um, Missouri is called the show me state. And there's a saying that, you know, I'll see it, I'll believe it when I see it. And that's based on the false reality that seeing is believing. Seeing is believing. Now, if you buy into that, that construct, then it means that you're going to be incorrect 90% of the time. If what you see determines your reality, you're going to be wrong 90% of the time. Why is that? Well, we see because of the visible light spectrum, which is a very tiny part of the total energy spectrum. But the visible light spectrum operates because light waves bounce off of an object and that reflection travels through the air into your eyes, along your optic nerve, which then sends electrical impulses into your brain and then formulates what it is you see. You hear only because my vocal cords are vibrating and the air is rushing up through my larynx, causing my vocal cords to vibrate, and that vibration is being emitted into the air, and it's traveling through the air in this room. You are picking it up through your ears, and it's traveling through your auditory canal, causing your eardrum to vibrate, which then sends electrical signals into your brain and converts what I'm saying into words that you understand. So if we rely on our physical senses, our eyes and our ear and our hearing to determine our reality, we're going to be wrong 90% of the time. So I'm saying that to say that there are other ways of knowing. There are other aspects of our life, our reality, that we have never been introduced to. We think, or we've been taught to believe that we have five basic senses. Well, in reality, we probably have more than 25. We have more than 25. You know, there, there's a saying that, you know, the average person uses less than 5% of their brain, which is true. We use 5% or less of our brain because that is how we have been conditioned to function. And the average person is comfortable with that degree of dysfunctionality. Now imagine you owning a business, you're a businessman, you're a businesswoman, and your employees only come to work 5% of the time. How long are you going to stay in business? So how can we expect to negotiate life if we're only using 5% of our total abilities? So that little reality means that we've got to begin to step up and do more. We have to expect more of ourselves of ourselves as individuals before we can begin to expect more from others. Because all the things that I'm talking about begin with self first. Once you get yourself together, then you can justifiably tell other folks what they should be doing. But if yourself ain't together, you need to shut up. <laughs> Once you get yourself together, even if they don't feel like instructing others, then they can know what to do just by observing you, watching your movements, watching how you interact with others. And let me say this because it needs to be said, and especially because we have so many children here in the room. Children are our greatest resource. And We do our children a disservice if we don't share this type of information with them so that they can begin to understand that there is a greater potential that dwells, that lies dormant within them that needs to be cultivated. I mentioned earlier that I've been to Egypt 40 times. And you know, travel, one of the beautiful things about traveling there year after year is that you begin to, <laughs> well, the first two trips, 
I got over tripping over being in Egypt. Yeah, I know. You know, because it, it's great to want to go to Kemet and see the magnificent uh, temples and 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 and, and uh, pyramids and tombs and the great works that our ancestors created. It's, it is wonderful to go there and, and, and say that this is what we did when we were in charge. But the reality is, after you've been there four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times, you get over that. That, that, that great excitement because you realize that Kemet is dead, that it's gone, and that the Arabs who control Egypt right now now lay claim to all of that. And let me be honest with you all, we ain't never getting it back. We ain't never getting it back. But the important reality is we don't have to get that back all we need to do is to recreate the consciousness that will allow us to recreate that wherever we are. But the beauty of it is, the realization that I came to probably, I guess, I don't know, it may have been 10th, 11th, 12th trip. I, we had a group and we were going through our Karnak Temple, Temple of Karnak. The Temple of Karnak is, one, is the grandest structure ever created by human beings on earth. It is a temple complex that is so large, you can take every church built in London, England, put them inside of that temple, and still have room for two football fields. It's huge. It's incredible. And that, at the height of, of this temple's operation, they had over 30,000 people functioning within this temple. But when you go there now, all you are able to see are the ruins of that temple. So I stood in the Hyperstar Hall near the entrance of the temple, and I saw the state that this structure was in. And I allowed myself to mentally travel back in time and imagine what this institution looked like when it was brand new, when it was at the height of its glory. Because the glorious thing that you see in that temple is that there's metanetra everywhere. And every square inch of that temple, all the columns and everything, is covered with metanetra and symbols and sculptures of, of the Netru and kings and other significant personalities. And all of those carvings were painted so it was almost as if this building, this structure was alive. And it spoke to you on multiple levels simultaneously. And as I began to allow myself to imagine what this great institution looked like when it was new, what came into my awareness was the fact that we today, so-called modern man, is really subhuman. We function on a sub human level. We don't even know what it means to be human. When you see these structures that were created thousands of years ago, you begin to understand that these men and women who created and who maintained this nation and these institutions were, were folk who knew what it meant to be human. And the word human is significant because human is a um, Sanskrit word comes from the uh, Sanskrit word hue and man. The word man means mind. The word hue means God. So essentially, you're looking at the works of individuals who are literally God-minded beings who understood what to do in order to manifest the consciousness of God within their consciousness so that they could build for eternity so that they could create structures thousands of years ago that mankind today, with all of its technological accomplishments, cannot replicate. So we have available to us, sisters and brothers, that same consciousness. There is a carving in the tomb of Ramesses IV in the Valley of the Kings. It's a carving that speaks to this very basic and fundamental reality. It's a carving in which you have 13 images, 13 figures of men standing, and the carving wraps around the wall. 
And the first figure is standing, and you see two ropes coming out of his navel. Two strings or two cords coming out from his navel. And then there's a series of 12 individuals spaced around the wall who uh, have their hands out and they are holding each of these two cords that came from this one individual's body. And so they pass from one person to another, to another, to another, to another, and they spread all the way around the wall till you get to the 14th image, which is the image of the king, Ramesses IV, and he's holding the two ends of the rope in his hand. Now, it took me a while to really get an understanding of what that was. And what it depicts on two levels, what it depicts is the heliconation, uh, helico nature of the DNA in our bodies. That is the oldest representation of DNA known to man. And so it is seen being passed down from one generation to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. And here's the king holding the genetic material of his ancestors, going back hundreds and hundreds of years. What that speaks to is that next phase of human development that we are standing, literally standing on the threshold of right now. And that is this profound transformation of consciousness. Psychiatrists are just now beginning to acknowledge something that they discovered in the 30s and 40s and were afraid to really wrap their minds around. But they're beginning to publicly acknowledge now that there is such a thing called ancestral memory, genetic memory. If you think about it, when you clone something, you take a gene from an animal or plant, and within that gene is all of the genetic material necessary to make another one of whatever that thing was, to replicate. And so by cloning that thing, you can create two, three, four hundred of that same thing. They are identical. So within that tiny, subatomic particle, known as a gene, is everything that was ever known about that entire structure. So that if you can clone another person or another object by taking a gene, then it also means that the thing that you have cloned has all of the memories of that thing. That means that we, every person in this room, is walking around in your body 24-7 all of the memories of every single one of your ancestors. We carry them around with us everywhere we go. And so the key is accessing that ancestral memory. Those people in our society who have been able to do that to a limited degree are individuals who, instead of using 5% of their brain, they use 10. They use 15%. And compared to our five, they are extraordinary individuals. They are the Imhoteps of the world. They are the Michael Jordans of the world. But it is a potential that every single person possesses. So the issue is, the challenge is, what can we begin to do to activate that dormant consciousness, to tap into those ancestral voices that are waiting for us to come into our correct mind so that you can become the conduit through which they will speak and continue their lives because they live in us. We are our ancestors. And when we know that, when we understand that, then that understanding will direct every single thing that you do. It changes your behavior. It changes 
the tone of your conversation. It changes your choice of words. When your consciousness is changed, it makes it real difficult to watch television. Because you see how foolish it is. You realize how much of an enormous waste of time it is. And you also begin to understand that television is nothing more than electronic crack. It is a drug. Yeah. It is a drug that is designed. Yeah. Right. It is a drug that is designed to cast a hypnotic spell. Yeah. It captivates you with light and sound. And it speaks to a certain part of your consciousness and disengages you from reality. That's why, for the most part, television is free. And we know in America ain't nothing free in America. You pay for television because of the commercials. And the people who produce the commercials understand the power of the subconscious mind. They know that when you were watching television, you submit your will to that box, to that one-eyed monster. And so those commercials are designed to plant seeds in your subconscious mind. So then at the proper moment, those seeds will plant, those seeds will sprout, and then cause you to do what that commercial programmed you to do. Super Bowl was a couple of weeks ago, right? right? And New York is excited about the fact that your team won the Super Bowl. But I want you all to understand that the Super Bowl is the most watched program on television. Right. Right. And that the commercial time for the Super Bowl is the most expensive time on television. I didn't check the stats for this year, but I know last year uh, it, cost, um, it cost something like two and a half million dollars per 30 seconds. All right. Now, if somebody's going to spend two and a half million dollars to buy 30 seconds of air time, or if they're going to decide to buy, say, three, four minutes of air time and run four one-minute commercials, they're investing a serious amount of money. Because you not only have to buy the commercial time, but you also have to manufactured the commercial. Yeah. So they're investing tens of millions of dollars, but they know with crystal clarity that they will, if their commercial is affected, they will make that money back in less than a week. Right. Wow. Right. 1984, this little company called Apple aired a commercial for their Macintosh com uh, computers. It only ran one time. And within a week, they sold over 200,000 Macintosh computers. They understand the power of the mind. They understand how to plant suggestions in your mind in order to have you do things that you would not normally do. Okay, is this on? Okay. So, I want to share a couple of things with you that demonstrate, that illustrate some of the concepts and ideas that I'm talking about so that we can begin to see and better understand the nature of the world in which we live and make better choices about how we live our lives. Because as I said earlier, I've come to understand very clearly that my life is not determined by who's in the White House. My life is not determined by races. My life is determined by me. My life is determined by what I think, by what I say, and what I do. Let me say this before I go on. I was talking about speech. The power of speech is so significant that we cannot afford to take it for granted. In Kemet, the writing form that the Greeks called hieroglyphics was known as Medu Neter. Medu Neter means the words of God or the words of the Creator. When it was written, it represented the writing of the creator. It was divine speech, divine script. When you write Metanetra, Metanetra is only written 
with the consonants. You never write the vowels. You only wrote consonants, not the vowels. Why? Why? Because vowels, A, E, I, O, U, and sometimes Y, vibrate at a rate 600 times faster than consonants. Our tongue does not obstruct the power or the flow of the words that comes out of our mouth. So A, E, I, O, U do not inhibit the flow of air or spirit coming out of your body. So they vibrate faster and they have power. So Metanet, in order to preserve this knowledge and to prevent it from falling into the hands of improperly trained people, they wrote information out but without the keys. And the vowels are the keys which unlock the power in the language. So they can put this information out there without worrying about someone misusing it or abusing it. So in that context, once you understand the power of words, and more specifically, once you understand the power of your words, because we bring things into existence via the word. We impact matter and spirit with our words. You can make a sister feel like a queen just by looking in the eyes and saying, so in that context, once you understand the power of words, and more specifically, once you understand the power of your words, because we bring things into existence via the word, we impact matter and spirit with our words. You can make a sister feel like a queen just by looking in the eyes and saying, honey, I love you. Or you can make her feel like something less than a queen when you It all depends on how you use the words that come out of your mouth. I say this to say that one of the many problems that affects our lives that we have to wreck control over is how we use our speech. Say that to say that anytime you use profanity, anytime you curse, anytime you swear, you are projecting out into your environment negative energy, which changes the dynamic of everything around you. Changes the air around you, changes the energy around you, changes the consciousness around you. You call profanity cursing, right? What is a curse? Curse is a negative, evil spell that is cast, that is spoken and cast on someone. The word profanity comes from the Latin words pro and thou. The word pro means before or outside. The word thou means temple. So within the human anatomy, there's a part of our body that's like right here, that we call our temple. And if you project the line from this point here, and from the center of your skull, where those two lines intersect, is where your pineal gland is located. And your pineal gland is your direct line of communication to the creator and to the ancestors. Within the temples of ancient Kemet, the most sacred part of the temples, the oldest part, the most sacred part of every temple is the Holy of Holies. It was that part of the temple where it was known that the spirit of a nature or a specific aspect of the Creator would dwell within that sacred space. And since we come to understand that the architectural structure of the temples in ancient Kemet was fashioned on the anatomy of human beings, then the Holy of Holies corresponds to the pineal gland within your brain. That is where the spirit of the Creator, God, Allah, Jehovah, whatever term you want to use to define this undefinable source, that's where it exists. And so within that context, this part of your skull is called your temple because that is where spirit dwells. 
So anytime you use profanity, profanity outside of the temple, you are literally out of your mind. You are outside of a sacred environment, and you are dwelling in Ispet. Ispet was the comedic concept that represented evil, death, destruction, poverty, illness. You can either dwell within, you can either dwell with a close and harmonious relationship with the Creator or function outside of that relationship simply by the choice of words that you use. That's something that we all have control over. You determine how you express yourself. And one of the worst things that could have ever happened to African people is for us to use profanity like it's nothing, like it's insignificant. We see it in the music, we see it in the, and hear it in the music, and any time those words are spoken, they are admitted into the environment, they are internalized by you, and they affect every cell in your body. So to be honest with you, the white man can disappear from the planet tomorrow. And as long as we continue doing the things that we've been doing the last 25, 30 years, we will never be able to achieve the things that we have capacity to achieve. So it's all about knowing yourself. It's all about mastering yourself and then begin to do the things that you've always had the capacity to do. And that is to be an instrument through which the ancestors may do their work. So I just want to share a couple of things with you, a couple of demonstrations with you that, that represent this new threshold of consciousness that we are standing on right now, that we are on the verge of, of becoming incorporating into our lives to a much greater extent. Um, let me see how we're going to do this. OK. I always like to move beyond just talking about history and showing the practical application of these things and how they impact us. Um, brother, can I ask you to uh, come up here for a second? Oh, sure. That, that illustrates the potential that exists within us as human beings. It illustrates how precious our bodies are and how we must begin to do a better job of managing the house that holds our spirit. What's your name, brother? Keith. Keith, all right, nice to meet you. Keith, are you left hand or the right hand? Right hand. Can you stand and face the audience and stick out your right arm? Make a fist, stick out your right arm. We're going to do a simple muscle test. I want to demonstrate uh, how I can affect this brother's physical state of being through light and sound, all right? So I just want to do a simple test. I'm going to push down on your arm, and I want you to resist me pushing your arm down, okay? Just, all right, pretty good muscle strength, all right? So now, brother, I want you to stare at, uh, I'm going to, to put the microphone down for a minute because I need two hands. Put your hand back up. I want you to stare at this car for a few minutes and resist me pushing your arm down. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Now, I want you to stare at this for a few minutes. Resist me pushing your arm down. Oh, what happened? I don't know. What color was it? Good. That's the question you should be asked. What color was it? Pink. 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 All right? The color pink makes you physically weak. The color pink makes you physically weak. Come on up. I'm not spending it. The color pink makes you physically weak. Remember I said we see because light bounces off of an object, travels into our eye along our optic nerve, uh, which then sends a signal into our brain. What the color pink does is to disrupt this, the flow of this electrical current. It causes it to short circuit. And so what it does is makes you physically weak. It disconnects the relationship between your brain and your muscles, and it makes you physically weak. 
maybe. No, 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 no. I want you all. I want you all to follow. Don't get caught up on the visuals. Now I want you all to understand what I'm sharing with you all. All right. Let me do it one more time since you want to see it. All right. Father, you come on up here with the green. You, let me. Let me do it to you. Come on up here. <laughs> <laughs> Left hand and right hand. Right, stick your right hand out. All right. I'm not even going to um, do the white. I'll just start on with the pink. <laughs> oh, come on, that was too easy. <laughs> that was too easy. I can do it. All right, but, but the point that I'm making is the color pinks makes everyone physically weak. Maybe that's the reason why when you get fired from your job, they give you a insult to injury. Maybe that's the reason why when a child is born, if it's a male child, they put a blue cap on his head. If it's a female child, they put what? A pink ribbon, and they'll call women the weaker sex. See, folk know what you don't know. And they use your lack of knowledge against you. Against you. So, now that I've demonstrated that the color pink, visually watching or looking at the color pink makes you physically weak, I'm going to show you how you can override that. All right? No, no, no. Stick your arm out and hold this. Look there. I'm messed up here. And all these pockets, okay. No, no, don't close your eyes, that'd be cheap. <laughs> okay, now watch this. <laughs> what happened? More resistance. Right, now tell me what you saw. You take it down. Tell me what you saw. All right. He was able to keep his arm up, resist me pushing it down, as long as I made that sound. Correct? And as soon as I stopped making that sound, his arm went down. Thank you, brother. His arm went down. So, so, what questions should you all be asking me right now? Huh? Yes, ma'am. What questions should you be asking me? Um, why does color pink make everybody weak? Oh, well, I already talked about that. You can ask your sister to explain it to you. Yes, sir. Is hearing um, stronger than the sight? Not necessarily stronger. See, the, the question that you all remember, I remember Ace and Hilliard saying something in 1981 that stayed with me for the rest of my life. If you never ask the right question, you never get the right answer. All right? The question that you all should ask me is, what note did I play? What note did I play? Anybody in here love music? Yeah. All right, so what note is this? C. C. Middle C. All right, now, this is the key. Every, there are seven notes in the musical scale. There are seven colors in the light spectrum. Every color in the light spectrum corresponds to a note in the musical scale. So, the C note corresponds to the color red. And red is a color which gives you power and energy. So what I did was, we, I demonstrated how the color pink short circuits your muscular system and makes you weak. And I showed you how by just using sound vibration, I could emit a sound that came into that brother's body and gave him the strength in order to overcome the debilitating effects of the color pink. All I'm dealing with is light and sound. What do you think television is? What do you think radio is? You are internalizing energy every day of your life. What kind of energy are you, are you internalizing? Is that energy helping you to be healthy, strong, prosperous, clear of, of, of thought? Or is it confusing you? Disconnecting you from the ability to communicate with those ancestors who are waiting for you to come back into your right mind so that they can continue building for eternity. See, this is where we are right now. This is a marvelous time to be alive. Because we have access to more information now than any point in time in history. 
And that's good and bad. I sometimes refer to the internet as the information stupid highway because mm -hmm. there's so much misinformation yeah. on the internet. And if you don't know how to discern truth from falsehood or partial falsehood, you could be in worse shape than if you knew nothing. Right, right. So there's a process, or there are processes for cultivating a higher level of consciousness. This is up here, let me do, uh, I got 15 more minutes. Let me do a couple more things before I got to go. I'm sorry I got to run. So that means you all have to bring me back yeah. uh, yeah. when I got time to, to deal with some of these things. So, again, the point that I want to begin emphasizing more is that history is good, but we need to start focusing on the practical application of knowledge. Yes. It doesn't do us any good to talk about the past if we're living in hell right now. Right. We need to find, we need to begin to incorporate into our lives concrete ways that we can make tomorrow better. And the day after tomorrow better than today. If we can't do that, we're just wasting air. We're wasting time. I've got uh, a, a, another little gadget. Those of you who may have maybe read uh, uh, second volume of Robert Files, the Bible Strategies, I, I wrote about this in the book. But this is little device that to me demonstrates this, this concept that I refer to as cultural economics. Managing uh, the house that holds your spirit. That's what economics really boils down to. This body is the vessel through which the ancestors and the creator works. And you must be able to manage the income of this body. By income, I mean income literally. You must manage everything that comes into this body. You must manage what you see, what comes into your eyes. You must manage what comes into your ears, what you hear. You must manage what comes into your mouth, what you eat, what you drink. Everything that comes into this body affects every aspect of your life. So you can't afford to take this stuff for granted. You can't just say, well, television is just television and turn it on and let your children be exposed to this pornography and trash four, five, six hours a day, and then get mad at them when they start acting out like the madness they see on television. You can't allow your children to plug into those iPods and listen to that oral pornography, some people call music, yeah. and then wonder why your children are behaving the way that they behave. You must teach them to manage their income, to manage everything that comes into their body so that they can live up to their potential as human beings and complete our great walk in the sun. This little device here is a little simple toy that someone created that demonstrates the flow of conductive electricity. It's a real simple device. Uh, looks like a ping pong ball. It has inside of it uh, an LED uh, circuit board, a couple of wires and two batteries. And each of the batteries is connected to one of these two metal strips. And when I put my hands, my fingers on these two metal strips, it does what it was designed to do. It literally lights up and it hums. And if I lift up my finger, it stops. So what I'm demonstrating is a concept that you all are already familiar with. You just haven't been taught to internalize it from the proper perspective. You all know uh, the symbol called the caduceus. The symbol of medicine, the two snakes in the time in the twine around the staff, yeah, yeah. they represent this concept, this principle that I'm demonstrating to you right now. The flow of energy through your body. And that you must possess the knowledge in order to manage this flow so that you can be free from illness, free from disease, free from poverty. Mm -hmm. Because that is the ability or that is the capacity that we all have. And so energy is literally flowing from one metal strip into my fingers, into the other finger, I complete the circuit and cause this ball to light up and hum. So this electrical energy, so my body is a conduit through which energy flows. And if I know how to manage this energy, I can do some incredible things. If I don't know how to manage this energy and mismanage my life, I can literally create hell on earth. And I want you all to understand that this concept, this reality, affects not just my body, but everybody in the world. All right? So let me ask the five of you all to come on up here. First two rows, come on up here.
want you to uh, form a circle and hold hands. Just form a circle. Let me get in the circle. How you doing? Good to see you. All right. My brother, I want you to take your index finger and touch this metal strip. Just one finger. Brother, I want you to let go of your right hand. All right, that's okay. See what happened? Hold hands again. All right? So energy is moving from me to her to him to him to him to him back to me. Completing the circuit and causing this instrument, this toy, to light up and hum. So what that demonstrates, thank you all. So what that demonstrates is energy flows through everybody. I'm just demonstrating an electrical current. But I want you all to understand that thought is energy. What you think affects not just you, but everybody in your environment. How many times have you ever told somebody, you make me sick, and then you catch a cold? <laughs> See, because you don't put thoughts out without the same thoughts coming back right. to you right. tenfold. Right. So you must learn to be the guardian of your thoughts. Because thoughts are things. And they affect your reality. So as I wind down, I want to share with you. I want to share with you the contents of a little bitty book that I read in 1978 that has been my Bible, my God. And what's interesting is that the contents of this book were used in a song by, of all people, George Clinton and Pound and Funkadelic. Those of you who still have vinyl, you got the album Standing on the Verge of Getting It On? came out around 1973. The last cut on side B is a cut called Good Thoughts, Bad Thoughts. It is nothing more than George Clinton taking the words from a book written around the turn of last century called uh, As a Man Thinketh by James Allen. One of the most significant books I've ever read in my life because it lays down a very simple understanding of how your thoughts determine and affect every aspect of your life. I want to share these words with you and just interpret and help you internalize the power in these words. It says, travel like a king, queen. Listen to the inner voice. A higher wisdom is at work for you. Conquering stumbling blocks comes easier when the conqueror is in tune with the infinite. Every ending is a new beginning. Life is an endless unfoldment. Change your mind and you change your relationship to time. Let me repeat that because that's a simple statement but it's so profound. Change your mind and you change your relationship to time. How many of you all have ever gotten in trouble because of something that you said? And if you just changed your mind and didn't say that or said it differently, you would have changed your whole relationship to time and space. It says here that you can find the answer. The solution lies within the problem. The answer is in every question. But an attitude is all you need to rise and walk away. So inspire yourself. Your life is yours. It fits you like your skin. Inspire yourself. Check out that word inspire. In spirit. Spirit uh, is a term that represents breath, but it also represents the energy from the creator, the energy from God. Inspire means to bring the spirit of God inside of you which then changes every aspect of your consciousness and allows you to see things that you could have never seen before. Inspire you yourself, your life is yours, it fits you like your skin. The oak sleeps in the acorn. The giant sequoia tree sleeps in its tiny seed. The bird waits in the egg, and God waits for his unfoldment in man says here that you gravitate to that which you secretly love most. 
You make in life the exact reproduction of your own thoughts. There is no chance, coincidence, or accident in a universe ruled by law and divine order. Within this context, you rise as high as your dominant aspiration. You descend to the level of your lowest concept of yourself. The infinite intelligence within you knows the answers. And its nature is to respond to your thoughts. So we must be careful of the thought seeds we plant in the garden of our minds, for seeds grow after their kind. Every thought accepted as true or allowed to be accepted as true by your conscious mind takes root in your subconscious mind and blossoms sooner or later into an act and bears its own fruit. Good thoughts bring forth good fruit. Bad thoughts will rot your flesh. Think right and you can fly. For the kingdom of heaven is within. That's the essence of life in a nutshell. Heaven is here. It's not up there. It's not some ways off. It's right here, right now. But if you don't know that, if you've been conditioned to believe that it exists outside of you, and if you are waiting for somebody to bring it to you, you'll be waiting till the day you die. But if you know it, if you know, if you understand with crystal clarity that you have within your person a direct line of communication with the Creator by flowing through your ancestors, you will begin to understand that there is nothing that you cannot do because there is nothing that has not already been done. So with a change of mind, you change your consciousness. So I'll close on this note that the final frontier that we're dealing with, brothers and sisters, is about consciousness. During the period of uh, enslavement, during the Ma'afa, we struggled for our human rights. During the 40s, 50s, and 60s, we struggled for civil rights. And now as we move into and through the 21st century, our struggle is for consciousness to begin to fully understand what we have always had and with that understanding change the world by first changing our mind you've got it in you you can do it and as soon as we do it collectively the world will be ours again thank you very much <laughs>
said, well, you know, I don't like um, Booker T. Washington. I think he was something of an uncle top. I said, no, you have to study Booker T. Washington because if we had followed what he did and what he was pushing us toward, we would be starting small but becoming big. The way the Asians went into that market a number of years ago when they held, they pushed the Asian out of the fruit market. You know, with John Kennard, they pushed, they wouldn't allow them because they wanted to get the fruit so they could have these fruit stands. They went in and bought up the, the, the supply spot. And thus we saw all of them. So at that business level, at that operational level, we need every little thing. In spite of what happened to us, I, have, I told them about Tulsa. Yes, yes. we were in the mood. So all the foreigners coming in, looking down on us because they don't know our history, thinking we're lazy, right. thinking we're not uh, a part of the enterprising corporate reality or doing the things we ought to be doing. We've had obstacles like no other race or group. And so none of these groups compared to us are to tell us where to do, what to do, and where to go. Every single one, we built this country. And so they stand on our backs, and we must be able to know and tell them in detail. For we are a parent people. God made us that way. And we are to fulfill a responsibility at this point in time, at 2008. What we didn't do in 2007, we do in 2008. Keep your chin up, as Adam Powell said, keep the faith, baby. Resurrection, rebirth, regeneration. This symbol 
on the surface represents the male felix, mm -hmm. the male reproductive organ. But in its deep thought, and that's what Dr. Correct is, Dr. Payton and all the rest, Dr. Uh, Pat Newton, uh, Dr. Francis Coswell, they are telling us all to get into deep thought. This symbol in its deepest thought represents the power of the female mother principle to form a sisterhood, to sustain that sisterhood because they have to nourish the family. They have to help correct the major fatal fault among males, which is jealousy and envy, which leads to hate and self-destruction and death. Our people thousands of years ago institutionalized what is happening to us today on Fulton Street. The destruction from jealousy, envy, and ignorance. Lack of spiritual understanding that we all spirit. The female has a built-in process of understanding spirit because she brings forth life. Yes, And after life has been brought forth, she nurtures life. And after life has had its footing, then she sustains life. But there's a spiritual consciousness that lets us know that the female also has the power to rebirth and resurrect life. And so when you saw our two sisters follow uh, our brother Tony and our sister, Sister McNeil, she don't want me to call her Mother McNeil, Queen Mother McNeil, uh, you'll see that they're making a plea to try to rebirth, yes. resurrect, the brotherhood failed. And this is a symbol of a failed brotherhood. The brotherhood failed, and when you hear Alton speak his heart, he talks about the failure. Mm -hmm. If he ever gets a chance to talk about Reverend Al Sharpton, he talks about the failure of brotherhood. <laughs> if you ever get to talk about the political leadership in this yeah. city, yeah. he talks about the failure of brotherhood. Mm -hmm. The brotherhood failed. Yeah. Yeah. And it seems to be an eternal condition that we've got to change. Yeah. And so when we're talking about resurrecting, UAM, not for having you some have some feel-good sessions here at the Elks Plaza. It's because we've got to build strength in the sisterhood that has been our survival process. And then make sure that the brotherhood is put in place so that you have a serious family based upon the twin pillars of the male and the female process. I got a bald-headed brother sitting in the back. Most of you don't know him. But it was the sisterhood that my mother had with her older sisters that she bonded with other people that weren't even her sisters and they were sisters. That she bonded with my father's sisters to produce a village in North New Jersey that of the 100 kids I grew up with, 90 of us made it big. Wow. Because the women put in place the village so spiritually we all grew. They put in place the men that protected us. And I was mentioning my brother. My brother and I are an example of the successful brotherhood. Right. My mother wanted to make sure that we didn't have the conflicts and the problems of sibling rivalry, jealousy, and envy. And my brother can tell you some tales, uh, which are true, that his big brother failed in certain instances and didn't realize that mama had put in place that we are extensions of each other Amen. and that we should never fail each other. Mm -hmm. Now when he raised his boys, he put in place a success process and his young men have been rivals with each other, but they never had destruction and death as a part of their process. And my brother couldn't fail to put in place because my mother had put in place. He was just following what she had put in place. So that's what we're trying to say. There is a, a process that we're talking about. We're not talking about entertaining you. There's a process of sacrifice, a process of sharing the responsibility. Ultimatics is not Jesus. He can't do it himself. Amen. He ain't going to bring no salvation by himself. He's one powerful brother who is standing, and Alton couldn't stand if Yola wasn't under him, around him, over him, and, and carrying the burden. 
and you're dealing with the process of strengthening the black family. Jeff, stand up so they can see your ball head. He's not a member of the blood, even though he got on red today. He's got his own African martial arts. And I'm so proud of him because he said, you take care of the world, I'm going to take care of my boys. So he's raised up two man child in Brooklyn. He didn't take them to the suburbs. Raised them on Rogers Avenue, Nostrum, Sterling Place. But instilled in them a fighting spirit instilled in them a sense of motivation and achievement. And so now you've got a Hakeem Jeffries who is the council state assemblyman from this area. You've got a, a baby a brother who is a professor out in Ohio State who did his PhD on the Lowndes County Freedom Party in Mississippi. Out down in Mississippi, he went down there and did his studies, his young brother from Brooklyn. But they had the strength, they had the mission, they had the purpose because it was put into the family context. And that's what we're trying to say. These sessions on Wednesday can be very beneficial for us. If we're talking about building family, if we're talking about building manhood, if we're talking about building brotherhood, if we're talking about building sisterhood, it can mean something to it. But there's no need to drag Tony Brown up from Washington, D.C. and bring him here to tell you what his life experiences has been and how he's arrived at this point where he uses that knowledge to let you know that you are the thing that you've been looking for. But not you as a Negro. You as an African. Not you looking for the external, but you tapping in the internal. And the internal is God. Yes. Brother Small came up with it. You are God having a human experience. I like that. Yes. Because it gives you a sense of purpose and a meaning in your life instead of making a whole lot of money, getting a big house, getting a big car, and then watching the big boys play the game and the system collapse. Obama is the best thing that's happened to us since sliced bread. Yes. Obama is the best thing that's happened to us yes. since sliced bread. Not because he is him. He is the best thing that happened to us because he's thrown the white boy off of his psychic center. Yeah, yeah. The white boy is looking for a man the white boy was looking for Alton Madison. The white boy was looking for Malcolm X. The white boy was looking for Martin King. The white boy was looking for Reverend Sharpton. But the white boy is not prepared to find out what is this thing that has come up out of nowhere. So we can expect Obama to put in place a Pan-African formula for our success. We can expect him to put in place a plan to bring our young people out of the prisons and put them on the on the good foot of Africanness. We can expect him to teach our children in the school system because we should be teaching them at home before we take them in the school system. What Obama has done has thrown the white system in chaos and confusion, and now those of us should have had in place an African plan so we could run it through and he will be the smoke screen. While he's doing the smoke screen over here, we run the African thing through here and take it all the way through Brooklyn and through, and through every other black community and take it to the Caribbean and spread up those crazy people in the islands and to Brazil and then go into the country and say, we're here, mothers, we're taking this shit back. We're going to Africanize your ass. And I'm talking about the Africans on the continent who are in the process As we speak, they are giving away the continent. And the symbol of giving it away is Nelson Mandela. As great as he was, he did not have a systems analysis. And the white boy has mastered that. And the white boy said, bring Nelson out. Give the black people a circus. Let them raise their fists in the air. As long as we keep the gold, the diamonds, the platinum, the ring, the platinum, the belly, and the wealth of that. So let Vote for Barack Obama. Let's raise the banners for Barack Obama. But then let's get busy putting the African plan in place. Yeah. Yeah. It's happening. It's our era. 
I told Tony to bring 30 or so books for my classes. He did. That's in the little white bag there. He slipped me an article he's done on the article on National Geographic. He's already analyzed it and put it on the internet. So I told him, I'm preparing something too. I'll give it to him. He said he'll put it on the internet. But what you see here is an example of the consciousness that he's talking about. An example of the brotherhood, sisterhood that I'm talking about. These are images of the pharaohs of the 25th dynasty in the Nile almost 3,000 years ago that came up out of the ground in 2003 to awaken even deeper our consciousness of great leadership. They represented another Wahimi Wasu, which is a repetition of the birth, the repetition of the birth, the rebirth of African greatness. They found them in a ditch in the Kerma ruins that Brother Taki and I had a chance to visit. Put your hands in the air, Taki. Taki led me to, to the Sudan, to the great ruins of our people there. That's what this is all about. So we went to Tamarca Sum. We went to Kianki, to Meroe, etc. And what we saw was a reconstitution of the African family for power. That's what this represents. Don't get caught up in a paralysis or analysis. Well, they're not dealing with the truth. And they didn't deal with this. They didn't. The global important thing is that these brothers built images of themselves to represent the power of Africans for eternity. And they were broken up systematically and put in the ground so they would rise up at the right time. 3,000 years later, almost 2003, they rise up let the black man and black woman know the black family now is your time and you need to get ready for it but we having trouble asking y'all to find some money to support your own life and development gotta beg you to make the sacrifices you only here because of sacrifice your grandma sacrificed your grandfather sacrificed your great grandparents sacrificed you're here because of sacrifice you're the most the wealthiest Black family in the history of the world is us Negroes in America. The trillion dollar Negro. But because you are the trillion dollar Negro, you can't use your wealth. Because you are the trillion dollar Negro, you can't tap into this knowledge. Because you are the trillion dollar Negro, even if it's put in your face, you don't know how to use it internally for self-development and spiritual development. These are things you've got to learn. They've got to be taught. That's why they built Temple University Spiritual Center. So they can train the leadership. Leadership just doesn't come out of the air. Where does Obama come from? White mother, black father who's absent. His father died. Hawaiian education and training. That's why I said his father was absent. Oh, okay. His father was absent, so he didn't have a father. And of that we think of. Training, the ultimate training out of self occurred when this brother was went all the way up to Harvard and they recognized his greatness and made him the head of the Harvard Law Review. There are thousands and thousands of white boys who want to go to Harvard, but there ain't but a few of them who could even imagine that they could be the editor of the Harvard Law Review. That's one of the highest positions anybody can obtain in America in terms of education. Wow. Once he got to that level, he was safe. There's nothing he would do to upset this system. Mm -hmm. And somehow or other, he's moving through the world, upsetting the system. I don't think that's his white mama. I don't think that's his ancestors. But when they had a CNN program and they showed his grandmama in Kenya, I said, shit, that's it. That's it.
about him as a little boy and, and how humble he was, etc. Then she took him back inside and then showed him the pictures on the wall of her, her, her living room. And I said, there's got to be a little baby picture of him in here somewhere. There was not. But there was a picture of him in the prime of young manhood. He had come back from America and was making a trip to the village of his African family. It was his rites of passage. And you saw this 12-year-old, 13-year-old, light-skinned dude with a big afro and a pack on his back going back to Africa. That spirit, that soul is speaking to his black ass. It ain't the right part of his existence. But he has been so educated that that shouldn't even speak to him. Except, except, if he had had the misfortune of marrying a Chelsea Clinton, or even the Kennedy daughters, there'd be no African manifestation coming out of him, even with the potentiality. But he found himself a black woman. Remember Dr. 
Benjamin and Dr. Clark, etc., and what they said. But unless you can put that stuff inside of you to empower you, you ain't going nowhere. Just as these ancestors came up out of the ground 2003 to let you know what state state building is, what empire building is, these people was put down as the wretched push. And they said, we'll show you how wretched we are. We'll bring our armies up from the south. We'll unify the whole Nile. We'll even go beyond the Nile also to the Tigris Euphrates. We'll rebuild the temples. We'll, we'll enhance the holy mount. We'll raise the, the consciousness of African peoples that existed thousands of years before us. We'll raise it anew. That's why you got the Shabaka stone. Yes. This is the Haka. But his son was Shabaka. And we have the Shabaka stone in which the philosophical understanding of the universe has been carved on a stone. Ancient wisdom that these brothers renewed and brought forth. And that's why when you have Booker Coleman here, we listen to him, he gives us a lecture, but his book is the one that raised the Shabaka stone and the whole metaphysical understanding of the universe that Africans laid down. They didn't wait for the biblical tradition that emerged from the Jews and it was carried on by the ancient Christians and carried on by the Greeks and then perverted by the Romans. Did I hear somebody say amen? Amen. amen. traditions and understanding God is our contribution to the universe. And our contribution is that everything is spiritually connected. And certainly the male and the female principle are spiritually connected. And when they connect, they produce another spirit, which is life. It's not a cursed life. It is God being born again. So we got to understand our deep traditions. And there is an explosion of knowledge. I call it the period of the Great Awakening, 1945 to 1995, and beyond. And that's what Tony was trying to tell you all about. See? That's what Asa was trying to tell you about. He taught us how to live Africa for his 70-something years, and he taught us how to die Africa. Well, wasn't Asa killed in the Boulay Sour? The Boulay wanted him to join them. He didn't want to join the Boulay. They begged him to join them so they could add his power to them. They are still made in life. The boule is a brotherhood that has been put in place to keep you crippled. Mm -hmm. And all of our leadership is involved in it. Mm -hmm. Reverend Oliver, I hope you're involved. But if you are, I hope you're involved. <laughs> <laughs> they wouldn't have an altar class. They wouldn't have a But 5,000 of our greatest people are in the boule including Samuel Proctor, including Ryan T. Walker, including all of the congressmen, including Jesse Jackson. They're in a brotherhood of power that's not an African brotherhood concept. It's a concept that complements skull and bone. Yes. yes, indeed. But we can't get into that now. But I'm trying to tell you, you all tapping into something serious when you come up here, right. up on here with us. And we bring in the Tony Browns. You can't pay for what he gives you. Okay? And we had the pleasure of taking him and his new wife, Janice, to Africa because they wanted to get married in Africa in one of our villages where we are queen mothers and, and chiefs in Elmina, where the, it started 100, uh, 400, 500 years ago. 1482 is when the Europeans came and planted a permanent base on African soil to destroy Africa. But Africans are trying to take it back. And when they install a Len Jeffries in the, in the slave dungeon complex and they install a Rousin Jeffries, that's a part of the taking it back. And then when the Tony Browder said they want to get married, we say get married in our village. And so they, they had a fantastic ceremony, Janice and Tony uh, in, in Africa, in Elmina. So that's what he's talking about, spiritual consciousness. Can you imagine if we put if one Negro Obama <laughs> can shake the white world. The military people don't know what to do. They say, what is he going to do with the military? <laughs> he, he can't change the military. The military is there forever. He can, the CIA is there. Well, what is he going to do with us? <laughs> the FBI. Because he don't take away no one tell, bro. They don't know what the hell is going on. And he is too busy shaking them up to put an African plan in. <laughs> 
place. Uh-huh. You have to put it in place. It has to start with you, with your family, with your community, with your institution. You have to put it in place. So we got a plan. We got a plan for the next meeting, like our sister was saying. And I'm planning for y'all too, because we've got to put an economic consciousness in place. Yes. So yeah. all is going to have his big activity on the 15th yeah. at the City College. Okay. Yeah, I have to support him. On the 14th, that evening Friday, I'm going to have something big at the City College. But that's okay. just going to be to get us moving. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to have to have a plan for the first year. You're going to have to have a five-year plan. You're going to have to have a 10-year plan. You're going to have to have a 20-year plan. Yeah. Yes. Now, these mothers may be taking this shit back now. Because they don't put in their five, ten, and twenty year plan. That's why they take it back home, they take it back Brooklyn, they take it back Palm Heights. Yeah. But if we start putting in an African plan, yeah. we, can we can make sure that their plan gets messed up. Yeah. But you gotta plan it. Yeah. You gotta plan it. Yeah. And you ain't held us. If one little light skinned Negro with a white mom mm. can shake up the greatest powers that be, can you imagine? If a few thousand of us got this shit together, yeah. some hundred thousand of us together, a few million of us got it together, and they even thought you was getting it together, it would shake their hands together. very blessed tonight to have a brother here and I have really enjoyed buying his publications if you do not have this brother's books on file then you really are not a serious student of ancient Kemet if you don't have his books if you don't have Now Valley Contribution Civilization and the Browder file and the two books by him and his daughter you have really missed the mark you really missed the mark. The, the Nile Valley Contribution to Civilization is necessary for every family. And there's a workbook to go along with it. That's necessary. That's the most workable publication uh, that we have. And so you all are uh, asked uh, when you get ready to leave here tonight to certainly go by and, and see if there's any more left. Some of y'all better tip back there now if y'all really know what y'all are in for. Because y'all don't want that book to leave without y'all having purchased it. It is a deep book. And if you're having problem with the questions in the, uh, in the program this week, if y'all can't answer these questions, just go through them. Look at them real quick while y'all saluting Anthony Brown as he come down here. If y'all having problem with these questions, y'all better jet back there and get that book. Y'all hear what I'm saying? Y'all better jet back there and get that book if y'all having a problem with these questions. Because you are not a serious student if you're having a problem with these questions. And the answers can only be obtained tonight from the now valid contributions to civilization. And certainly, if you have never been to Washington, D.C., on an African-centered educational tour. See, some of y'all send y'all uh, children down there with Europeans. Every year. 
Y'all send them down there with Europeans to mess up their minds. All right, and they don't have the foggiest notion of what they're looking at and certainly can't identify with their own blood. Anthony Browder is the cure to that. It should be so many black folks going to Washington having this brother take them around on tours that he couldn't even get up here tonight. Y'all hear what I'm saying? But we don't even know that we contributed to nothing. Some have heard about Banneker, but we think he was just a surveyor. All right? So we don't even know that. But this is how important it is. We went down there this year and had a great time. For those of you who went, am I right? A great time in Washington, D.C. It is a must. Go back to your school districts and tell them they must take their children to Washington and let Anthony Browder be the tour guide. If you, all, you got children, that's a must. Thank you for your children out here tonight. We're serious. This is serious work. You know, it's sad for us to have our children look in the mirror and black as they are and see a white Superman as a reflection. Wow. As their hero. That's a real tragedy. That's a real tragedy. You want to know what happened to your children. Why are they going wrong? And they got you in family court and criminal court and you spending thousands of dollars to these crackers when the only thing you had to do is go back there and buy a book and get their hair straight. But you'd rather uh, give $5,000 to Mr. Goldstein. All right, to get some out and buy Power Rangers then to go back there and get a book and get somebody's head straight. Wake up, black folks. This book ought to be in every school district. Tomorrow, you ought to be calling your school boards and challenging them. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, if they won't treat you like right, why do you think they will teach you right? What could be in your minds? Whatever it is, the mind buster, the lighthouse of Kemet is here in the house tonight and is coming down the runway. Everybody get on their feet and get a breeze of this brother as he strolled down the aisle. Our brother, Anthony T. Browder. Washington, D.C., the Institute of Comic Goddess. Let's give a warm round of applause to our keynote speaker for tonight, Brother Anthony T. Browder. Let's give. <laughs> to start right now. All right, brother. Brooklyn. All right, let's do it again. I am always pleased to be here, to be back with, um, with my extended family, because um, the spirit in this house is unlike the spirit in, in many houses throughout the nation. I'm here because you all have taken the time <clears throat> out of your busy day to come out on such an ungodly evening. You know, I hate this time of year. The cold, this is not weather that is meant for African people. But I thank you all for coming out and for supporting Brother Maddox and his organization and for coming to, to hear me speak. And I trust that the words that I share with you this evening will make you feel that uh, it has been time well spent. Before I begin my, my comments this evening, I want us to take a few minutes to uh, acknowledge uh, a brother, brother that we need to send some prayers out to this evening, uh, a brother by the name of Listervelt Middleton, who is uh, the host and producer of a program that comes out of South Carolina. Uh, the program is entitled For the People. It's a program that's been running for 19 years now and has featured all of the famous African and African-American historians and scholars and scientists and you name it. 
the brother has featured these personalities on his program. Brother Listervelt has been facing for a number of years now a major health challenge. He has multiple myeloma, uh, cancer in the bone marrow. Uh, he was treated for this disease several years ago. And the cancer was in remission for 15 months up until August of this year. Tomorrow, Brother Middleton goes in for a bone marrow transplant. Uh, his son, Bakari, is 15 years old, donated his marrow yesterday to help sustain his father's life. So I'm going to ask that you all this evening, when you leave here, before you go to bed tonight, to pray to whatever God you pray to and ask the Creator to, to send a special blessing to Brother Listervelt so that we can heal him. There's also going to be a program next weekend in South Carolina for Brother Listervelt. Uh, a number of scholars are traveling from all over the country uh, to come and speak at this benefit to help raise funds to defray his medical expenses. And so I, I ask you all to keep Brother Listervelt in your hearts and minds so that uh, we can ensure that he will be with us. He will continue to bring knowledge and information to the people for at least the next 55, 60 years. All right. All right. <clears throat> now, as usual, when I, when I come here, <clears throat> I like to, to talk about our history and our culture, yes, but I also like to present the information from a very practical standpoint. I always like to talk about things that we can use today. Specifically, I like to talk about information that we can begin to incorporate into our lives to help transform the quality of our lives. And so when Brother Maddox called me about um, a week and a half ago and asked me if, uh, if I would be available to come down, I of course said yes, because I, I knew that this meeting on Wednesday, this Wednesday will give me an opportunity to share some information with you all that I feel is, is, is vitally crucial to our survival as a people. What I specifically want to, to focus on this evening is the importance, the significance of this particular time of year, all right. the Christmas season, the holiday season. Right. And I want to talk about it from an African perspective from a cultural perspective that also takes into account its historical and astrological, astronomical significance. See, because I'm convinced that there are some peculiar happenings that go on during this so-called holiday season. Happenings that if you are aware of and begin to take advantage of will allow you to be able to transform your quality of life. Very simple, very basic information, like most of the information about ourselves, our history, and our culture. Very simple, very basic information, but as long as that information is withheld from you, you will never be able to do what you should be doing with knowledge in order to transform your life. So I want you all to, to listen intently, to take notes, and to begin to think about applying some of this information within the course of the next two to three weeks. One of the things that, that prompted uh, my, my thoughts on this particular topic was a conversation I had with a, a good brother uh, by the name of Akbir Ra. He's the author. As a matter of fact, he's the editor of, uh, served as the editor of Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization. He's also the author of a, uh, a book on Medu Neture entitled Let the Ancestors Speak. And he was talking about <coughs> the significance of the language of ancient Kemet, the beauty of the language of ancient Kemet. And talked about it from the context of, of Medu Neture, literally meaning God's words or the writing of God. He said that it's, it's an, he refers to it as an ideographic form of communication that uses symbols to represent ideas as opposed to letters which have no meaning whatsoever until they're placed in a certain combination that they spell certain words. In Kemet, ancient Egypt, the role of the scribe 
or the priest was to impart the meaning of those symbols that were incorporated within the, the word of God or the writing of God. His role was to impart the meaning of those symbols to those who were prepared to receive that knowledge so that they can then receive the word and act on it. Knowledge and information is made available to you, but if you don't know what to do with it, it means nothing. That's one of the things that uh, the brothers and sisters discovered this past June when we did the African Center tour for them. One of the things that we point out is the fact that in your midst today are symbols that are incorporated within the architecture, within the layout of the city, symbols that tell you who you are where you came from, but if you don't know how to interpret those symbols, then you just walk past the building, drive past the building without realizing that the truth is right before your very eyes. In ancient Kemet, Meru Netcher, the symbols consist of images which were derived from nature, which were derived from the environment. Plants, animals, water, people, all symbols that everybody can relate to. Symbols that told those who had an understanding and a deep appreciation for these symbols, told them what they could begin to do, what they could begin to understand as a result of studying this knowledge and information. The tradition of relating nature to one's environment is an integral part of all African languages. It's an integral part of African culture. We relate to our environment. We gain understanding and wisdom based upon studying every element that exists within our society. Because each element means something special to us. It is the means by which African people understood their relationship to the creator, that is the being that was responsible for creating all of these elements that exist within the society. Within traditional African languages, metaphors were used to communicate to the initiated and the uninitiated simultaneously. In other words, you could present a general message and those who had no idea what you were talking about would get one meaning from it, only hear one aspect. But those who were trained to look for the deeper meaning would hear something totally different and would know how to respond with that information. The initiated derived one meaning from the conversation, while others usually derived a totally different meaning while one conversation was taking place. So in other words, what I want you to begin to be aware of is the fact that there are several ways that you all can begin to look at and process information. That was one of the things that I talked about the last time I was here. When Africans were enslaved, we were forbidden to speak our language, to practice these traditions, to begin to communicate with the Creator as we knew the Creator to be. But we found an effective way of communicating sometimes in our songs. So if we listen to some of the so-called Negro spirituals, we will hear messages that were encoded in the music, messages that were rich with a metaphoric language that was designed to communicate to the initiated, i.e. those who understood that there was a message in the music. For example, you all are familiar with the song Swing Low, Sweet Chariot, Coming Forth to Carry Me Home? That was a call to those initiated within the plantation to begin to prepare to leave the plantation. The chariot is getting ready to take you home, to take you out of here. But those who could not be trusted heard the song and thought it meant something else. There was a code, there was a message incorporated within that song. The, the, the other spiritual, down by the riverside, was a directive to those Africans where they should meet. Telling you where to meet, telling you when to meet. When to meet. And as you prepare to escape from the plantation, you needed to have some directions that would help you find your way as you travel north. There was another song that gave them codes as to how to find their way north. That code was, follow the drinking gourd. What's the drinking gourd? The drinking gourd is a metaphor for the Little Dipper, Polaris, the North Star. And within that song, was the code to look up to the sky to follow that particular aspect of the heavens in order to differentiate the Big Dipper from the Little Dipper in order to find the North Star 
to find your way to freedom. All right. We have some very powerful and effective ways of communicating our message to those people who were interested in freeing themselves, liberating themselves. There was another song that I'm sure you all have heard, a song called Wade in the Water. Wade in the Water. What's the significance of wading in the water? See, because when you when you were getting ready to leave the plantation, when you're going down by the riverside, when you're going to follow the drinking gourd, you know that once you leave, the white man is going to come looking for you. He's going to bring his bloodhounds to track you down. So what do you do? You wade in the water to throw off the scent so the bloodhounds can't follow you. All right. Very simple and very practical means of ensuring that you can make it out of hell and find your way north. There's also very powerful message found in a song that's commonly referred to as a Negro National Anthem, a song that I heard people in here singing a little while ago. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. We need to look at this, we need to look at this song and the messages in this song. James Weldon Johnson wrote it, All right. 1900. It's a song that talks about the Creator. It's a song that has some very important messages for us, but in order to really understand the messages in the song, we have to understand something about the person who wrote the song. James Weldon Johnson was an agnostic. Huh? He was a person who believed in a creative spirit, but he also felt that it is difficult, if not impossible, for man to know God. But yet there is a creative spirit. And if you analyze the words to lift every voice and sing, from the vantage point of James Weldon Johnson, a person who realized that the concept of God was a concept that was sometimes too deep for the average person to really comprehend, and if you break down the stanza, the stanzas of that song, then you'll find some very important metaphors. The first stanza speaks of the present time. Right. Begins with lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Talks about today, right now. Right. The second stanza speaks of our ancient past. Stony the road we tried, bit of the chastening ride. He talks about the things that we went through as a people. The third stanza speaks of our future, right. in which he tells us what we have to do based upon where we were, where we are now, and what it is that we need to be doing in order to ensure our survival. The third stanza says, God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, God who has brought us far along the way, God who has by thy might led us into the light, keep us forever on the path we pray, least our feet stray from the past, path our God where we met thee, least our hearts drunk with the wine of the world we forget thee, Shadow beneath thy hand, may we forever stand true to our God, true to our native land. Now, what was James Weldon Johnson talking about? True to our God, true to our native land. If he was an agnostic, what was he telling us? True to our God, true to our native land, references the concepts of the Neturu or the concepts of the Creator which sprang from the minds of African people as perceived by Africans in their native land. He's telling you specifically who you should focus your attention on. Right. Our God from our land, right. not him. Right. Shadow beneath thy hand. What is he talking about? Shadow beneath thy hand. What is a shadow? Shadow is the shade cast by a body that intercepts the rays of light. The shadow is a metaphor which represents the presence of a force that is greater than oneself, that is the creator, what we may call God. The force is symbolized by the sun, which is the source of light that makes the shadow. Huh? All right. It makes the shadow visible. So the force is always there, but the shadow is that which reaffirms the presence of that force. Symbolic metaphors that talks about a profound understanding of the African concept of the creator. The African's reference to the sun as a symbol of God is a subject that must be discussed, particularly at this time of year. All 
There are numerous cultural celebrations which pertain to light and the sun. Celebrations that go on at this time of year. A few days from now, some people on the other side of town are going to be celebrating, celebrating Hanukkah. Right. That is what? The festival of light. All right? All right. All right. On Christmas, All right. December the 25th. Some folk on another side of town are gonna, going to be celebrating the birth of the sun. S-U-N, S-O-N, it was still spelled the same way 2,000 years ago. What are they talking about? After Christmas, some people on this side of town are going to be celebrating Kwanzaa. Seven-day African festival of the first fruits, which is directly related to light. You don't get the fruits, you don't get the harvest without the presence of the sun, or the power from the sun that makes the food manifest. All right. So all of these festivals that celebrate light are directly related to a celestial phenomenon that takes place in the heavens and has a profound effect on every living thing on planet Earth. By nature, the fact that we were born in America, born in a Christian society, we have been programmed to embrace the holiday spirit. We've been programmed to embrace it. Some of us who have come into our African minds have begun to see this whole thing differently, but we need to understand our programming. And how sometimes when you hear Nat King Cole sing the Christmas song, you want to you want to chime in a little bit. Or when you hear Donny Hathaway sing this Christmas, you know, you want to chime in a little bit because of that programming. All right. All right, so it's in us. We need to understand that, but then be able to take it to the next level right. and understand what it really talks about. So my objective this evening is to help you decipher the metaphors related to this highly spiritual time of year so that you can maximize all of the benefits that are, are available to every single one of you. Again, this is knowledge and information that you aren't going to learn in school. You certainly won't learn it in church. Why? Because it's not about giving you information to free yourself. It's about giving you a certain amount of information so that you will, you will remain connected to that source that is feeding you, spoon feeding you the information. Okay. So hopefully you all will hear my words this evening and understand the spirit with which the words are being imparted to you. And if you think about it, again, focusing initially on Christmas, if you think about it, we need to realize the truth that no one knows the day that Jesus was born. No one knows. They don't have the faintest idea. If your pastor is truthful and honest, then he or she will tell you we don't know when Jesus the Christ was born. So if that's the truth, then all of these songs that sing about the birth of Jesus are not telling you the truth. All of these pictures that you see in the books about Jesus being born in the manger on this day are not telling you the truth. The celebration of Christmas, the celebration of the birth of Jesus the Christ on December the 25th did not take place until 350 AD. Mm. Right. Historical fact, right. historical reality. Mm. The reason why that date was adopted by Constantine was because it was a date in which the people of the world specifically the people of the world that Constantine wanted to conquer, they had celebrated this date for over 3,000 years as the birth of the sun. Now, what does that mean? Let me give you a reference. And I, and I, and I need to cite this reference specifically in order to pay honor to uh, the brother that, that, that recorded it in a book John G. Jackson, who has since passed on to the realm of the ancestors. Uh, the book was entitled Introduction to African Civilization. The citation comes from page 144, and I can still remember how I felt when I read that passage and what it did to me. John Jackson said, in Egypt 3,000 years ago, 
The birth date of the sun god was celebrated in the temples the 25th of December, 3,000 years ago. Why? Because it was the first day to lengthen, obviously, after December the 21st, the day of the winter solstice. At the midnight hour, on the very first minute of the 21st of December, the birth of the sun was commemorated. At that time, the sun was in the zodiacal sign of Capricorn, which was known as the stable of Aegeus. So the infant sun god was said to have been born in a stable. Shining brightly on the meridian was Sirius, the star from the east while rising in the east was Virgo, the Virgin, the astrological uh, constellation of Virgo the Virgin, and the line of the horizon was passing through her center. The whole concept of a virgin birth is written in the stars. To the right of Sirius was Orion, the great hunter, with three stars in his belt. And those stars lie in a straight line and point toward Sirius. And in the ancient times, the, these three stars were known as the three kings or the three magi. So all of this stuff that has been inculcated into Christian lore was based upon astronomical knowledge that was practiced thousands of years before the birth of Jesus the Christ. So if Constantine had this desire to conquer the rest of the world and to impose a new religious ideology on the minds of the people that he conquered, then one of the first things that he had to do was to ensure that he could minimize people's resistance to this new concept. So he selected a date that they had already set aside as a holiday and imposed his holiday on theirs. After their children died, they will forget the holiday of their ancestors and celebrate the holiday of the people who had just recently mentally enslaved them. So in the winter solstice, or Christmas, the sun is in the southernmost position of the sky. And after that time, it begins to travel northward across the elliptic. And then at the vernal equinox, or Easter, it passes over the celestial equator. This passing over the sun from the south to the north of the equator was the origin of the festival of Passover. The whole idea of Passover literally talks about the sun, the S-U-N, passing over the equator. All they did was to change, change the terminology and make the S-U-N the S-O-N and had the Passover. At that particular point in time, the sun was resurrected in the northern hemisphere. And so it was said that the sun, the S-O-N, was resurrected. That's where all of these concepts and ideas come from. When this event was recorded 3,000 years ago, the sun passing over the equator 3,000 years ago, the sun was situated in the sign of Aries the ram or the lamb. And so it became a symbol of the sacrificial lamb, the Passover lamb. All of this stuff is directly related to aspects of astronomy. This time of year coincides with the spring equinox, which is also symbolic of the resurrection and the return of life. During the spring, life literally springs forth from the black earth. Vegetation comes back into existence. It is a time of year when birds build their nests and lay eggs, and animals then give birth to the young, which represents a continuation of the life cycle. It is a time of rebirth and regeneration on the earth. There were two prominent symbols that were used in ancient Africa to represent this time, this transformation, this regeneration of life. And those two symbols, particularly symbols that were used in Kemet, were symbols of the egg, which represents the potential for new life that exists within this container, as well as the rabbit. The rabbit was a symbol of abundant birth. Why? Because the rabbits have the ability to produce multiple births in a very short period of time. The rabbit was a symbol that was always associated 
with fertility. And so it was these two symbols in the newly emerging Christian religion that led to the myth of the Easter bunny and the Easter eggs. Think about it. Rabbits don't lay eggs, do they? What's the significance of that? Why do we every Easter talk about the Easter bunny, hide the Easter eggs? What is that all about? That is us in our ignorance playing out the celebration of the return of the life cycle which occurs in the spring. Think about Easter. All right. December the 25th is always Thanksgiving. It's always Christmas, correct? December the 25th is always Christmas. But when is Easter? All right. Easter is a movable holiday. All right. Why? Because Easter is always the first Sunday after the first full moon after the spring equinox. It's all connected to celestial phenomena that takes place in the heavens. It has nothing to do with the story that has been imposed on your subconscious mind. All right. All right. Astrology and astronomy have always been integral elements incorporated within the Christian tradition, but they just never told you the significance of it. You just go along with the program. Just as Easter is always the first Sunday after the first full moon after the spring equinox, Christmas is also, is always, after the four days of the winter solstice. The word solstice means the sun is still. During that four day period of time, traditionally from December the 21st through December the 24th, the sun is still. What does that mean? The length of the day does not increase nor decrease significantly. Think about this. Think about how the sun affects your consciousness. In the fall, when you have the fall equinox, which generally falls around September the 21st and September the 22nd, equinox means you have equal night and equal day. 12 hours of daylight, 12 hours at nighttime. Then after the fall equinox, the night begins to increase by approximately one minute every day. So it gets darker earlier, correct? The nights get longer and longer and longer. The night is symbolic on one level of the unknown. The night on one level is symbolic of death. In the fall, when the sun passes over the equator, and if you live in the northern hemisphere, when the sun passes over the equator and begins to move toward the south, the absence of sunlight leads to the death of all vegetation. That's why we call the season fall. Leaves fall off the tree. Everything dies without the sun, without the light, without the energy that comes from the sun. And things will continue to die as the nights get longer and longer. And so when you come to December the 21st through December the 24th, that four day period of the solstice when the sun is still, the length of the day does not increase nor decrease significantly. The sun stops its southern motion and is still in the sky for those four days. And during the time that the sun is still, that spiritual energy, that electromagnetic energy that is responsible for the development and maintenance of life is in a special position where it is literally bombarding the earth with a certain level, a certain quality of energy that you all have the ability to tap into and harness if you knew what to do at that particular point in time. After that four day period, then on December the 25th, the days begin to increase by approximately one minute per day. So then on that day, it was a day of celebration. Why? Because the sun, the giver of life, was born. Very basic reality. All right. Astrology. 
Don't be fooled. Don't be fooled by this word astrology. It is a word that means star logos, astrology, star logos, star knowledge, knowledge of the stars, knowledge of the heavens. This information was known to have a profound influence on human thought and behavior thousands of years ago. That is the reason why, that is precisely the reason why temples that were constructed in Africa were oriented to specific positions of the sun. Temples were either oriented to the sun at the time of the summer solstice, the sun at the winter solstice, or the sun during the time of the equinoxes. Why? Because of this particular interplay between the exchange of energy between the sun and planet Earth. We are affected by these celestial bodies whether you understand it or not. All right. Today is the day of the full moon. Today is the day of the full moon. What's the significance of that? What effect does this heavenly body have on us? Well, if you stop and think about it, very basic reality, the moon, particularly during the time of the full moon, has an effect on the waters of the earth and creates a high tide. Why the earth is here, the moon is here, the presence of the full moon here attracts the water to it and creates a high tide. The earth is three quarters water. So if the moon has the power and the ability to attract all of the water on the earth to it, then what makes you think the moon doesn't have an effect on you all, who are also three quarters water? Huh? You ever give any meaning, any thought to the term lunatic? It was a term that was coined in England in the late 1800s by persons who I guess we would call today psychologists who in the mental institution that they were running in England noted that there were people who were crazy all the time, but there was a certain section, segment of the population that only went crazy during the time of the full moon, during that three-day window of the full moon, the day before, the day of, and the day after. And so they noted this behavior and recorded it over a prolonged period of time and they referred to those people whose behavior changed dramatically during the time of the full moon. They were referred to as lunatics, from the Latin word luna meaning moon. All right. Is it any coincidence All right. that the moon undergoes its metamorphosis every 28 days, undergoes this cycle every 28 days, and sisters also undergo their cycle every 28 days, and the moon was a symbol that was associated with sisters? All right. Huh? Uh -oh. Is it any coincidence that if you go to any hospital, any police station in the world, All right. and look at their records, in the hospital you will find that more elderly people would die of strokes and heart attacks during this three-day window of the full moon. More women will be prone to give birth during this three-day window of the full moon. Why? Because it's this electromagnetic attraction of the moon on fluids within the body of the planet Earth and within the body of human beings. All right. Police stations. Travel to, go to any police station and look at their record books and you will find that they will usually have an increase in certain violent acts during the time of the full moon. Go to an emergency room. Ask the nurses, ask the doctors who work in the emergency room, and they will tell you that they get some of the most bizarre cases imaginable. Somebody stabbed 150 times with a toothpick. You know, crazy stuff that people do during this time. And one of the things that we just have not really come to understand is how we are affected. All human beings are affected by these celestial bodies. In the Browder file, five years ago, I made reference to um, one particular instance in talking about astrology and, and so-called psychic phenomena, an instance where the United States government, the United States military 
used psychics in order to determine the activity of, of the enemy during World War II. And there were some folk who read that and said, well, this router is just talking about some metaphysical nonsense. Well, you all just read in the paper last week about the Army spending $20 million in a project. How much? $400 million. All right, the number goes up, the more they, they investigate the matter. But the United States government uses psychics to study certain spiritual and psychic phenomena, remote viewing. Why? Because the Soviets were doing it. Since the 1970s, this is an aspect of reality that folk don't talk about. Why? Because one, they can't explain it, and two, they can't control it. Can you imagine white folk trying to block off the moon, <laughs> trying to keep that energy from affecting you? trying to send the sun moving backwards throughout the sky so that you all won't be able to tap into the energy that, that's available to you during certain times of the year. They can't do that, but they can change your mind. They can cloud your mind with misinformation so that you become so, so deluded by lies, fantasies, that you don't use your natural talents to take advantage of the energy and the powers that you have within. So that's what this whole thing is all about. We are taught that Jesus was born on December the 25th. We're told that 30 years later he was baptized by John the Baptist. And Jesus becomes known as the fisher of men. And then later he is known as the sacrificial lamb after he is crucified. But what others know, particularly those who fed you that story, would they know that December 25th is the time of the solstice, or the birth of the sun. They know that 30 days later, the sun is in the sign of Aquarius, the water barrier. They know that 30 days after that, the sun is in the sign of Pisces, is in the fish of men, and 30 days after that, the sun passes over the equator and is resurrected in the sign of Aries, the lamb. All of this stuff, all of this stuff, talks about certain knowledge and information that is literally recorded in the stars and will play, has played itself out for thousands of years and will continue to play itself out for thousands of years. This knowledge and information is mathematically sound. It is precise. And if you understand the movements, if you understand the relationships of the planets and the stars, then you are able to predict with accuracy what is going to be happening at any point in time in the future. That is the reason why. That is the reason why 200 years ago, when the Europeans were in the process of creating Washington, D.C., they hired this African by the name of Benjamin Banneker. Banneker's role specifically was to use the most technically sophisticated instruments of the day, compass, the sextants, and other implements to study the stars, the sun and the moon. That's all he did. That's all he did. He recorded the movement of these heavenly bodies in his notebook in the evening, and then every morning the European, General Ellicott, whose job it was to oversee the survey of the city, came to the site, took Banneker's notes, and then used them to instruct the Europeans who were assisting him to establish the boundary line for the 10 mile by 10 mile by 10 mile by 10 mile square, which was to be Washington, D.C. Right, the whole city is laid out in accordance to certain signs and symbols in the heavens. Why? Because they understand that power exists within the heavens. And that if you can create, if you can duplicate a template, then you will create an environment where this energy can be harnessed. One of the things that we talked about on, on the Afrocentric tour was the symbolic significance of 16th Street. And any of you all have ever been been in Washington, D.C. 16th Street is, 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 is one of the primary streets in the city. If you look at the original plan of Washington, 16th Street was a seat, street that divided the city or divided this 10 mile by 10 mile by 10 mile square through the north and south. It is a street that is 6.4 miles and leads directly into the White House. What's the symbolic significance of that? That street, 16th Street, represents a corridor of spiritual energy. 
spiritual energy that is funneled down 16th Street, that erected into the house of the President of the United States. It is a corridor of spiritual energy. That is the reason why there are over 60 churches, Masonic organizations, religious institutions on this one street, more than any other street in the city of Washington, D.C. Folk know something that you all don't know. They've been studying your ancestors. And they have taught you to reject the knowledge and the wisdom of your ancestors. Why? So they can use that information to empower themselves. So what we have to do, sisters and brothers, is begin to move beyond studying. As my, as my brother Ahmed Ross says, we got to move beyond hotel. All right. Hmm? All right. yeah. We got to begin to put these words and these concepts into action. Right. It makes no sense at all for you all to be talking about how great we were if we suffering today. All, right. all it means is that you ain't using the knowledge. All right. So if you're not using the knowledge, don't even mess with it. Right. It's not a toy. It's not a game. One very important reality is the fact that you know, we, we, we have a habit of, 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 of uh, calling the ancestors, pouring libation and calling the ancestors to come into our midst. All right. And what we don't realize is that this is a force, this is a power that is very real, mm. that is not meant to be played with. And you call the ancestors into your presence All right. and shucking and jiving, uh -huh. don't have nothing for them to do, uh -huh. then guess what? They're gonna stop coming. Uh -huh. Hmm? They stop coming, and then you really begin to catch up. You thought you'd catch an elf on a white man? Let your ancestors turn their backs on you and see what happens. This is some serious stuff. We're living in some very serious times that demand your attention, that demand your heart and your soul. Think about this. During this time of year, we've seen the carols, we see the, 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 the celebrations, the pronouncement of brotherhood, peace on earth, goodwill toward man. And yet, if you study the history of this country, it never seems to fail that right around this time of year, they always get ready to send our soldiers overseas for some conflict. Getting ready to go to Bosnia now. A couple of years ago, they were going to Somalia. A couple of years before that, they were going someplace else. What does all of that mean? Right. They understand this time of year. This is a time of peace on earth, right. goodwill towards men. What does that mean? Peace on earth, goodwill towards men. Peace means to, be, to become silent or quiet. Earth is a symbol not just for the planet, but for your body. Good references God. Will is the power of the consciousness to determine a particular course of action. And man means mind. So this process of peace on earth, good will towards man, literally means to quiet the body and manifest God's consciousness in the mind. When do you celebrate peace on earth and goodwill toward man? Well, the creator says, the universe says, you do it during the time that the sun is still. That's when you're supposed to be still. That's when you're supposed to have peace on this body and focus your mind. Because whatever you focus your mind on, during this four-day period represents the process of, of conception, of conception. You are planting the seeds of specific thoughts. And whatever seeds you plant during this very important time of year will begin to manifest themselves in the spring during the equinox when life comes forth from the earth, from the body. 
So it's a special relationship that exists between the sun and planet Earth, between the sun and you. Those who understand that time will use it to throw you off of your spiritual center. So instead of focusing on peace on earth, you worrying about whether or not your brother's gonna step on a landmine in Bosnia. This is by design. So what are you gonna do? In spite of all of this nonsense, in spite of all of the minds that have been laid in your mind, huh? All right. All right. In spite of all of those minds, there are still things that you can do to overcome these obstacles. Because believe it or not, sisters and brothers, you all got the power, always have had it, always will have it. But if you don't believe it, if you don't exercise your energy, then folk who have less power than you will, able be, will be able to play you like a toy. All because you give up your will, because you don't understand who you are. During the time of the winter solstice is the primary time to cultivate peace on this body and goodwill within this mind. That's what you're supposed to be doing. The nights of the winter solstice, December the 21st, and this year the solstice falls on December the 22nd, but the nights of these, these four nights of the solstice are literally the silent nights and the holy nights. Mm. All right. When all should be calm all right. and bright inside. Mm. During this time, you should not be drinking, all right. All right. alcohol that is, all right. Which they call spirits. Hmm? Isn't that interesting? Why do they call it spirits? Because what this alcohol does is change your vibratory level of consciousness such that the spiritual energy that exists within the universe begins to manifest itself in you. Think about this. We as individuals are called persons. Person. P-E-R-S-O-N. Person means through sana, through sound. Our bodies are vessels through which sound, through which vibration, through which energy move. All kinds of energy moves through our body. Our bodies are sacred temples. So what energy do you allow to move through this body? to move through this temple. You can either invite energy that is going to allow you to do what it is that the Creator put you on earth to do, or you can drink certain things and eat certain things that will make you act like a fool. All right. All right, so think about it. During this time of year, you all should not be drinking. You should not be partying. All these Christmas parties this time of the year are specifically designed to throw you off your spiritual center to keep you unbalanced. You should not be stuffing your body with food. Is It is a time for prayer, meditation, and fasting. And yet, we have been encouraged to eat, drink, and be merry during this time of year. It's certain times to eat, drink, and be merry, but this ain't one of them. Think about it. Think about it. All right. During this time of year, particularly between Thanksgiving, misgiving. misgiving, all right, thank you, brother, I stand corrected. Between misgiving and New Year's, more alcohol is consumed than any point in time of the year. We eat more food, we stuff ourselves during this highly spiritual time of the year. A time when we should be preparing ourselves to receive spiritual energy, preparing ourselves to establish, to lay down the foundation for the next 60 days, the next 90 days. But instead, we do all kinds of nonsense. Why? Because somebody else is pulling the strings. During this time of year, we do, we behave in a certain manner, and then comes this January the 1st, the new year, and we make all of these New Year's resolutions. 
which we've broken by the 10th, the 12th of January. Why? Because we do not approach these resolutions from a position of seriousness. We make them when we're drunk. Or we make them what we have when we 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 recovering from a hangover. All right. Well, I ain't gonna drink that much no more. I'm gonna cut down. <laughs> so, in very plain and simple English, because that's the language that we're forced to communicate in, in very plain and simple in English, I'm asking you all to begin to take time out, particularly to take time out December the 22nd through December the 25th. And however you do it, because on one level, it doesn't matter if you follow the program all the way through, but however you do it, take some time to yourself to sit down and do some fasting, whether you go throughout the day and not eat, and eat in the evening, or, or, or if you want to just spend those four days and fast all the way through, you need to engage your body in some activity that is going to allow it to heal and allow it to reconnect with the Creator. If you do that during that four-day period of time, if you begin to select just three basic goals for yourself, three basic and realistic objectives for yourself, Think on them intently, and then let them go. You'll find that you'll begin to be moved in a direction and in a manner which will begin to allow those thoughts and ideas to become, to come into manifestation. I'll talk about that in a minute. But I want you to focus on, again, this time of year. When we sing songs, Christmas carols, particularly a song about the 12 days of Christmas, 12 days of Christmas, which includes December the 26th, December 25th, plus the 12 days that follow, represents a process of spiritual transformation, which becomes manifest on January the 6th, which is the day of the Epiphany, which is, which is the day that represents the spiritual transformation of Jesus the Christ. That's the reason why 13 is a spiritual number. January the 6th is the Epiphany. It commemorates the revealing of Jesus as the Christ to the three magi, symbolic of a process of focusing your mind during a prescribed period of time through which you will then begin to receive specific gifts. It talks about you. It talks about your body. If you follow these instructions, these guidelines that I talked about, then you will become the anointed one. You will become Christ-like. The word Christ is a title. It's not a name. It means the anointed one, one who is endowed with specific benefits that you can receive. During Christmas, during this time of year, we're often encouraged to spend money that we don't have, to buy gifts for people we don't like. <laughs> and we spend this money in shops. <clears throat> we buy these gifts from merchants who don't even celebrate Christmas. So they will freely put up the decorations. Why? Because they know it's another time of plenty means the foolish, those who don't have the slightest idea what time it really is, they're going to give up all of their money. And as a result, they're going to spend the rest of the year trying to get back what they gave up. You realize it's a lose-lose situation. You can never recover as long as you buy into the fallacy. There's another way. And we need to begin to start thinking about that other way. We need to begin to find ways to survive during this period of madness. And let me just share, let me just share a, a thought or, or an idea with you. And it's something that, that I, I began to become aware of 
uh, after I made my first trip to Egypt, 1980. And one of the keys that helped me come into this level of awareness was the fact that I am trained, formally trained as an artist. So I, I, I see things from, from a certain artistic perspective, from a symbolic perspective. And, and most artists or most people who are creative, whether they work with their hands or, or paint or dance or sing, most artists are, are usually inspired. That means to, to be inspired literally means a spirit or a state of consciousness comes into you and moves you to create. So from a very basic and fundamental level, artists or people who create are people who are able to tap into the source of nothing, what we call nothing, and find creation. So in other words, what I'm saying is that nothing is not nothing in the traditional sense of the word. Nothing is the source of everything. So if you can begin to steal your mind, focus your mind on a specific idea, objective, or goal, then you will begin to be drawn to that idea because everything that exists before anything exists within the physical world, it begins first as an idea in the mind of a person. The clothes that you have on your back, the car that you drive, the chairs that you're sitting in, the building that houses us, all of these things begin first as an idea, a thought in someone's mind. That's where everything comes from. This source that we call nothing which is a great reservoir for knowledge and information. The challenge is, how do you tap into it? And there's a very simple process. You have to be able to focus your thinking. And let me just share this story with you because it, it, it had a profound effect on me and, and still does. In that 10 years ago, when I was before I started writing, before I started you know, really lecturing on African history and culture, I was still doing freelance design and advertising. And one of the problems that I used to always encounter was meeting a deadline. If I had uh, a deadline of, of Thursday at 9 o'clock to meet with a client to show them uh, a layout for uh, a business package, a letterhead, uh, envelopes, business card, or, or, or cover design, or something like that, at that particular point in time in my life, I would sometimes allow thoughts of fear and anxiety to enter my mind. What if I can't complete this assignment? What if they don't like what I do? What am I going to do? How am I going to get, I need, I need that money to pay the rent. I need that money to take care of other responsibilities. What am I supposed to do? And, and as I was sitting up at the drawing board late one night thinking about that, I said to myself, you know, I wish I could do what my grandfather used to do. You know, I wish I could tap into that level of creative energy that my grandfather used to tap into. When I was a child, five or six years old, my grandfather would always build things with his hand, and I, and I would help him. You know, and I noticed that he never, ever drew things down on paper. He just would walk around and look at what he wanted to work on. He would determine how much wood he needed. He would go down to the hardware store, get the wood, get the nails. I would come back, I would hold the wood while he sawed it. I would hold this while he hammered it. And before you know it, he built a cabinet. He built a garage. He built a fence. And I said, well, obviously, my grandfather was tapped into a level of, of, of creativity, a level of consciousness that allowed him to make something out of nothing. And I said to myself, if I could think like my grandfather, then maybe I could tap into that same source. And I found myself sitting down at the drawing board late that night, it was about two o'clock in the morning, found myself just reflecting on that thought, thinking about my grandfather, watching him work on one of his building projects, seeing him look at nothing, and then over a period of, of weeks, watching him look at his finished product. I saw him doing that, and I saw myself as him doing that. 
I saw myself sitting down at the drawing table trying to come up with an idea for my client. Then I saw myself meeting with my client, showing them the ideas that I had drawn. I looked at the ideas. I said, that was pretty nice. That one's even better. But I sure like that one. And then I sat down at my drawing board and drew what I saw myself looking at three days in the future. And guess what? When I met with my client, it went down just like I saw it going down. What I'm saying, what I'm saying is something very basic and elementary, something that we are not taught as human beings that have been created in the image of the creator. We have at our disposal the ability to tap into the source of creation. Question is, what do we want to create? Because you have to understand that there's other, there are other forces that exist within this universe that you also have to deal with. One of the most significant forces is my art. Reciprocity, balance, harmony, order, truth, and justice. That should guide and direct all of your thoughts. Because if you have the ability to tap into the source of creation and manifest your creation, then my art must be your motivating force. You must do these things because it is the just thing to do. It is the correct thing to do because whatever you do is going to come back to you. There is a reciprocal relationship that exists between you and the universe, between you and the creator. Whatever you focus your attention on, you will bring into manifestation. They say that a mind that is hopeful, confident, and courageous, determined on its set purpose, and is attuned to that purpose, begins to attract to itself out of the elements, things and powers that are favorable to that purpose. So whatever you give your attention to will begin to come into manifestation. So the issue is, look in your life, look at your life. What is the quality of your life? Are you content with things? Is there room for change? Room for improvement? If we live in a world in which the creator has given us the tools to create heaven or hell, then what tools have you chosen to use? If you have the tools to be able to minimize health challenges, then why do you catch the flu every year? Hmm? If you have the ability, if you understand that money is energy, it's power, that's why they call it currency, it's energy, and it is to be used to bring certain things into manifestation, then why is there always an absence of it in your life? It means that you're not using the tools properly. We've been trained to think and to believe that we got to work for somebody else instead of understanding that we have the ability and the right to work for ourselves. Every person in this room has a gift, has a talent that sets you apart from every other person. Your responsibility in this life is to find that gift. And the only way you're going to find it is by cutting off the radio, well, all right. cutting off the television, all right. staying away from Mickey D's, well. and spending some time to get in tune with yourself. Because when you do that, then the nature of the universe is to respond to your thoughts to respond to your directives. So the extent to which you are going to move toward manifesting your creative abilities, the extent to which you will be able to do it. You've got the power to transform your life. All right. There's a way that you can survive during this period of madness. 
talked about the importance of being calm, being still during the time of the solstice, calm your body and your mind. Talk, talked about the, the, the time that should be taken to fast during the day and to pray or meditate at night. Why pray or meditate at night? During the evening, think about this. Let me, let me give you another example. Uh, the radio station that I was on this, uh, this afternoon, BLS? They're LIB, okay. LIB is an AM station, okay. And if you understand anything about the electronics of, of, of uh, radio broadcasting, most AM stations that are at a certain end of the radio frequency that broadcast at a certain level of power must go off at sundown. Why? Because when the sun sets, there's a different quality of electromagnetic energy that surrounds the earth. And if you continue to broadcast at that frequency, then your, your signal, your radio signal, is going to begin to cross over to other signals. So as a means of preventing that from happening, that station must shut down. Now, your mind is just like that radio transmitter. Your mind is just like that radio receiver. And during the evening, when the sun goes down, the frequency changes. And whatever you focus your frequency on, whatever dial you turn, you know, that, that, that spiritual meter in your brain to, is, is, is what you're going to begin to bring to yourself. It represents the signal that you're going to begin to tune into. You'll get voices. You'll get flashes of inspiration. There'll be little coincidences occurring in your life that will direct you to do certain things. And one of the things you have to realize is that there is no such thing as coincidence. There's no such thing as chance, coincidence, or accident in the universe ruled by law and divine order. Everything happens for a reason. Do you understand? Everything happens for a reason? So with this thing called a mind, you can begin to tune in certain levels of consciousness which will change your thinking and your behavior. Adolf Hitler had a habit of holding some of his most important speeches during the evening. Why? Because Hitler, who was a profound student of, of metaphysical and esoteric phenomena, knew that in the evening, lesser minds are more susceptible, are more easily influenced by powerful minds. It is a time when your mind is more susceptible to influence. So if it's your mind, then you might as well assume responsible responsibility for influencing it. It's yours. What you gonna do with it? Over the past 25 years, 28 years rather, Kwanzaa has evolved as an instrument for spiritual transformation. By that I mean it allows us to celebrate our African heritage during a season of high spiritual energy. The challenge for us, I mean, if, if you understand the seven principles that we are directed to focus our consciousness on are principles that can be and should be manifested every day of your life. So the timing of this particular celebration is of significant importance. Understand the principles and incorporate them in your life. But at the same time that we have grown to, to celebrate Kwanzaa, there are those outside of the community who wish to commercialize it. They want to commercialize it. Why? Because it will allow them to co-opt your energy 
and began to steer you in another direction. See, this whole thing that we call life at this particular point in time in history is a struggle for power, is a struggle for energy, it is a struggle for consciousness. I do believe that we are struggling for our souls. And either you are going to realize that and be an active participant in seeing to it that you stay focused on your goal. Focused on the goals of your children and family. Focused on the goals for your community. That's what the objective is. But those who understand the potential that exists within the mind, the body, and the spirit of African people are afraid of you all even becoming aware of this reality. And so roadblocks will be placed in your way at every turn in order to make it difficult for you to do what God created you here on earth to do. Very simple process. Life is not complicated. We complicate it, we make it complicated by turning our backs on certain principles that our ancestors gave us. The knowledge is already right before your very eyes. The question is, do you have the eyes to see it? They are speaking to you. Your ancestors are speaking to you all the time. The question is, can you hear them? If you understand who we are and where we come from, if you understand the nature of the, of the universe in which we live, then you can become an instrument through which the ancestors will speak. A couple of years ago, we had um, Teofil Obinga speaking for us in Washington, D.C. One of the most profound things that Obinga said that evening, in looking out into the audience at us, and talking about the spiritual nature of the people of ancient Kemet, the spiritual nature of African people, he said, looking at us, that we are the ancestors. They live in each one of you. The question is, do you realize who you have inside of you? What spirits you have around you? The truth is all around us. But in order to experience it, we must do what Brother Listervelt suggested that we do. In his poem, The Origin of Things, Brother Listervelt said that we must sharpen our eye and tune our ear so that we will know what we see and understand what we hear. We live in a world that is full of deception, full of lies, we live in a world in which the truth stands right before us. It speaks to us at night. But in order for us to uncover the truth, we must do, as James Weldon Johnson suggested, we must be true to ourselves, true to our God, and true to our native land. That's the solution. That's the answer. It doesn't require a whole lot of work or energy. It's very simple. Someone had mentioned earlier about, about us working with, with our children. I talked to a brother <clears throat> around the corner before the program. He was asking me about, about my daughter and, and he was telling me about some of the things that he was doing with his son. And he asked me, <clears throat> about the work that, that, that I was doing with my daughter, about some of the books that we've written. And I share with him, very honestly, that one of the reasons why I've cultivated this relationship with my daughter is because I love her, but also I love myself. And I understand 30 or 40 years from now, my daughter may be responsible for taking care of me. Right. And how she cares for me in the future is going to be determined by how I care for her today. Now she's going to be thinking all of her life, she's going to be thinking about the time that I spent with her and the things that we did together 
If more of those memories are negative than they are positive, then she will have little desire to want me to be around her in my old age. So understanding you know, these principles of my heart or karma, cause and effect, you create the events that will help shape your destiny. You have the power and the ability. One of the things that I've chosen to do is to exercise my power. Not just for myself, for my daughter, and for the grandchildren or great-grandchildren that she will produce. If I do my job well today, then I can be assured that she will raise her children in a manner that will allow them to become active participants in their liberation. Then they will raise their children to continue the struggle. If you understand the, 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 the reality that, that life is cyclical, if you understand this whole process of the ancestors, and the ancestors are born in us, then at some point in time, when we die, then our spirit will be reborn in a great-grandchild or a great-great-grandchild at some point in time in the near future. If you understand that, then what you do today will determine your quality of life in the future. You ain't got no time to waste. All right. You've got no time to play around. Right. What you have to begin to do right now, sisters and brothers, is to devote yourself to yourself, to your family, and your community. The whole idea, let me just share with you briefly about, about this book, because I'm, I'm real proud about our latest project between my daughter and I. Africa on My Mind, Reflections of My Second Trip, is a book that talks specifically about <clears throat> the trip that, that we made to West Africa two years ago, a trip to Ghana, Senegal, Gambia, and the Ivory Coast. First part of the book is, is, is told through the eyes of, of my daughter, in which she talks about <clears throat> what she saw, what we did each day, the visits to, to Gory Island, the visits to Elmina Castle, Elmina Dungeon, Cape Coast Dungeon. The last part of the book, the last chapter of the book, consists of a conversation between my daughter and I. And in this conversation, I attempt to fulfill my responsibility to her to help her understand why we went on that trip, to help her understand the importance of her history and her culture. The impetus for this conversation came about as a result of an incident that occurred as we were driving back from Kennedy Airport to our home in Maryland after we returned from the trip. We're driving on the highway, stopped, at a rest house in Maryland, and there were about five people, five of us in the van who had gone on the trip from the Washington area. We were driving back, and we were all very excited to be back home, right? Very glad to sleep in our own beds, right? We were all very excited, too, about the experiences that we had, the people that we met, the things that we bought. Stopped at the rest stop. I went in to use the restroom came back out and had to tell the folk in the van that I saw in the restroom a note that said, death to all niggas, support the Ku Klux Klan. And I had to remind them that even though we're glad to be back in America, there are people living in America today who are no different than the people who enslaved our ancestors 400 years ago. We can never forget that. We can never forget that. And so one of the things that we attempted to do in this book was to put a face on the nameless victims of the Ma'afa, to make it a, a personal experience so that we can begin, so the reader could begin to understand that it wasn't just some Africans who were kidnapped and, and, and murdered and lynched and, and raped and beaten to death 300 years ago, 400 years ago. It was men, fathers, mothers, and children, families that were torn apart because of the greed of 
others. We have an obligation and a responsibility to honor the memory of those people who died, to let them know that they have not died in vain, and to ensure that these actions will never be carried out again against African people. It's important <clears throat> that we understand, again, some very basic realities. Very basic realities. African people living in America, African people living in Brooklyn today, are the wealthiest and best educated African people on the planet. That's the truth. There are people on the continent who would give anything to get an opportunity to come here. Why? Because they know something that we seem to have forgotten. That this, as bad as America is, is one of the best places in the world to live at this particular point in time in history. That's a reality. We have opportunities here that folk on the, on the continent, folk in Asia will never have. You've got access to money. You've got access to education, to knowledge. You've got access to technology. So the question is, what you doing with it? There's no reason on earth for us to be in the condition that we're in. None whatsoever. So again, the challenge that I have to put to you all this evening is that you got to move beyond saying hotep. You got to move beyond just coming to the lectures and talking about how bad the lecture was. It means nothing if you all can't begin to take this knowledge and information and use it to change the quality of life. Amen. That's what your ancestors said, that you have the ability to do, the right to do. You have the power, the right to change the world overnight. And it begins first with you changing your mind. Nobody can take that away from you. They can try, but they can never take it away from you. At this point in time, the only thing that I can do, sisters and brothers, is to ask you to take the time during this high holiday season to get to know yourself and to realize that you have options in this life. You are not at the mercy of, 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 of the mayor, of the president, or anyone else. Well. To begin to realize that the creative spirit lives within and is always there to guide you, to direct you. The question is, it responds to the nature of your thoughts. What are you thinking? And if your thoughts aren't what they should be, then understand the significance of Sankofa. Well. Very simple, very simple symbol, very simple concept. You can always go back and change, correct your mistakes. You can always correct your mistake. That, that little egg in the mouth of the bird is symbolic of a potential life, potential growth, potential development. The head looks back to get the knowledge, but the feet face forward to say, this is where you've got to go. Use the knowledge of the past to correct your mistakes. Use the knowledge of the past to learn what it is that you have the potential to do, and then boldly go where African people need to go and to free ourselves and to make our children proud to be African people. That's what we've got to do, sisters and brothers. Let's do it. Let's be about the business of lifting ourselves up, inspiring ourselves, and change the nature of the world. All right. And if you do that, the next time I come back, I can talk about something different. All right? We can talk about what we're going to do now that we have focused that energy. The types of things that we need to be building in order to take over Africa right now. And I'll close on this note. But I want you all to be aware of the fact that right now, West Africa is in a position to be taken over either by you, African Americans or Europeans. Well, Africa is at a crossroads today. And if you all fall down on the job and don't do your work, 
Africa will be colonized, recolonized within the next 25 years. Brothers and sisters on the continent are asking you all to come and to invest in the land, invest in businesses, to begin to take advantage of opportunities over there that you will never be able to take advantage of over here. And you need to seriously begin to investigate the possibilities. Nana Sapong is coming into the States uh, this coming weekend. Africans from Ghana have been coming to the States. Rawlings was here last month meeting with African Americans throughout the United States, telling you all the door is open for you to come home. But you can't come home half-stepping. You can't come home with your hand out, asking for a hand out. You all got the knowledge. You got the technology. You've got the experience. They want you to work with them so that we all can be lifted up, so that we all can free ourselves. That's what time it is, sisters and brothers. And if we don't do it this time, then we don't need to play around anymore. Hmm? And we don't need to blame anybody for our shortcomings. Very simple reality, very basic truth. Either we're going to use what the ancestors gave us to free ourselves and transform, transform the world or we're going to have to be quiet. Well. And if the ancestors don't make us shut up, the Europeans will. Because we're at a very serious crossroads now. We've been talking about this. This, this, this African consciousness goes in cycles. If you're if you aware of certain patterns in history, it generally goes in a 30-year cycle. And what happens traditionally is that we come to a fork in the road. And either we apply those principles that we've just learned, or we backtrack. And we're at a point in time where we really don't have a whole lot of time. Either we're going to start being serious about ourselves, about our families, about our communities, about our nations, or the European is going to do what he was put here on earth to do, make our lives miserable. But I got confidence in you. I do. I really do. I got faith in my people. Because of everything that we've been through, we still have our minds intact. We still have our souls intact. And all we need, all we need is just a small number of sisters and brothers to make a dedication, to be honest and serious, and to begin to take care of business. And then what you will find is that those who have been standing on the sidelines, those who have been straddling the fence, will begin to see that as a result of you changing your consciousness, as a result of you changing your mind, your life has changed. And they're going to come to you and want to do whatever it is that you're doing. You're in a position right now to transform the world. You don't have to look outside. Everything is right here. Take the time to know yourself and free yourself, and I'll see you when we get on the other side. Hotel. Nothing, all right? We have things for you at low prices, things you can Africanize your home, you can Africanize your body with our scents and our oils, and you can Africanize your wardrobe. So today and every Wednesday, we're going to have African artifacts and products for your, for your buying pleasure. Now, getting back to our speaker, um, I think about Imhotep. I think about the Dogon Star. I think about the fact that we are, we are the originators of civilization. Okay, civilization began with us. We taught the world how to embalm the dead. We taught them how to fly airplanes. We knew about astral projection. So when Brother Maddox says we need to take care of our people, we need to take care of the people who are doing the work to correct history. Brother, uh, Brother Browder's bio is here for your reading pleasure. I'm not going to read it uh, to you. But I think it's important for you to know this is a brother who's self-employed. All right? This is something we need to let our children know. You can take care of business. You can correct our history and at the same time take care of your family. You do not have to depend on the Europeans to make you do the right thing in terms of correcting our history. This is a brother who's self-employed. He's an author. He's a publisher. And he knows truth. Let's stand up. 
warm our hands, and welcome our brother, our guest speaker for tonight's forum, Dr. Anthony T. Browder. Tap Africans, how are you? All right, you all sure know how to make a brother feel at home. Thank you very much for that warm reception. And as usual, it's always my pleasure to, to be here, to be in New York, to be in Harlem, uh, to walk where, where my ancestors have walked and have struggled for so long, to uh, fight the forces of oppression, to, to walk in the same land where Dr. Clark has walked, where Dr. Ben is still walking, where John Jackson has walked, where so many of our, where Shashi McIntyre has walked. It's a pleasure and it's an honor to be here before you this evening and continue the process of, of um, the re-education of African people because it is a process. It is something that's not going to happen overnight. My uh, brother was just sharing with me, uh, before I came down, I asked him how he was doing. He says he has his ups and downs. And I said, well, so does the sun. <laughs> sun goes down, but it comes back up, you know? Uh, and that's the nature of the universe in which we live. Everything is cyclical. Everything follows a pattern of uh, growth and development and then of decline. But then it follows a cycle of growth and development again. Everything in the universe is cyclical. And when you understand that, when you understand that, it, it kind of helps you put, put our life and our experience into perspective because you realize that we're down now, but if you understand Sankofa, we weren't always down. And if you know how to practice Sankofa, then you can participate in our rising again. Everything is cyclical. Everything follows specific patterns. And once you begin to become aware of the true nature of the universe, you don't get lost. You don't get blindsided by some of the craziness that goes on right in your own backyard. You can keep your eye 
on the light at the end of the tunnel and not have your vision obscured by the darkness that is the tunnel itself. So these are, these are lessons that, that I've been very fortunate to have learned um, standing at the feet of, of some of the masters, some of the master teachers. I must say that um, what I've done in, in my career as, as a writer, as a speaker, as a researcher, I've done primarily as a result of my being inspired by great writers and thinkers. Uh, uh, John Jackson, John Henry Clark, my elders, my ancestors, and Dr. Ben, my elder, they were responsible for introducing me some 20, 20 25 years ago to the greatness of Africa. It, they helped me realize after I had <laughs> completed my study at Howard University, helped me realize that I had been miseducated and that there's another education that I needed to be actively involved in and that I had to be responsible for getting that education myself. And so I always have to, to honor those who helped put me on the path and in honoring them, I understand my responsibility to help to show others the path because that is why we're here, to learn and to teach others and to continue to grow. As I was sitting uh, in the back of the room listening to uh, some of the comments that Brother, Brother Maddox was, was sharing with you, uh, it brought several thoughts to my mind that I'd just like to, to share with you as well. Um, <laughs> the example that he gave about uh, the, uh, the Uncle Tom Gene was a, <laughs> uh, <laughs> a brilliant example. But, you know, I was talking with um, this gentleman who works out in Silicon Valley, who's involved in a lot of the genetic re research that's going on, and I was asking him about the um, statements that were made about three or four weeks ago concerning uh, the mapping of the human genome. I mean, that's, that's the latest project that's going on as, as Frankenstein, Dr. Frankenstein is still at work uh, trying to make, make new monsters for the new millennium. And they were talking about the fact that they celebrated the fact that they just about completed the mapping of the human genome. And in uh, an article, as a matter of fact, I was in Egypt. I just returned from Egypt two weeks ago. And I read an article uh, in the uh, uh, Cairo newspaper that talked about the Human Genome Project, but they mentioned something about the Human Genome Project that I had not read in any publications here in the United States. They made mention of the fact that, that the organizations, the companies that are working, that are doing the research on the Human Genome Project are working with the genetic material of a selected group of people. And they didn't say in the article who those selected people were. But I asked this, this, uh, this brother who's working out in Silicon Valley about that, and I said, well, you know, who would they, you know, do you have any idea who, whose genetic material they're working on for the Human Genome Project? He said, well, you know, if you were a geneticist mapping the genes in the human body, you would want the oldest human genes on Earth. The genes are the oldest human beings on Earth. So in other words, they're studying us in order to learn about them and to also find new ways to continue to control us. So the war is on, sisters and brothers. It's just going to begin to escalate to a new level. And we have to begin to prepare ourselves to fight this war on a new level. Uh, and that's basically what I want to talk about this evening. Uh, the, the, my, my topic for this evening is the rebirth of Nile Valley civilization. And I see it as an extension to my earlier work, Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization, uh, which is, is, is one of my best-selling books. It's a book that, that I'm very proud to say has been used in classrooms uh, throughout the United States, Japan, England, Africa, France, I get letters from people all over the world who are using the book in, in um, various classrooms. And so I'm very pleased to have been, to be instrumental in, in reintroducing people to African history and culture. I've also been blessed to have uh, traveled uh, to Egypt some 25 times over the last 20 years. As I said, I just returned from Egypt two weeks ago, uh, completing my annual study tour to Egypt. I've been doing the study tours for 
for uh, the last 12 years. And the more I travel to Egypt, the more that I study ancient Kemet, the more I began to develop a deeper understanding of not only the Nile Valley contributions to civilization, but also something else that I see in the eyes of my sisters and brothers and something else that I see in the horizon, and that is rebirth of Nile Valley civilization. Because once you begin to put history in, in, in context with human development, then one of the things that becomes so fundamental to your understanding is the fact that life is cyclical. As I was talking about earlier, life is cyclical. And in understanding the cyclical nature of life, you realize that death is temporary. All death does is pave the way for the continuation of another life. So when you look at Kemet, when you look at the civilization of ancient Egypt, don't listen to the commentary about how the Egyptians had a preoccupation with death. Don't listen to the commentary about, you know, they spent uh, years building their tombs and building their pyramids in order to, to honor the ego of a pharaoh. Don't listen to that. Understand that these people had a preoccupation with life. They knew better than we do right now that life is eternal, that the body is temporary, and the spirit is eternal, and that the spirit, when it leaves this physical body, returns to another physical body. And that's the lesson that you see that is played out in the history, in the myths, and in the culture of not only ancient Kemet, but the rest of the African world. That's information that has been lost or has been distorted by other people in their attempt to uh, gain some understanding or some insight into the wisdom of ancient Africa. But part of what I'm gonna share with you this evening, and I, and I want you all to stay with me on this because it, it may be a little bit of a stretch, but I want you all to stay with me on this. Part of what I'm gonna be talking about deals with the process of reincarnation, all right? Reincarnation is nothing more than return to the flesh or the spirit returning into the flesh. There was an article that appeared in Philadelphia last week, and there was an article that appeared in the Philadelphia Inquirer that I want to bring to your attention. And it referenced um, a rabbi, uh, Yosef, who, is the, um, who has the largest ultra-Orthodox political party in Israel. And he created an international furor uh, last week when he said, and this is a quote, a direct quote, that the six million Jews who died in the Nazi Holocaust perished because they were reincarnations of sinners. Okay? He said that these people were reincarnations of the souls of sinners, people who transgressed and did all sorts of things that should not have been done. And they were reincarnated in order to atone. Now, folk got hot because they said that, that, um, that he was letting Hitler off the hook. But the issue that wasn't really focused on in the article is a, is a brief statement by um, another chief rabbi in Israel who said that Judaism has a concept of reincarnation and of the righteous dying to atone for sins in a previous life. Now let me repeat that again. Jewish Judaism has a concept of reincarnation that most people don't know about. It is an element that is incorporated into Christianity that Christians never talk about. And it's also an element that is incorporated into Islam that most folk don't know about. These concepts and these ideas originated in Kemet. And what I want to share with you during the course of my presentation and with some of the slides that, I, that I'm going to share with you as well is how this concept has played itself out thousands of years and is literally encoded in the symbols, the monuments, and the buildings that can be found all over the world. Automatics made reference to the, uh, the African Center Tours of Washington, D.C. that I've been doing for a number of years and that uh, UAM has uh, participated in on several occasions. As a matter of fact, I was uh, talking with a couple of sisters in the back of the room, and is it all right if I say it? 
All right, we, uh, they're making plans to organize another tour uh, to Washington on the 12th of November. So we're going to be doing another African-centered tour uh, for the group that comes down. And it's something not to be missed from the standpoint of, of what I've done with this tour is to study the extent to which ancient comedic architecture, symbolism, philosophy, and spiritual traditions have been incorporated into the very fabric, into the very heart and soul of the United States of America. And not only can these symbols be found in the United States, but if you know what to look for, if you understand the history, if you understand the symbolism and know how to interpret the symbolism, you can find the symbolism anywhere in the world. That, to me, is one example of, of the resurrection or the rebirth of African spirit, African symbols, African concepts, and African ideas. These symbols don't exist just in a vacuum, in a void. These symbols, this architecture, and this knowledge was created, I'm convinced, it was created in order to remind us here in the present of who we were and what we've done and to begin to inspire us so that we can become actively involved in the process of rebuilding for eternity. Because we are, whether we truly understand it, we are our ancestors. They live in us. Something that geneticists don't talk about is something called genetic memory. And it is the essence of this whole process of, of cloning. Every gene in your body has the memory of every gene that ever produced it throughout its entire bloodline. So you in this room have within you the genomes, the genetic memory of every person who has been a part of your bloodline. The key is, the challenge is, to learn how to access that memory and then to use that knowledge in order to build for eternity. See, that's the information that was lost through the Middle Passage. That's the information that was lost or destroyed with the introduction of religious systems, which I see as nothing more than virtual spirituality. All right? And so we, we have to be actively involved in the process of understanding who we were before we can begin to know who we are and do what we've always had the capacity to do. And so for the sake of time, I want to, I want to begin to get into this presentation and just basically set it up with, with this premise. Just as we've been actively involved in the process, of rescuing and reconstructing our memories of Africa and then learning how to apply this information into our daily lives on a consistent basis so that we can see permanent change or achieve uh, permanent success in what we do. There are those forces that exist within this society and within this world who don't want that to happen. There are people who profit from your ignorance. They profit from your hatred of Africa. They profit from your blind adoration of European and Arabic gods as a result of us turning our backs on the prototypes for those guys in religious systems. They profit off of our ignorance. And so the only way that they can maintain their power is by keeping us in darkness. So there is going to be, don't fool yourself for one minute, there's going to be an ongoing struggle between the forces of light and the forces of darkness. And you need to understand that so that you can begin to make a conscious choice as to which team you're gonna be on to choose to be ignorant and not be involved in the process is to make a choice. Is to make a choice 
to side with those who want to keep you in darkness. And this story of the struggle for, for, for against the forces of light and the forces of darkness was written about in ancient Kemet and was exemplified in the story of the battle between Set and Heru. And if you understand the essence of the story of Asar, Aset, and Heru, it is a story about reincarnation. It is a story about the continuation of the life cycle. I want to reference before I get into um, the, the slides, which are a major part of, of my presentation, I want to uh, reference a book that um, the Dr. A.C. Hilliard wrote about two years ago. I think it's his, his latest publication. The book is entitled uh, Saba, The Rebirth of the African Mind. And Saba, SBA, is an ancient comedic concept that represents teaching, wisdom, and study. Saba is the process by which we can participate in another comedic concept called the Reme Mesu. Reme Mesu means the repetition of the birth or the reawakening, the reawakening of the mind with a knowledge of your previous existences. Reawakening of the mind to the knowledge of that genetic memory which is a part of your consciousness, a part of your being. So this whole story about the rebirth of Nile Valley civilization is about the rebirth of the African mind. Because when you reconstitute your mind, when you regain your African mind, then you begin to see the world differently. You begin to relate to yourself and others differently. And this Negro consciousness, which has been planted into the back of our minds, can no longer coexist with an African consciousness, with an enlightened African consciousness. The Negro mentality exists only in darkness. It lives off of fear and ignorance. It lives off of fear and ignorance. And it embraces problems as its lot. It's oblivious to the fact that we live in a universe of plenty where a properly attuned mind, a properly focused mind knows how to extract out of the universe things and powers that will advance its development. We live in a universe of bounty. Everything you need, everything you want already exists. It's simply a matter of you understanding that and then doing the things necessary to bring it into manifestation. We are, well, I'll talk about that at the end of the presentation, but I want to make you aware of the fact that there are certain keys to decoding the mysteries of ancient Kemet. The first is to know your history. To know your history, the history of Kemet, before it became a multicultural civilization, before it became Europeanized. The second thing is, the second point is to understand mythology, to understand the power of the myth of ancient Kemet and how that myth continues to live and how it fuels society today. The third point is, is to correctly interpret symbolism and to understand the silent power that exists within objects that you see every day but are disconnected from that power. And the fourth is to understand Kemet's relationship to the rest, to the Western world, to understand that relationship so that you can begin to become an active participant in the spiritual rebirth. That is, there was your reason for being born. One of the concepts that's talked about quite frequently in African culture and civilization is that you as a spirit made a conscious choice to be born in this lifetime. You as a spirit chose your parents because you chose to come back to this life at this particular point in time to experience certain things that would allow you to advance your development. So when you understand that you chose to be here because of, their, because of certain lessons that you must learn, when you are actively involved in the process of learning those lessons, of studying, developing wisdom, and then applying that wisdom in your life, then you begin to fulfill your spiritual purpose in life. 
And the person who understands their spiritual pur purpose in life experiences, experiences no pain, no discomfort, no poverty, because they know that they live in a universe of bounty, of plenty, and they know how to manifest everything that they need in order to improve the quality of their life. They're not greedy. They know what they need. And they use what they need, not just for themselves, but for the benefit of those who will come behind them. So if we can have the, um, the lights, I'd like to um, uh, begin the, uh, the presentation, the slide presentation. And of course, for those of you who, who don't know who the, uh, these brothers are in this picture, uh, they are John Henry Clark, John Jackson in the center, and Dr. Yosef Ben uh, Oh, okay, you can't see because I'm here? All right, well, uh, let me move the podium to the side if that doesn't pose a problem. Is that better? Yeah. All right. <laughs> okay, next slide, please. I must add that it was John Jackson's book, The Introduction to African Civilization, that I read 20 years ago that, that really made me develop a, a strong appreciation for African culture and civilization. And it was the first trip that I made to Egypt 20 years ago with Dr. Ben that literally opened my eyes and made me realize that our perception of reality had been distorted by Europeans and that there was another truth that exists within the world that we have a responsibility to expose ourselves to, um, to learn from, and to teach others. And so this image here, this, this building here, is important because this is a photograph of the Step Pyramid of Saqqara. It is the oldest building ever created by human beings, designed by Imhotep. This building was created over 5,000 years ago and is still standing in Africa today. A 197 foot high skyscraper, a 19 story building that was constructed by Africans at a time when Europeans were still living in caves and wearing animal skins. Africans, Africans developed the first buildings on Earth. And it's something that we should never forget. Next slide is a uh, photograph of a statue of the person who was responsible for uh, designing that building. His name is Imhotep. And Hotep is a prime example of, of, of Saber, of a teacher, of, of someone who studied, and someone who applied the wisdom that came from their study. And Hotep is a prototype or a model for, <clears throat> for an inspired African mind, because he obviously tapped into a level of consciousness that had not shown his face in Kemet for hundreds of years and maybe even thousands of years. Imhotep is regarded in history as the world's first Renaissance man. Not only was he an architect, he was a prime minister to the King Zoser, he was a philosopher, he was a uh, poet, the person responsible for giving us the statement, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you shall die. He's recorded in history as the world's first physician. There are medical texts associated with Imhotep that treat uh, various ailments of the human body. That, that reference and understanding of the, um, of the heart and the flow of blood through the heart, the circulatory system, uh, the medical texts that identify aspects of the brain, the various portions of the brain, uh, a phenomenal personality who is recorded in history as the world's first multi-genius. Imhotep, in building or designing the pyramid, set a standard that would transform the consciousness of the world. Next slide. Less than 300 years after Imhotep built 
the step pyramid, the first man-made structure of stone. We're not talking about mud bricks here. We're talking about structures made out of stone. Less than 300 years after he built the step pyramid of Saqqara, this pyramid was built, the Great Pyramid of Khufu, which is structured from the time of its, cons its construction around 2500 BC up until 1887. This building was the tallest man-made structure on Earth. It's a building that stands 450 feet high, as tall as a 45-story uh, building. It is a structure that covers an area of 13 acres, two and a half city blocks wide by two and a half city blocks wide by two and a half city blocks wide by two and a half city blocks wide. It is a structure that is comprised of enough stone to make 30 Empire State buildings. It was a structure designed by Af an African architect, constructed by African engineers, a structure which is still regarded today as one of the greatest achievements that ever sprang from the minds of human beings. It was inspired by the work of Imhotep. Next slide. It's at the Giza Plateau where you can find uh, a complex of pyramids. Ten pyramids exist at the Giza Plateau. Giza is probably the most significant archaeological site on the planet. There have been more books written about these structures than any other subject on planet Earth. And what's so phenomenally interesting is the fact that mankind today in all of his greatness cannot replicate the building of a great pyramid. They don't have the technology. There are, there are five stones in the interior of the great pyramid that weigh 70 tons each. Each stone weighs the equivalent of um, the engine, a railroad engine, the Amtrak. I came down on Amtrak. So each, train, each of these five stones in the inner recesses of the Great Pyramid weigh as much as an Amtrak locomotive. Mankind today does not have the technology to move a 70-ton piece of stone. And there are five in the Great Pyramid. There, there are other blocks of stone in the temple of Hermaket of the so-called Sphinx, which weigh almost 100 tons. So what we're dealing with here, sisters and brothers, is evidence of human beings, African men and women, who had a level of knowledge which humanity has not seen in over 3,000 years. Next slide, please. At last count, <coughs> At last count, there were 108 pyramids in Egypt. They just found a new pyramid earlier this year, right? Nowhere on earth can you find these many structures. Only in Africa can you find these structures. What's interesting is that there's been a, a, a host of um, new research on Egypt and on the Giza Plateau. And some of the latest research uh, that's been, been presented by uh, two Europeans, Robert Baval and Graham Hancock have shown that the alignment of the three pyramids at Giza replicate on Earth the alignment of the three main stars in the belt of the constellation of Orion. This is not an accident, but this was an effort on the part of the designers of this structure to recreate the heavens on Earth. As a matter of fact, another important component of this um, uh, celestial relationship is right near the constellation of Orion, you have the Milky Way, or a structure that the Egyptians referred to as the river in the sky. And this relationship between the three stars in the belt of Orion here and the Milky Way is identical to the relationship between the three main pyramids at Giza and the river on Earth called the Nile. This is not an accident. This is part of a very calculated and very well-executed design to replicate the heavens here on Earth. Next slide. There is in Nubia, which is south of Egypt, there is in Nubia more pyramids than exist in Egypt. At last count, there were over 200 pyramids in Nubia. 
And those who understand the significance of the Nile Valley, the culture, which was ancient Kemet or ancient Egypt, came out of the south, came out of Nubia. So it is in Nubia where you can find the beginnings of pyramid building. It's in Nubia where you can find the beginning of uh, the, the writing of the so-called hieroglyphics or medu -Netra. It is in Nubia where you can find the beginning of the trinity, the sacred trinity of Asar, Aset, and Heru. These are indigenous African creations. And the further south you go into Africa, the more you can find that represents the, the, the flowering or the staging of what later became uh, the crowning glory of Africa, which is ancient Kemet, ancient, ancient Egypt. Next slide. It is in Nubia, at Abu Simbel, where you can find one of the grandest monuments ever created by human beings, ever conceived by human beings. This is a monument built in honor of Ramesses II. He built it in the southernmost part of Egypt, right near the border of Nubia. This is a structure uh, which was literally carved out of a mountain with four 60-foot high statues of Ramesses II. In between the two groups of statues, two groups of seated statues, there's a doorway. And 180 feet in the interior of this mountain, hollowed out of the, of the mountain itself, is the next slide which shows you a scene of Ramesses II seated among the Netru of ancient Kemet. This sacred altar was designed in such a way that only two days out of the year, on the date of Ramesses' birth and on the date of his coronation, the sun shines through the interior of the mountain 140 feet into the mountain onto the face of Ramesses II on two days out of the year. Now can you imagine, first of all, can you imagine Africans sitting down at, at, at a table planning this monument, all right, and presenting this plan to Ramesses, telling him how they're going to immortalize this man and not only place him among the Neturu, but orient this structure in such a way that the sun is going to shine on your face, on your birthday, and the day of your coronation. We're talking about, we're, we're talking about not only a profound understanding of architecture and engineering, but astronomy as well which means that they had to map the heavens and they had to be able to project the angle of the trajectory of the sun 140 feet into the interior of this mountain. And then they left their handiwork for the world to see. Yes. All right? I want you to understand what existed in ancient times because its essence continues to exist today. Its essence lives in you right now, whether you are conscious of its essence or not. Next slide. Now, what I also want you to be conscious of is just as the essence of your ancestors exists within you, the essence of the forces of creation, there's also within this world the essence of the forces of destruction, the essence of the forces of evil. And they have been working overtime to keep you separated from your true self, all right? This is a photograph of the father of Ramesses II, his name is Seti I. And one of the things that Seti did at the temple of Abydos, the temple that is, just for the record, it is the first holy site in the history of humanity. Abydos was the site of the first Mecca in the history of humankind. And in this temple, which Ramesses built, there is a scene where he explains to his, to his son his history and his culture. There's a listing on the wall of all of the kings who preceded him. And he, explain, he, he goes on to explain to him the legacy which he has inherited. So he comes to the throne with a total understanding of where he came from and what his responsibilities were as a king. 
Ramesses went on to become one of the uh, oldest rulers and one of the most prolific builders in ancient Kemet. That is the reason why he's referred to as Ramesses the Great, because no one built as much as he did. Now, if Ramesses was great in the history of ancient Kemet, there are those who are enemies of ancient Kemet who want to do whatever they can to defame Ramesses, to destroy his legacy. And we need to be conscious of these efforts so that we know how to identify them when they appear and how to address those who are the um, perpetrators of this historical fraud. Next slide. Gives you one example. <clears throat> how many of you all saw The Prince of Egypt? The first, the first feature film produced by Steven Spielberg's new company was an animated cartoon called The Prince of Egypt, which perpetuated the lie of the Jews being enslaved in Egypt. It perpetuated the lie of the Jews building the pyramid, and it perpetuated the lie of Ramesses being the pharaoh or the king who was associated with the Exodus. Even in Jewish texts, Jewish scholars are now coming out and saying that the Exodus never occurred. They're saying that it was a metaphorical event and that it never occurred. But yet this lie, this myth is being perpetuated continually in the media. We have to begin to understand our history so that we can challenge, intelligently challenge those who distort the historical record. So we have to be conscious of the historical record so we can speak intelligently about these issues. Next slide. Another example. How many of you all saw the film The Mummy? All right. In this film, which was made last year, a film that was a remake of Boris Karloff's 1933 classic horror film. In this movie, they not only defame Imhotep, because in the story, the mummy is Imhotep. Okay? The mummy is Imhotep. But in this version of the story, they added an element that was not in the original version. In this story, in this movie, they show Imhotep as the head priest who is in love with the wife of the pharaoh. And the wife of the pharaoh, or the pharaoh that, um, that Imhotep was serving, was Seti I. Now, Seti I was the father of Ramesses. And Ramesses lived almost 1,200 years after Imhotep. So I want you to understand how they are taking liberties with your history and your culture in order to defame your ancestors. And in this film, in this film, they make him Hotep, the world's first multi-genius, out to be the bad guy. This film made so much money that they're currently working on Mummy 2. Right? So one of the things that I want to challenge you all to do is to Read Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization. Read Black Man of the Nile and his family. So when the second abomination called Mummy 2 comes out, you all can talk to your friends and tell them why they shouldn't see that movie. Or if they go to see the movie, you all can sit down and critique the movie and tell it why and tell them why they wasted their money. We need to begin to understand how to wage this battle on another level. All right, next slide. The essence that the enemies of Kemet, that the en enemies of Africa want to undo lies in the story of this man. Lies in the story of the family of this man. This is Asar, who is recorded in the history of humanity as a model for manhood, the model for divine rulership, the model for judgment, the model for law, 
the model for civilization. Imhotep is recorded in the ancient myths of Kemet. And when I reference a myth, I'm not just talking about something that is a fallacy. Most myths are rooted in truth, but they are presented as myths because myths become larger than lives. Myths serve as a way of, of, of reaching out to people throughout the eons, throughout the ages, and transferring lessons from one generation to the other. So in the story of ancient Kemet, Asar was the first king of ancient Kemet. Asar married as his wife, next slide. Asar married an African who we know as a set, as his wife, Naset is the model for womanhood. Aset is the model of the divine vessel through which the reincarnated spirit or the ancestors are reborn. Aset is the model of a woman who understood the sacred nature of her body. All right? And this story of Asar, Aset, and Heru was a story that was taught to the children. It was a primer for life. It was a primer that stayed with them for the rest of their lives. And as these children matured, then they would begin to be introduced to other facets of this story so that they can begin to understand how it related to their lives on a larger level, uh, on a larger scale. Next slide, please. So if you were a child living in ancient Africa, you would have been taught you wouldn't have been taught about Dick and Jane. You wouldn't have been taught about Barney. You would have been taught about Asar and Aset. And you would have been told of how Asar was responsible for introducing agriculture to humanity, introducing writing, science, law. You would have been taught how Asar was looked upon with envy by his brother. And the next slide show you how Asar's brother, Set. next slide, plotted to murder his brother. And not only did he kill his brother, but he cut his brother's body into 14 pieces and scattered them throughout the land. If you were introduced to this story as a child, you would have been taught of how a set, in the next slide, a set went out in searching for the missing pieces of her husband's body and how she found 13 of the 14 pieces of her husband's body. And she attempted as best she could to reconstitute her husband, to reassemble his body. She washed his wounds, and then she wrapped his entire body in the bandage in order to prepare him for burial. It took her 70 days to find the missing pieces of her husband's body. 70 days to prepare her husband's body for burial. And this 70-day period became the standard length of time for the process of mummification for every person who died in ancient chemists. So they took their myths literally because they understood the power that was inherent in the myths. It's important to realize <coughs> that before Aset buried her husband, she grieved his loss, one, because she loved him dearly, two, because she was still a virgin. They had never consummated their marriage vows. And three, because she didn't have the honor of burying him a child, an heir to the throne. So as the spirit of Asar saw his, his wife and saw her in her grief, the spirit of Asar came and impregnated his wife. And then nine months later, the virgin Asar, the virgin Aset, gave birth to her son, Heru, who was born to avenge the murder of his father. Next slide. Heru then becomes the model of the 15 Christs who lived in history. Heru was born on December the 25th. Heru was born of a virgin. Heru was born to complete his father's work and to restore his father's kingdom on earth. Heru was, on a deeper level, Heru was the reincarnation of his father, who was reborn 
in order to continue his work. The story of Heru and his uncle Set set the standard for the historical battle between the forces of good and evil. Next slide shows you a photograph from uh, the Temple of Edfu. It's in the Temple of Edfu, which is dedicated to Heru. You see carved on the interior of the retaining wall 14 panels which depict the battle between Set and Heru. And in this battle, Heru takes the form of a hawk and he spears Set, who is depicted in the shape of a, hip of a hippopotamus. And he spears him in each part of his body that is related to a part of a SARS body that was dismembered. Next slide shows you a detail of, of Set. Shows him being speared in the nose, shows his feet being bound in chains. Then after Set, after Set was defeated, then Heru became the legitimate heir to the throne of ancient Kemet. And after, the, after his victory, Heru, next slide, took the form of a falcon, flew into heaven, and met with his father told his father of his victory over Set. And upon that meeting, his father, Asar, was resurrected from the dead, was restored, his spirit was restored, and he became the Lord of the afterworld, or the Lord of the underworld, also referred to as the Lord of Judgment. And then Heru came back down to earth to continue ruling in his father's name. So father and son ruled in tandem. The son, Heru, ruled over the physical world. His father, Asar, ruled over the spiritual world, the transphysical or the metaphysical world. They ruled in tandem. Next slide. This is an image of the resurrected Asar, who is recorded in history as the world's first resurrected savior, as the world's first resurrected personality. I might add that this story was written in Nubia over 6,000 years before the birth of Jesus the Christ. All right, so let's, let's put it in context so we understand from whence these myths have evolved. And let's understand these myths. Next slide shows you Another symbol that was built in Kemet that represented the resurrection of Asar, right? This is a, temp, a, a symbol called a Tekken. And it was, it was erected in front of the temples in Kemet to represent the resurrection If y'all were not here that evening, you really need to get the tape for ourselves, but certainly for our families of Dr. Sharshi's presentation during uh, Women's History Month. Next week, Dr. Charles Finch will be here. Uh, we follow Dr. Finch with Sonia Sanchez on the 22nd of April, and then we close the month of April with Dr. Patricia Newton, and she is a medical doctor with a specialty in psychiatry. And she will discuss post-traumatic slavery disorder. Y'all got that? <laughs> post-traumatic slavery disorder. I guess you're talking about us. So we're looking forward to her presentation on the 29th uh, of this month. We would like to raise our offering, to begin to raise our offering for this evening. That there is that, um, just talking about Crown Heights and the death and murder of Gavin Cato, which no one has paid for financially or in any other way as yet. Uh, but one of the things that she said, which is really quite clear to me uh, and amongst my peers, is that there's a whole generation of brothers and sisters out there 
that are just not having this anymore. And when the right fire is lit, you talk about setting it off, they may not come to the forums, they may not be here, be there, but they know enough to know that a lot of our elders have not done the right thing. All right. Not everyone, but a lot, you know, this compromise and this apology and this, you know, enough is enough already. I mean, really, you know, enough is enough already. Justice, that's all. And so when the right fire is lit, it will be all out war out here. And so what we do here on Wednesday night is to get us prepared for what really is ahead. I mean, it's coming in our lifetime, in this day and time. We're not going to escape it. Folks think, oh, well, I'll be going. No, uh, -uh. it's coming. And there's a whole illusion of brothers and sisters out there that are really, that when the right thing happens, it's just going to be over. And so... I say that because our brother this evening has prepared a very special presentation on race and how to deal with it and how to define it and how we can channel some of those energies. And so we are grateful for his presence here this evening. He is the founder and director of the Institute for Karmic Guidance, which disseminates ancient Egyptian history and metaphysics. He's been self-employed for 18 years. Let's give him a hand for that. And has operated and managed East Coast Graphics, a design studio. He's written a number of books of which he has on sale this evening, uh, including Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization, The Browder Files, He's co-written with his daughter, Africa On My Mind, Reflections of My Second Trip. Let us rise to our feet and welcome to the stage our keynote speaker here this evening, Brother Anthony Browder. Brother Anthony Browder. Two lovely uh, mothers here up front, Sister uh, Sharshi and Sister Camille. Uh, your support, your presence here is always uh, important to me. It lifts me up and it lets me know that I have people in my corner who are always urging me to do the best that I can do. And I appreciate that. We always, we always need folk around us to tell us how much they love us and appreciate us and motivate us to continue doing the work that we have to do. Because as the sister said, we are at war. We need to understand that we are at war and begin to prepare ourselves for battle, and particularly to prepare ourselves to win the battle. Not just to win the battle, but to win the big battle, which is the war itself. You may lose a skirmish here or there, and that's all right. You don't have to win every battle as long as you are prepared to fight the long fight, as long as you strategize to see to it that you're victorious in the end. And so I want to contribute, <clears throat> make my contribution this evening to help arm you for the battle, arm you for the struggle so that we can, at some point in time in the near future, claim victory. The topic of my discussion this evening is Racism 101. <laughs> what it is, how to identify it, and how to prepare yourself to deal with it. It's a basic introduction to the subject matter, because I'm sure you all know what racism is. You've been dealing with it all your life. But I want to introduce to you some other ways to look at it so you can begin to see the subtler forms of racism 
And I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about white folk and what they've done. I want us to spend the majority of our time this evening and all of our time for the rest of our lives preparing ourselves to deal with racism. Because you never can solve a problem by talking about it. It takes action to change things. One of the things that we have to begin to fully realize and understand and incorporate into our process of dealing is that racism is a disease. It's a form of mental illness. And everyone who engages in this activity, we have to realize no matter how many PhDs they have, no matter how much money they have in the bank, they are sick people. We have to begin to realize how this illness has manifested itself throughout time and space. And then we have to learn how to inoculate ourselves against this disease. It's because all too often we've been dealing with this madness for so long that we think it's commonplace, we think it's all right. And that if we can become like those who have exerted pressure against us for so long, then things will be all right. But <laughs> I'm sure many of you all who are here tonight know that things will never be all right. As long as you imitate your oppressor, you have to be who you are, you have to learn to love and respect who you are. So my motivation for this workshop this evening, for this presentation this evening, comes out of you know, several conversations that I've had with, with my daughter over the years. As some of you know, uh, single parent, I've been raising my daughter since she was four. She's 15 now, I'm going on 16. And that I have, thank you. I have taken her to Africa with me on two occasions. And as a result of her trips to Africa, we have written books about her experiences. And so my daughter at the age of, of eight was the youngest African-American author at the age of eight. Wrote and published her first book. And so, you know, as a parent, it's important. We all, as parents, we all love our children and we all do whatever we can to help prepare them to deal with forces outside of our household, forces out in the street. We, we teach our children you know, how, to, how to cross the street to look both ways before they cross the street. We teach our children not to talk to strangers. We teach our children how to conduct themselves when they're in the company of certain people. But how many of us have taken the time to teach our children about racism? How many of us have taken the time to sit down and explain to them how insidious racism is and how it has manifested itself in various forms throughout the year? and how at some point in time they're going to come face to face against the forces of racism. We have to realize that it's our responsibility as adults, as parents, to prepare our children to deal with this inevitability. As we were, my daughter and I were coming back from our second trip to, to Africa back in we go into Ghana, Senegal, Gambia, and the Ivory Coast. And the whole purpose of that trip was to take her to see the slave dungeons so that she can begin to understand how we got from West Africa to the west side of Chicago. All right? So that she can begin to understand the forces that were at play then, the forces that are at play now to keep us mentally enslaved. And as we were coming back, driving from New York City to, um, to our home in Maryland. We were talking about the trip. There were about uh, eight other people with us who, who had gone on the trip and who were driving back to the Washington area. Driving down 95, and as we got in the state of Maryland, we stopped at a, uh, at a restroom. Got gas for the car, people went to the restroom to get something to eat. I went into the men's room and saw a note written on the wall said, death to all niggas, support the KKK. And I felt compelled to share with my daughter and everyone else who was riding with us that we were so glad to be back at home, back in the United States. And I had to remind them that the same people who were responsible for enslaving our ancestors, kidnapping our ancestors, live right down the road from us in Maryland. And if they had the power to re-enslave us, they would do it in a heartbeat. So we can't think 
for one minute that those days are past because that mindset is still very much a part of the consciousness of too many people in this country. So we have a job to do to prepare ourselves. And, and in the latter portion of uh, my daughter's second book, Africa on My Mind, we had a conversation about racism. We had a conversation about how racism has affected the consciousness of African people. And a number has been done on us so badly that white folk or racists don't have to be very overt in their actions against us because the seeds of inferiority have been planted in our mind. They can sit back and watch us destroy ourselves. So we've got to understand the, the roots of our self-destructive behavior so that we can begin to act in a, in a manner that is going to lift us up. And, and I believe it's two weeks from now when Dr. Patricia Newton comes down here from Baltimore, Sister Segment. I mean, this, this, this lecture that she does on post-traumatic slavery syndrome is deep, brothers and sisters. As a psychiatrist, she talks about the behavior in her patients and is able to trace that behavior back to a psychological disorder that she refers to as post-traumatic slavery disorder. We are still being affected by the events which influenced our ancestors two, three hundred years ago. And don't let anybody tell you that slavery is in the past, that that's behind you. It is never behind you. We don't have to continue suffering from the events that happened in the past if we're able to wake up and confront those issues head on and deal with them so that we can change our thinking and change our behavior. But it takes a conscious effort on our part. It takes a willingness on our part to begin to deal with the pain and the suffering so that we can begin to become active participants in the healing of our minds and our bodies and our spirits. And that's what we want to focus on this evening as well. In order for adults, me, you, us, to overcome the problems created by races, we must first be willing to change our consciousness. This is important because no problem is ever solved by using the same consciousness they created. All right? So if you're talking about changing this situation that has been bred within us, then we've got to begin to step outside of the conditions which created this insanity and begin to look at things from a different perspective and understand what is necessary to make some changes. So if we step outside these mental barriers, uh, barriers and expand our consciousness, we will begin to understand that once an idea, once a mind has been influenced by new ideas, it never returns to its original condition. Huh? Once you are willing to participate in the process of healing your mind, of educating yourself, of looking beyond the limitations that have been placed on you by racists and white supremacists, then you begin to change your relationship to the universe. And ideas, feelings, thoughts begin to flood your consciousness and give you solutions to the problems that have always confronted you throughout your entire life. So this evening, I don't, I don't plan for you all to just sit down and listen to me talk, right? Because we've been sitting down too long, listening, listening to too many people talk for too long, right? We need to do something different this evening. And so I've got a couple of activities that I want you all to engage in tonight. Right? The first is a quiz. I want you all to take out pencil and a piece of paper. Right? Because you all should come to these meetings on Wednesday with pencil and paper. All right? And if you don't have paper, if you don't have pencil, ask the person sitting next to you if you can borrow a pencil or a piece of paper. You can write on the back of your program if you like. I want you all, <clears throat> this is an exercise to help you begin to understand your thinking. Okay? There's something about the forces that have help to shape your thinking. Now, first thing I want you to do on that piece of paper is to 
define the word race. Define the word race, R-A-C-E, and I want you to list the known races. Define the word race and list the known races. Okay? And then the other thing that I want you to write on that piece of paper, I want you to define the word continent. Define the word continent and list the known continents. Okay, I'll give you about two minutes to complete that assignment. Define the word race and list the known races. Define the word continent and list the known continents. Okay, I want you all to take the piece of paper, fold it up, and pass it to the aisles. And I want the ushers here, the brothers, if I can have you all go and collect the papers, because I want to have a chance to review them. All right? Now, so pass them on down. Pass them on down to the center of the aisle. We're going to have somebody come down the aisle and pick them up. I want you to complete this so we can move on to the next, the next exercise I have for you this evening so I can get into my message for you. Don't be embarrassed, just pass them on down. Come on. You all remember this routine from when you were in school, don't you? It wasn't that long ago. <laughs> now some of you all teach in school, so, so you know what I'm talking about. Can we have somebody come down the aisle and collect the dog? Okay, great. Thank you, brother. Okay, now, while those papers are being collected, while those papers are being collected, I want to invite those of you in this auditorium to participate in another exercise. All right? Now, all of this is being done to help us understand issues pertaining to race, racism, and white supremacy. So it all has a purpose. It all has a meaning. Now, for... <coughs> This next exercise is sort of um, like a cultural treasure hunt. I've hidden 12 envelopes in this auditorium, okay? 12 envelopes. 10 of these envelopes contain 10 different cultural items, and two of these envelopes contain money, all right? One envelope contains uh, $25, and another envelope contains $50. All right? Now, I want to give you all, say, five minutes. Some of the envelopes may be taped to the bottom of your seat or a seat here in the auditorium. I want to give you all five minutes to look for the I Listen. Listen to my instructions, please. Listen to my instructions, please. When you find an envelope, do not open it. Bring it to the stage. When you find an envelope, sister here just found an envelope. Come on up here. Bring it to the stage, all right? Let's go.
we're still missing one envelope, so obviously it hasn't been found yet, but we'll move forward. And I'm gonna ask everybody, everybody here has an envelope, correct? Every envelope has a number on it, correct? Okay, now if you can, just open the envelope and you'll find an object inside of the envelope. Front reads of Hotep. I found a paperless scroll. Hold it up so you can see it. Papyrus. Hold it up so they can see it. Now, I just got a pie. It's taking a knife. Here's papyrus. Oh, all right. Hold the papyrus up so they can see it. All right. All right. Thank you. Sister? Uh, the outside says Hotep. Inside is papyrus. Papyrus scrolls. Papyrus was the first paper developed by the first civilization humans in Africa. The Egyptians used papyrus to record their accomplishment so that they could be preserved for the future generations. Mine says Hotep and it says I have a Sankofa bird. The Sankofa bird bracelet. I have a bracelet from Sankofa Bird. Sankofa is an icon word from Ghana, West Africa, which means you must reclaim the past before you can move forward. The feet of the Sankofa Bird face forward, which represents the present, but its neck is turned backwards, which represents the past, and it holds an egg in its beak, which represents the future. I have an egg which represents new life, the future. I also have an egg, but the egg not only represents the future, but the future of those yet to be born, your descendants. I have the key. It symbolizes the key to knowledge which opens the door of philosophy, the love of wisdom. Hotel, I also have a key to knowledge, and I know that philosophy is important because your philosophy determines your thought pattern, your thought pattern determines your attitude, your attitude determines your behavior pattern, your behavior pattern determines your action. Hotel, I have a book entitled As a Man. Books are important because they are the pathway to knowledge and power. I have a Hotep card and in the card there is a book. The card says, I also have a book. Mine is entitled, As a Woman Thinketh. Knowledge is important because it will forever govern ignorance. And a people who mean to be their own governors must arm themselves with the power which knowledge gives. I have a $25 banknote from the Central Bank of Gambia. I have a 50, it says, how much is this? It says 50 Dallas's, D-A-L-A-S-I-S, $50 Dallas's from all right, now, I want you all to look. All right, yeah, give them a hand. Give them a hand for finding the objects. They did good. Now, I want you all to, to look at the people standing before you, all right? And I want you to make some observations 
about what you see. What do you see about the people standing before you and the objects that they found? All right. What else do you see? They're both male and female? What do you mean by that? They're both sexes, all right. So you mean, do you mean they, they it's kind of interesting, they alternate between male and female, male and female, male and female, male and female, except down here on the end, right? All right, that's kind of unusual. What else do you see? What else do you see about the objects that they found and their description of the objects that they found? What other pattern do you notice? They're what? They're in twos. They're in pairs. All right? They're in pairs. What else do you notice? They're all African. Yeah, it's all obvious because we're all Africans in here, right? What else do you notice? What do you notice about the objects that they found in pairs? Yes. Jordan and there's like very ancient things or objects. All right, very ancient objects, all right. Any other observations? Wait, the brother was saying something. Everything what now? Everything they had had a meaning to it. So they alternate male, female. They all have objects and pairs. The objects they have all have meaning to them. Any other pattern you notice? <laughs> all right. Any other observation? They're all symbols, right? If you notice how they were paired off, Male, female, male, female. Each couple has the same object, right? These two have papyrus, these two have Sankofa, these two have the A's, these two have keys, these two have books, and these two over here have, have money. If you also notice, the male had one object, female had the same object, but she had more understanding of the object that the two of them shared, correct? All right? So, you, so it's always the case, huh? <laughs> she says, it's always the case, huh? Now, there's some truth to that. And we've seen it displayed this evening. But let me ask you, what do you think the odds are of these objects being found in this order? Huh? Male, female, male, female, male, female. Huh? The high odds. So it's very unlikely that this would happen just arbitrarily, happen by chance, correct? Well, let me share with you. Let me share something with you. The fact that when I ask you all to go searching for the objects, the 12 envelopes, there were only two envelopes hidden in the audience. The rest, 10, have been given to these 10 people before the program started, all right? These were my plants, all right? But if you understand, this little demonstration helps to illustrate how racism works. You see here, everybody thinks we operate on a level playing field, huh? And that we all are in search of the same goals. But what you don't know is that the deck is stacked, huh? And so you go through life, you go through life seeking the money. And the only two envelopes that were hidden in the audience were the money, but it's Gambian money. <laughs> Can't use it here. But the things that these other people found are objects pertaining to your culture. Objects that define who you are as a people. And if you look at those objects, beginning with the papyrus, the Sankofa, 
bird, the egg, which symbolizes the potential of the future, the keys, which are the keys to knowledge, wisdom, and philosophy, books, which help you to refine your mind and help you determine how to understand your past and the symbols associated with your past. These are the things that are of true value to you. Most of us go out in search of the money and leave behind the things that are of lasting value. You find the money and you find that the money really serves you no lasting purpose once it's spent. But the knowledge, the symbols associated with your life link you to your culture and will last you for the rest of your life. As a matter of fact, they're so valuable that you can pass them on to the generations after you. And if they understand what these symbols associated with their culture mean, they will be empowered by them. And they will mean more than any money printed on paper will ever mean. All right? So let me thank you all. You can just leave the objects on the floor. You are four in it. It's fine. I'll, I'll gather them up. Well, yeah, you can put them back in the bag. Make it easy for me. OK, but, but the whole purpose of this little demonstration was to illustrate a basic fact, a very basic fact. We are fooled into thinking that we're all engaged in a process. We're all participating in a level playing field. And the playing field is not level by any stretch. Yeah, that's it. Thank you all very much. Can you give them a hand? Let me just ask you some basic questions. Do you think that we live in a society where one group of people are given preferential treatment over another? Do you think we live in a society where education and knowledge and information are intentionally withheld from one group and given to another group? Now let me ask you, what do you think, what do you think are the long-term implications of this process of information being withheld of knowledge given freely to one group while it's withheld from another group. What do you think are the long-term implications of this reality? Underdevelopment, miseducation, huh? This is the reality of the world in which we are living today. Let me review the questions in the quiz that I gave you just so we can begin to understand how we have been affected by this process of miseducation or selective education. Let's look at some of the, uh, and I appreciate you all uh, participating in this activity and, and, and giving me your suggestions. And I just want to read through some of them so that we can begin to understand how we have been educated, how we have been programmed, all right? Let me just read through some of these definitions. Um, here, this one says a continent. A uh, continent is a large area surrounded by water. They define two continents, Africa and Asia. Someone else says race is a myth used for domination. He said that the continents are America, Eurasia, Africa, Australia, Antarctica. Someone else says a race is a humanoid classification. They describe the races as Caucasian, Negroid, and Mongoloid. They list the continents of Asia, China, Africa, and Australia. Someone else says race is the ethnic group or the genetic characteristics of a person. Continent is a landmass surrounded by a huge body of water. The continents are Asia, Africa, Australia, North America, South America, um, Antarctica. Now, these responses are all basically the same. And they show you the extent to which we all have been educated or miseducated. Huh? I say miseducated because we now know as a result of numerous African and African American scholars beginning to think outside of the normal limitations of European education, they began to see themselves and see the world differently. We've come to, to learn and to understand <laughs> that there is no such thing as race, Amen. all right? But before I give you the new definition of race, let me give you Webster's definition so we can like put things into context, all right? Webster, the new uh, 20th century unabridged dictionary, defines race as any major biological divisions of mankind distinguished by color, texture of hair, color of skin, 
eyes, statue, body proportion, etc. Many ethnologists now consider that there are only three primary races, the Caucasian white race, the Negroid black race, and the Mongoloid yellow race. Now, based on knowledge that is now being disseminated in educational systems throughout the United States and elsewhere, people are beginning to learn that there is no such thing as race. There is no such thing as race. Race was a false construct created by Europeans, specifically Europeans of German extraction at the, at the uh, University of Göttingen in 1775. 17, between 1775 and 1780, Europeans at the University of Göttingen fabricated this whole concept of race. They invented the word Caucasian, classified humanity by color, and gave the lowest classification to the people who had the greatest amount of melanin in their skin. And they propagated this lie as a truth. And that truth was taught to every person in this auditorium tonight. Race, racism, and white supremacy are ideologies, which are the byproduct of a xenophobic consciousness. All right, and we have to understand that. It's a consciousness which has been imposed upon the majority of people of color on the planet. Do you realize, do you understand? that over 70% of the people on planet Earth are people of color. Over 70% of the world's population are people of color. Terms that, such as the white man's burden or, or the manifest destiny are terms that were created by Europeans to justify their cruel and inhuman treatment of people of color, specifically people of African ancestry and Native Americans in this land. We have to begin to understand what happened in the mindset of Europeans, particularly the so-called European discoverers, who, when they began to develop ships that allowed them to sail outside of Europe for the first time in their lives, and they traveled to various parts of the world, they encountered people who didn't look like them. They encountered people of color. And as these men, as these sailors, some of whom had been on these ships for months on end, sought to physically interact with the women of color that they met. And when these women became pregnant and produced children, they saw in every single instance these children did not look like them. They were children of color. So you can begin to imagine the fear which grew in the minds of these people who saw as they traveled throughout the world that they were in the minority. And as they interacted with these other people and children were produced as a result of sexual relationships, the children didn't look like them. And they realized that if they moved outside of the boundaries, outside of the confines of Europe, and mixed freely with other people, that they would disappear from the face of this earth. So the only way they could ensure their survival is by fabricating a lie and convincing everybody else in the world to believe in that lie. All right? The lie that we were all divided into races and that they, the white race, were the superior race and everyone else was inferior to them and they used this lie to justify rape and murder and genocide on every land that they set foot on. That's a reality, okay? We have to realize the race, racism, and white supremacy are the same things. They're realities. They're realities which should never be confused with prejudice. Don't let anybody convince you that there's such a thing as black racism. Don't let anybody convince you that black people can be racist. See, because if you understand the philosophy of Dr. Francis Wilson, see, racism is a false construct. Everybody has prejudices, right? Everybody has prejudged beliefs, which is probably one of the greatest of all human failures. Some people don't like tall folk. Some people don't like people with short hair, curly hair, people with no hair. That's a prejudice, all right? But racists 
have been able to use power to impose their prejudices on all of the people that they come in contact with. So the difference in that equation is power, the use of brute force, power to impose your prejudices or your prejudged beliefs on other people. Black folk are prejudiced. We've been conditioned to be prejudiced, right? Black folk, dark-skinned black folk may not like white skin, light-skinned black folk, huh? Black folk with nappy hair may not like other black folk with so-called good hair. And these terms, these concepts, are, are, are insane language that we've been taught to accept as reality. There's no such thing as good hair. Any hair you got is good hair. Listen to the language that we engage in, calling somebody who is, who is light-skinned, fair-skinned, someone who is dark-skinned, then is unfair-skinned. Huh? That's insane. When you buy into the insanity, that racism creates, then you will act insane. That insanity will be projected upon your own people because that's how racism is structured. It is designed to make you turn on people who look like you. Let us look at the definition of a continent. Let's go back to Webster for a second. Webster defines continent as a large and ex extensive landmass with extensive plains, plateaus, and one or more mountain ranges, and is surrounded or nearly surrounded by water. There are seven continents. Listed by size, they are Asia, Africa, North America, South America, Antarctic, Europe, and Australia in Webster's dictionary. But if we understand the reality, if a continent is in fact a landmass surrounded by water on all four sides, Europe does not fit into that definition. All Europe is, is the northwestern extension of the continent of Asia. So these people have literally drawn an imaginary line down the eastern side of the continent of Asia and claim the western side of that continent for themselves. And because of the fact that they created the dictionary and they created the definitions in the dictionary, they created a continent. We have got to begin to look at how they have shaped the world in their image to their benefit. We've got to begin to understand that we all have been educated or miseducated by them. And as long as we continue to accept their definitions of reality, their perceptions of truth, then we will always act against our own best interests. And so then we have to begin. We must begin. If we want to change the nature of this relationship, if we want to change the circumstances that we find ourselves in, we have to begin to define ourselves differently. Develop a new, develop a new paradigm for thinking. And again, understanding, we have to begin to understand what happened to us and how we got here so that we can become very clear of the issues, the challenges that are confronting us as a people. We can't make any mistake about the fact that we are living under conditions of war. And that war began when the very first Africans were kidnapped from the west coast of Africa and taken to Portugal in 1441 and given as a gift to Prince Henry of Portugal. And they then set up a process for the enslavement of all of the people in the continent of Africa. 1442, Pope Eugenius issued a papal bull allowing first the Portuguese and then the Spanish to enslave all African people in the name of Catholicism. Why? Because we were deemed as soulless savages. And without a soul, they were now free to do anything that they wanted to do to us without any fear of retribution by their creator, God Almighty. Hmm? 1444, the wholesale enslavement of Africa began and continued 
over 350 years, until finally it was no longer economically feasible for Europeans to continue to engage in the process of importing Africans to North America and South America and to the Caribbean islands. So then what they decided to do was to prevent a war among Europeans for the theft of the riches on the continent of Africa. And in 1885, a group of 14 European nations met in Berlin. And over a course of a year, they outlined a strategy to come in and colonize and rape the continent of Africa. That Berlin conference was designed specifically to take out the motherland, to take control of the resources of Africa. And you know, if, if you think about it, if you think about what Europeans have done as they've moved throughout the world, whether it was Africa, whether it was North America, South America, Australia, certain regions of, 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 of Asia, wherever they have gone in the world, they have killed, they have destroyed in the name of their God. And they have convinced the people that they subjugated in their right to do what they did. We have to begin to understand what happened to us, no longer become ashamed of that dreaded period of, of the Middle Passage or the Maafa, the, the, the African Holocaust. We can't be ashamed of that as if we did something wrong. We have to understand that those people who engaged in all of those sick practices of raping men, raping women, castrating, castrating men, collecting their organs in jars and putting them on displays in their home. That is sickness. And we have to see that they are the ones who are sick. And we have to begin to understand that we have survived the most horrendous acts of genocide that any people on earth have ever experienced. We have survived. And we have to realize and accept the fact that whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. So we must be, by virtue of that reality, we must be the strongest of the strong. So can we begin to act in a way that empowers us? Can we begin to use that strength to our benefit? to now change the conditions that we find ourselves under. In fact, I believe that that's our only recourse. We can't sit back and expect those who enslaved our ancestors and passed civil rights legislation just 30 some odd years ago to be responsible for freeing us. You realize that the civil rights legislation that was passed in 1964 and 1965 is temporary? that it has to be renewed. The Voting Rights Act of 1965 has to be renewed every 25 years. And in the year 2007, at least 35 states have to ratify the Voting Rights Act. And if they choose not to ratify it, it will disappear. And you all will be in the same condition in 2007 that your ancestors were in 1945. That's a reality that we're confronted with. So the question is, how are we going to deal with that reality? If we realize, if we truly understand and appreciate the fact that we are some of the strongest people who have ever lived on planet Earth, then we have to understand the value and the wisdom of engaging in conscious acts of Sankofa. Conscious acts of returning to reclaim the past in order to empower ourselves so that we can create a future of our own design. Sankofa teaches us that we must reclaim the past. Sankofa teaches us that we can always correct the mistakes of the past. And by applying that knowledge, that wisdom today, we can determine the future. But you have to become an active participant in the process. You can't just sit back and expect it to happen by itself. Nothing in the universe happens that way. It takes action. You have to put forth action. You have to put something in motion in order to make other things happen as a result of that. You can't just sit back. I saw a, button, a brother in the back with a button that says, if you don't vote, don't bitch. 
Plain and simple. If you aren't engaged in a process to liberate yourself, then you can't complain when racists do whatever it takes in order to keep you down, because that's their job. They're doing what they were born to do. So the question is, what are you going to do? It makes no sense to sit back and complain and point fingers. They're doing what history has recorded they have always done. They will never change. The question is, when are you going to begin to change? Huh? We have to realize that we've been taught to hate ourselves. Amen. We have been taught to hate ourselves. Hate is learned behavior. And if you've been taught to hate yourself, it means that you can also be taught to reverse that condition and love yourself. But you have to become actively involved in the process. In order for us to survive, in order for us to move beyond mere survival, because it ain't about survival, it's about liberating yourself. It's about seeking, claiming freedom and preserving it for those who will come after you. We've been in survival mode for too long. We have to begin to understand that we have to prepare ourselves. We have to make the love of our culture, the love of each other, our highest priority. In that instance, the best Offense is a good defense. We've got to begin to prepare ourselves to deal with the struggles that we know are confronting us in the years to come. It's no question that we've been living under conditions of war in this nation. It's no question about it. If you don't realize it, then, 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 then you are mentally ill. It doesn't, doesn't take a genius to sit back and, and flip through the pages of history and understand that the acts that were taken against your people were acts of war. And understand that the war does not always have to be a physical confrontation. Warfare takes on many forms. It could be mental warfare. It could be spiritual warfare training people that they should go to a church and pray to a God that looks like their oppressor. That's spiritual warfare. It could be educational warfare, teaching our children to believe in the lies of European history and American history and denying them an opportunity to study their own history. That's educational warfare. Economic warfare is reality. Social warfare is reality. There's high intensity warfare and there's low intensity warfare. So we have to begin to understand and accept the fact that we have been living under conditions of war. We have to begin to act like it. Change our whole mode of operation. In order to win this conflict or any conflict, you have to be able to have short term and long term strategies. Hmm? Short term and long term strategies. You can't expect to deal with or overcome racism or white supremacy by protesting, hmm? by calling people names, by begging, by praying on their God to deliver you because it will not happen. The only, the only effective way of countering racism and white supremacy is by devising strategies that you, you can implement in your life on a daily basis. That's the only way to change this situation because if everyone is involved in a process every day of liberating themselves, then liberated people can come together as a group and do more than one or two or three or four people can ever do. There is power in numbers. There is physical power, there is mental power, and there is spiritual power in numbers. I'm sure by now all of you all are aware of the infamous Willie Lynch letter, yeah. right? You've heard that letter read and discussed on many occasions. But if you just think about it, think about the significance of that act. In 1712, a group of plantation owners invited Willie Lynch, who was probably one of the most successful, one of the most uh, prosperous slave owners 
in the Western Hemisphere, they invited him to come to meet with white slave owners and tell them how to maximize the work and the profits from their slaves. Huh? That's what any good businessman would do. They want to learn from the best. And in that letter, in that discourse, Willie Lynch talked about specific strategies that if they are employed, will separate the young from the old, the male from the female, light skin from the black skin, accentuate our differences, use them to divide us, and that if you take these strategies and if you teach them to your children, then these strategies will continue to affect, infect or affect the lives of African people for 100 years, 200 years, maybe even three, hundred years. We're talking about long-term strategies that were designed specifically to render you powerless. So it's going to take the opposite thinking in order for you to change that process, short-term and long-term thinking. In order for us to destroy racism and white supremacy, we must be willing to assume total responsibility for our own well-being. That is, we must master the art of personal economics. And what do I mean by personal economics? When I use the word economics, I mean, I'm using that word in its literal sense. The word economics is derived from the Greek words okos and the word nemen. The word okos means house or household. The word demon means to manage. So economics in this sense means is the management of a household or the management of a system or a body in an organized and efficient manner. So let me ask you, what is the most important household that you will ever manage? Your body, this, the house that holds your mind and your spirit is the most important house that you will ever have in your life. So we've got to begin to look at how we're dealing with this body, the mind and the body and the spirit that makes us who and what we are. See, because if you can't control your body, you can't control your mind and your spirit. You can't control your mind and your spirit, you can't control your body. And in this society, any person who can't control their body is considered an invalid, huh? You know what you do with people in this society who can't control their body? You call them invalids. And what is an invalid? An invalid is someone who is invalid, huh? Who has no use, who serves no function whatsoever. And so I want to ask you all this evening, how many of you fall into this category? How many of you are not managing your household in a manner that allows you to function as a whole, complete, and sound person? Let me do a little survey and ask you some questions. And you can respond just by raising your hands. How many of you, within the last 30 days, done any of the following? How many of you all have, have dis, disrespected a family member, a neighbor, or a co-worker? How many? Raise your hand. Be honest. Huh? How many of you all within the last 30 days have called somebody a nigga? Huh? Be honest. Understand the importance of words and the power associated with words, and how they affect your person, how they affect your soul and your consciousness. How many of you all within the last 30 days have used profanity or have been in the company of people using profanity? All right. 
I want you to understand the significance, because I'm talking about simple things, simple things that we take for granted, but we've got to understand the implications of these simple things. Huh? What's another word for, for profanity? Curse, huh? And what's a curse? Curse is a negative spell that you put on somebody. You understand the power of words? I mean, it says in the Bible that, that, that the, world, the world was created, what, via the spoken word? It says in the sacred text of Kemet that, that the Atan brought the world into the creation via the spoken word. Jehudi was, was the nature associated with divine articulation of speech. Jehudi helped a set raise Asar from the dead by using certain words. Words have power and force, huh? Whether you are conscious of it or not. So every time you curse somebody, you're actually cursing yourself. And every time you curse yourself, you create barriers that prevent you from moving forward and accomplishing the things that you think you want. Hmm? How many of you all, within the last 30 days, used drugs or alcohol? Hmm? Violated this temple. Hmm? I mean, think about, I mean, we, 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 I mean, it's beautiful that we spend so much time talking about Kemet. You know, wanting to claim wearing onks and, and the comedic jewelry and, and take on comedic names. It's beautiful that we want to claim that aspect of ourselves, but we can't just take one part and forget another part. See, because these people were talking about words, they were talking about symbols, they were talking about transforming consciousness. You can't play with this stuff. You can't do it halfway. This is real. These are serious issues serious forces of reality that we're talking about here. Not some just frivolous thing that you play with simply because it's the fad of the decade. How many of you all within the last 30 days have bought something that you knew was stolen? Huh? Bought something hot. Huh? Now you know let me let me let me take let me take a moment because see I'm not I'm not trying to I'm not trying to sit up here and, and, and speak from a self-righteous posture or anything like that. But let me just let me just share an experience with you, a personal experience that helped me begin to understand some of the stuff that I'm talking about. Because I'm not just talking about philosophical things that would be nice for you to do if you want to live a, a better quality of life. I'm talking about some real things that you need to be aware of if you want to live a better quality of life. Personally, grew up in Chicago, on the, south, on the west side of Chicago, all right? So there were always folk in our community who were junkies and what have you, who were breaking into people's homes, stealing televisions and, and leather coats and, and stereos, huh? I always came by, hey man, I got television, color television, $25 is yours, all right? And when you get caught up in that mindset, you go, yeah, I need a television, $25, I'll buy the television. And you aren't even conscious of the ramifications of your actions. See, anytime you steal from somebody, if you, if you truly understand the, the concepts of my eye, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later on, but if you truly understand the concepts of my eye, this whole thing of reciprocity, you cannot do something to somebody without that same thing coming back to you. You can't hide from it. Because this force is it's real, it's more real than gravity. It's pervasive. It's everywhere. And when you begin to understand the essence of these forces and how they work in your life, then you can begin to make choices. Choices that will affect the quality of your life. And if you make the right choices, I dare say this evening, that these choices will begin to insulate you from the pressures of racism and white supremacy. Had a situation, I had a situation years ago where a friend of mine used to steal cameras. I mean, he worked in camera stores. I mean, and, and, and he would sell me, he called me up, 
He had cameras, he had lenses, he had motor drives, he had everything imaginable. So I, over a period of two or three years, I had four or $5,000 camera system. I had everything imaginable, all right? And then, a couple of years later, somebody broke into my house, all right? Somebody broke into my house, took my stereo, took, <laughs> took my camera, <laughs> took my cameras, took all of, uh, all of my prized possessions, right? Okay? And then about three days later, after the break-in, got a call from the police. Police asked me, what kind of stereo you have? Sony stereo, what kind of speakers do you have? What a speaker. So why don't you come on down, Mr. Browder? I think we got your items. We found the people who have been breaking into homes in the neighborhood. Came down to the police station, and I found the police had recovered every item that I had purchased from the store and had a receipt for it. See, all of the items that I bought hot, they didn't find. And so I didn't, I didn't really, that didn't register at that time. I was glad to get my stereo back and my tape deck back and my other thing. I was content with that. And then the, the following year, I got a telephone call from folk out in California who were inviting me to, to come and do a presentation in Mexico, right? So, hey, my first trip to Mexico. I have the opportunity to see the pyramids in Mexico and, and see the Olmec heads and, and, yeah, I take pictures. And then I thought, wait a minute now, I don't have my cameras. I can't take any pictures. And then I started thinking about it. Well, you know, my cameras were stolen. But wait a minute, other stuff was stolen too. My stereo was stolen, but I got my stereo back. And then something in my mind said, well, Browder, you know, maybe you got back those things that you were supposed to get back, those things that you bought in a righteous manner. And the things that you bought high, you weren't supposed to get them back, all right? That's what the thought, that was the thought that came into my mind. This is back in, in 1984, 85. That was the thought that came into my mind. And I wasn't ready to accept that thought. I said, nah, you know, and, and then, this, this, this golden rule stuff, that can't be real. And then I swear to God, telephone rang. I mean, as soon as I completed that thought, the telephone rang. Picked up the phone, and it was my partner. Partner I hadn't seen in two years. Partner who had stolen all the cameras. <laughs> Called me up on the phone and said, Tony, I got a great deal on a, on a two and a quarter camera system, the whole kit and caboodle that you have for $100. I just threw the phone down on the ground and said, I understand. Don't have to beat me over the head. I understand. All right? And one of the things that I have been trying to get my people to understand is that you cannot afford to have a get over mentality because you never get over when you're doing wrong. You never get over when you're doing wrong. You ultimately wind up placing more barriers, more setbacks in your own way. The only way to get over is to do right. As difficult as, or as square as it may sound, the only way to truly get over is to do those things that you know in your heart are the right things to do. So what I want to suggest to you this evening is that we will never overcome the forces of racism and white supremacy as long as we remain willing participants in destructive behavior patterns patterns that have been ingrained in our consciousness by those who understand the forces of nature, the reciprocal forces of nature, hmm? and train us to act in a manner that they know will render us perpetually, perpetually dependent on others because we function outside of the laws of nature. We've got to understand that we can reverse the situation that we currently find ourselves in by learning to create and to sustain peace, concepts of peace within our minds and our lives and our communities. But in order to do that, we've got to look back to Africa. We've got to look back to Africa before colonization, look back to Africa before the period of enslavement, before the Maafa, before the Middle Passage, we look to Africa during the, the ancient kingdoms, in West Africa, in, in Central Africa, in Southern Africa. We look back to Africa 
all the way back to the Nile Valley. And we can find records, documented records, that will give you principles and guidelines that were designed as prerequisites for personal development. Now, we talk about the people of Kemet, we talk about the great builders they were, the great thinkers, the great inventors, but what we really have to understand that what motivated them to build, to create, was this understanding of some basic and fundamental principles that exist within the universe. And if you understand these principles and these forces of nature, Neturu, nature, Neturu, these forces of nature, and if you incorporate these principles in your life, they will arm you spiritually and physically and mentally and allow you to bring out the God force which is ever present in your life. So when you examine these readings and these writings, you will find guidelines that will help you overcome the obstacles that currently stand in your way. You can knock them down as if they were a house of cards because all they are are illusions in the overall scheme of things. You empower racists and white supremacists by believing in their power. It's just like the Wizard of Oz thing, you know? The wizard was behind the curtain pulling switches and stuff. Racists and white supremacists are behind the curtain pulling switches. If you don't allow yourself to be manipulated by them, if you don't empower them by your inactivity, then you will transform the nature of your relationship to them overnight. Understand the value of the 10 virtues that George Jim James talked about in, in, in Stolen Legacy. 10 virtues, prerequisites for personal development. I mean, think about this, not just as you know, not just as a, as, a, as a good philosophical approach to life, but as keys to your personal salvation. Ten virtues, control of thought, control of action, steadfastness. What does that mean? Control of thought. Thought, the word thought comes from the Greek word toth, which is derived from the comedic word Jehuti. Jehuti was a nature who was associated with the process of divine articulation of speech. Jehuti was associated with writing. He was associated with the divine word. He was associated with mathematics, science, and healing. Huh? So when you talk about control of, of, of thought, you're talking about control of the process of the spirit of Jehuti in your consciousness. Control of how you think and what you think. Control of thought, control of action. Every single thing you do, every action is the direct result of your thoughts. If you think correctly, you will act correctly. Huh? And steadfastness is the process of maintaining correct thoughts and correct action. Very simple, very basic. Identity with higher ideals. Evidence of a mission. Evidence of a call to spiritual order. What does that mean? Once you think correctly and act correctly and maintain this relationship, then you will begin to change the quality of your thoughts. And you will begin to draw to you higher thoughts that will influence your behavior. And you will begin to experience what's referred to as identity with higher ideals. You will begin to see beyond the limitations which stymie the development and progress of other people. You'll begin, once you begin to identify with higher ideals, you will begin to understand your mission in life. Every person in this room was born to achieve certain things in your lifetime. The spirit that inhabits your body, the ancestor who came back in your body came back to do a particular job. By thinking ignorantly, by acting ignorantly, you inhibit that spirit from doing the work that it was destined to do. But when you listen, when you understand, you allow yourself to begin to understand what your mission is. When you begin to carry out your mission, you experience what's referred to as a call to spiritual order. You know very clearly what it is you must do and the steps that you must take in order to accomplish your mission in life. Hmm? It said that a mind that, that is hopeful, confident, courageous, determined on a set purpose, and keeps itself to that purpose will attract to itself out of the universe 
things and powers that are favorable to that purpose. That's real. Once you begin to, to understand this, this call to spiritual order, then you will begin to experience freedom from resentment. Why freedom from resentment? Because when you, be, when you act in a manner that is in your own spiritual best interest, then those that don't understand or can't relate to what you're doing will begin to resent your development. Huh? And they'll say, nigga, what you think you do? You think you better than me? They will resent you're moving beyond this Negro consciousness. And you have to be wise enough and strong enough not to resent their ignorance, not to let it stand in your way. You will find as you move down this path, spiritual development and mental development, you will find that the people will come into your lives who will guide you along the path further development. And you have to begin to have confidence in those people who will teach you and guide you. By confidence, I mean that you have to begin to know who these people are and not question everything that they tell you to do because you understand their role in your life. And as you learn and as you progress, then you have to begin to have confidence in your own ability to do the things that you've been taught to do. You've got to know when to act and what to do and how long to act. You've got to know when to step back. That takes training. That takes mental development to reach that level of consciousness. And then when you reach that state of being, then you've got to be willing to go out into the world, go out into society, go out into your community and practice what you've learned. See, it does no good whatsoever to acquire knowledge and not use it. Hmm? Does no good to come to these lectures week after week after week after week and hear all the, 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 the brilliant brothers and sisters who come before you imparting knowledge if you aren't going to use that knowledge in your life. It's a waste of your time and it's a waste of their time. So there's a sense of responsibility that comes with you sitting in these seats every week. If we begin to do the things that our soul tells us we should do, then we will begin to see changes take place all around us. That's reality. So the other major step towards our, our liberation, because I, I've learned over time that it's good to talk about history, it's good to talk about the past, but if you can't apply those lessons to right now, then you might as well shut up. Because the past means nothing if you can't begin to apply those lessons to transform the quality of your, of your life today and create a future of your own design. You all, every person in this room, is a creator. You have within you the power, the God-given right to create whatever you can see. And if you don't use that talent, that gift, you are wasting your life. Nobody, nobody can stop you from using what you have. Not the white man, not your husband, not your wife, your brother, your mother, your father. Nobody can stop you if you are truly living up to your potential as a human being. Because one of the things that I've learned over the years of traveling to Kemet over the last 17 years. One of the, the realities that, that just struck me one day as I was walking in through the temple of, of, of Karnak and just, just gazing on the grandeur of, of these monuments and I like flashed back in time in order to try to conceptualize how this, this building must have looked when it was brand new. When the carvings that had just been finished, when the paintings were still glistening in the sunlight and the men and the women were, were walking throughout the temple doing their work, I was trying to put myself in that place and understand what it took to create something like this. And I, I realized at that point in time that those people who created this structure, they were true human beings. And that we today are subhuman. We are living on a subhuman level, and we are content to live on a subhuman level. Huh? You all have heard the statement that the average person uses 10% of their brain. What kind of nonsense is that? 
you are content not to live up to your potential because you've been conditioned to be content. I submit to you, brothers and sisters, that all you have to do is flip it over. Change that conditioning. Want to do more, and you will find yourself doing more. Why? Because whatever you do, often you do best. Huh? So if you do nothing all the time, you call somebody up, somebody calls you up on the phone, what you doing? Nothing. Huh? You become a master at doing nothing. You can never afford to just do nothing. If you understand the conditions that we're living under, if you understand our responsibility to transform the future for our, for our great-grandchildren, huh? Amos Wilson, when he was here a couple of years ago, just before he died, Amos Wilson said something to the effect that, that a thought does not, does not cease at the end of its occurrence, but continues to move forward into time, creating ripples which transform time for the next seven generations. Everything that you think, say, and do influences the future for the next seven generations. That power. You can't afford to do nothing when you have the potential to do everything, huh? And especially, especially, you know, if you understand this whole thing about libation and ancestor worship, Sister Camille, I was so pleased with the libation that you, that you performed this, this evening. We need to continue doing that and we need to understand We need to understand that when we pour a libation, it's not just some ceremony, not some little ritual to impress folk with our knowledge of, of African spirituality. You're talking about connecting with the real vital force of life that is everywhere, all right? And that if you understand the whole aspect of of the whole concept of, of ancestral worship or, 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 or the ancestors. Alex was uh, barred. They told him not to speak about law. He said, don't do anything concerning law. Well, he gives us insight. And he makes sure that we know the law, regardless of what they said. Once again, a round of applause for our chairman. <laughs> gives me great pleasure, ladies and gentlemen, to bring our keynote speaker down to address you with some very vital information. We're going to have our drummers start their ritual as they bring our speaker down, ladies and gentlemen. His name? will be Brother Anthony T. Browder. A round of applause, please, ladies and gentlemen. Come on down, brothers. Hotep New York. You know, I thought DC was the hot spot in the nation, but there's always something going on in New York, you know? Every time I come here, there's always something going on. I'm, as usual, as usual, I'm very pleased to, to be here and to have another opportunity to share with you some of my research information that I've been working on diligently over the last several years and 
have the opportunity to share it with you, and I trust that you receive the knowledge in the spirit in which it was generated. Tonight, <clears throat> as usual, I'm going to be sharing with you information in several different formats through speech as well as through visuals, because for those of you who don't know, um, <clears throat> I'm not trained as a historian. Uh, my primary training is in the field of design and advertising, art, but after I graduated from Howard and became aware of the fact that I had been miseducated, I began to assume responsibility for re-educating myself. I think Dr. Carter B. Woodson, Dr. Woodson said it best when he stated that every person had two educations, one that is given to him, the other which he gives himself, another two, the latter is by far more significant because everything that is important in a person's life is that which they must seek out for themselves. It constitutes their real education. So it's our right to get the paper so that you can move out into society and do other things, but just don't think that that paper is your passport to success. We have an obligation and a responsibility to see to it that we put into our minds, put into our consciousness, put into our spirit, knowledge of our history, our culture, our ancestors, and our God, so that we can exist within the society and keep our sanity as we continue to build a better place for those who will come behind us. That is our obligation, and that is our responsibility. I want to begin my remarks this evening by first acknowledging the memory and the spirit of a brother who is well known here in Harlem, brother Dr. John Henry Clark, who is now an ancestor. A brother who I am obligated to acknowledge for having put me on the path, put me more firmly, put my feet more firmly on the path so that I could be very clear about the work that I must do throughout my life. And so wherever I go, I have to acknowledge the spirit of, of Professor Clark and pray that I continue to do work that will make him proud. Pray that his spirit will continue to infuse me with, with the words and the knowledge which will allow me to do my small part to continue his work. Because much of what I am today, I, I owe to, to his guidance, to his direction. I also, uh, I've been traveling quite a bit this month and just arrived home last night after having been on the road for about five days and was checking my email last night around 1.30 and uh, saw a message that uh, Professor uh, Linda Jeffrey's mother had passed uh, 10 days ago. So I also want to extend my condolences uh, to Brother Jeffrey's and, and his family and ask that you all keep him in your prayers. Now one of the realities of life is that we are going to see brothers and sisters come and go. And that is a part of life. That is the price we pay for being born. But also there is another aspect of life and that is the fact that the life is continual. Life is cyclical and that those who leave us in the physical still have the ability to commune with us in the spiritual as long as we speak their names yes. and keep their memories alive. Yes. And so it is not superstitious, it's not sacrilegious, it is of utmost importance, importance that we understand what we must do in order to remain connected with those who are now ancestors, yes. those who can fuel our thoughts and our actions with a spirit and an energy far greater than we can access here on the physical plane of existence. So I always am, am, am obligated to acknowledge that part of my reality. My topic for this evening is African Americans, history, new perspectives for a new millennium. There's been quite a bit of talk as of late about this, this new millennium. Y2K problem. I just heard on the news last week that, that there's another computer-related problem 
that is going to be just as bad, if not worse, than Y2K problem. Uh, not very many people have heard about it. it. It turns out that computer programmers for years would always end their program with a series of nines. And so this September the 9th, 1999, nine, 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 is going to pose a very serious problem for those computers that are still operating off of the old program. It is a problem that could be as potentially devastating as the Y2K problem. And so, you're probably going to be hearing quite a lot about conflicts in the future. Conflicts have always arisen and will continue to arisen. Matter of fact, history is a story of conflicts. History also, as Professor Clark tells us, History is also a record of the accomplishments of people. And if we see that we are headed for conflict, then all we have to do is to study the various manifestations of that conflict so that we can prepare ourselves to be in the right place at the right time. History is always written by the survivors of any conflict. And so for those people who are totally dependent on technology and computers, who will probably bug out, who will probably commit suicide, who will probably be totally emotionally, physically, and psychologically devastated by whatever happens. Those who are not part of that consciousness can use this as an opportunity yes. to take advantage of yes. doors that will be open to you. Yes. So in the, midst, in the midst of their disaster, there are opportunities yes. for success for those who have their eyes open. Yes. So I, I would encourage you all to open your eyes. Some of the topics that I'm going to be discussing this evening as we talk about uh, new perspectives for a new millennium are issues that I feel are, are crucial to us as a people if we are going to be around in the new millennium. Because I feel that we're, we're at a very serious crossroads right now. When you consider everything that has been done to us, that continues to be done to us, and that more than likely will not cease at any point in time within the next two or three years, if we don't become more conscious of the problems that have been placed in our way, we may not be here 200 years from now. Matter of fact, I had a dream about a month or so ago. It was really more like a nightmare. And I dreamt that it's maybe 50 years in the future. And a young girl, I don't know who she was, she wasn't African, but a young girl was given an assignment to write for class. And that assignment was, whatever happened to black people? And as she went home to, to search the internet and to search the, the various CD-ROMs and other resources she had available to her, to her, she found story after story after story of problems that we were confronted with that we did not deal with effectively. And as a result, we set the stage for others to determine it was time to get rid of us. And thus, we were no longer around. And our removal was deemed justifiable in the eyes of others who see us or saw us as a problem. I think, I think it's clear. I think it's clear that many Europeans don't like us here. It's clear. And so I think it's futile to beg or to pray for them to have a change of heart. I think it is, at least based on my study of their history and their interaction with us throughout their history. I don't think things are going to change dramatically within the next two, three, four hundred years. So given the historical realities that have been presented to us, I think our only recourse is begin to take more serious steps ourselves to protect ourselves and ensure that there will be a place for us in the world 
in the years to come, in the centuries to come. And I think we're at a point in time where if we don't do it, it's our problem. Based on, based on our knowledge of the history of our interaction with our former enslavers, okay? So with that said, let me move into my presentation. I wanna begin my talk this evening by establishing an operational framework from which I will <clears throat> present my information. And this operational framework is rooted in three very basic and very fundamental realities. The first reality is that history shows beyond a shadow of a doubt <clears throat> that humanity began in Africa over 200,000 years ago. There's no debate about that. History shows that all races evolved from Africans through mutation, gene flow, genetic drift, and recombination of genetic material. That is a historical and scientifically proven reality. Research shows that civilization began in Africa, in the Nile Valley country, the nation of Kemet, which we now call today Egypt, and that Kemet laid the cornerstone for the ancient civilizations of Greece and Rome, which established the foundation for civilizations in France, Germany, Italy, England, and ultimately right here in the United States of America. There's no question about that. And so if we begin to look at that evidence, then we have to be clear or become clearer of a specific reality. And some of those realities are realities that we have to determine how we're going to deal with. Case in point, I want to share just a few visuals with you to, to reinforce some of these facts. And great. I don't know. Let's see here. Great, okay. This is just an over, overlay, <coughs> overhead from the September 97, 1997 issue of National Geographic magazine, which had an article about the oldest human footprints ever found on Earth. These footprints were discovered in South Africa in an area near Cape Town about three years ago. I had an opportunity to visit South Africa twice last year. And during the summer, during July of last year, there was an international conference in Sun City, South Africa, an international conference with anthropologists, paleontologists, and other researchers. And their conclusions at the end of that conference was that there's no doubt that humanity began in Africa and it appears as though the focus, the central point for the development of human beings was in South Africa as opposed to Tanzania or, or, or Kenya as was previously thought. I had an opportunity to visit an area right outside of Johannesburg called Sturkfontein Caves. And it was in this cave where they found the skeleton of a female which they originally thought was approximately 250,000 years old. This is Homo sapiens sapiens, a human being. And they've just recently reanalyzed this skull and said that this African female was at least 300,000 years old. So what is becoming more clear as they do the research that we have been on this planet much longer than they have ever imagined. We have been on this planet. And thus they also know that they are recent arrivals into the family of humanity. They understand that. They've also done... Okay, yeah, just sharpen it up. They've also done research, um, genetic research in 1998 was when uh, news of this research, this image will be a little bit better. News of this research was first made public in 1988 when geneticists studied the placentas 
of a number of women, all so-called races, all so-called nationalities. They studied the placentas in order to examine the mitochondria DNA, which is that part of the cell structure which is passed on to a child from their mother. And they concluded that every person on earth has one common denominator. That is, every living human being on earth or every human being who has ever lived has possessed within their genetic structure the mitochondrial DNA which links them to a group of women who are still living today in Africa. Again, proving beyond a shadow of a doubt that we were the very first human beings on earth. Now, of course, you know, in recent years, they developed a similar genetic test in order to determine the paternal DNA genes that have been passed on through one's bloodline. And they applied this test to the, the uh, descendants of Thomas Jefferson and <laughs> All right, and were able to substantiate beyond a reasonable doubt that Thomas Jefferson fathered at least one child by uh, his enslaved mistress, Sally Hemings. All right? Well, she was a child. You can call her rape. That, that's what it was. But it's interesting to understand their psychosis and not to allow us to internalize their psychosis. The descendants of Thomas Jefferson said that it was impossible for this man to have sex with a slave. It was impossible. He was a moral man, <laughs> and he couldn't engage in an action which would contradict his, his brilliance. Well, it just goes to show, one, he was a man, and two, he was a white man. So let us not get caught up in their confusion, and let us not engage in a debate in an issue which does not need to be discussed. All right? If we are clear about the issues that we've been, conf that we've been confronted with over the years, and with regards to the development of civilization in Africa, if it is true that humanity began in Africa, then we have to acknowledge the fact that the first civilization also began in Africa. The first system of writing, the first system of government, the first system of, of language and laws, science, mathematics, and medicine also had their origins in Africa, and their origins in a civilization which reached its height in the nation that was called Kemet, now referred to today as Egypt. And Europeans had a need, had a desire to recreate as best they could the symbolic and architectural legacy of ancient Egypt. They had a desire because for hundreds of years they mistakenly believed that the Egyptians were white because they had been miseducated too. And so if you understand the true origins of ancient Kemet, understand its African origins, and with that understanding, you can then move throughout the world and then claim those symbols that are part of your ancestors that have been appropriated by Europeans in order to try to make themselves something that they never were. And so in, in Washington, D.C., some 13 years ago, I designed a tour, an African-centered tour of Washington, D.C., which analyzed the architecture of that city and interpreted the symbolism related to that architecture in order to establish a fact, a historical fact, that the designers of Washington, D.C. attempted to recreate architecturally and symbolically the spiritual essence of ancient Kemet in order to infuse this newly formed nation with a force which would allow them to become the most powerful ruling body on earth. They have become that. They have become that. But what they also have done is to remove from our memory any knowledge of our links to the symbols that they appropriated from our ancestors. And so, it was about two years ago when the brothers and sisters here at UAM came to Washington, D.C. for one of my African Senate tours, and I've just had a conversation uh, prior to coming up here, and it appears as though they're going to make arrangements for another tour, African Senate tour of Washington, tentatively on April the 11th. And since you all have taken the, your last tour, I've added some other components, which essentially puts the nail in the coffin 
and proves beyond a shadow of a doubt exactly what the Europeans were doing. So when you come to Washington and you see that symbol, the symbol which symbolizes the most powerful nation on earth is a symbol which represents the resurrection of an African God. We cannot forget that. We cannot afford to disassociate ourselves from the historical significance of that symbol. It represents an African God who was born on December the 25th, at least 6,000 years before their God, Jesus. It represents an African God who was murdered and after death, his spirit came and, and impregnated his wife, who was a virgin. And then this virgin woman gave birth to their son, who was born on the same day as his father, December the 25th. And this son was charged with the responsibility of restoring his father's kingdom on earth. Heru. This is what this symbol represents. And we cannot, we should not allow anyone to misrepresent this symbol. It's also identified as a phallic symbol. The symbol, the meaning of this symbol is, is, is it has multiple interpretations. And we have to be able to know which interpretation to apply at which particular time. And so this symbol did at one time represent the missing portion of Asar that his wife Aset did not find, his phallus which was supposedly uh, cut from his body and thrown into the Nile River and eaten by a catfish. But this symbol is a phallic symbol. <laughs> a phallic symbol, a 555 foot high penis of an African that stands in the center of Washington, D.C. Huh? And if you understand that aspect of his history, maybe you can begin to understand why Bill Clinton can't keep his pants zipped up. Huh? <laughs> See, the stuff works both ways. <laughs> it works both ways. We also need to understand and be very clear of the mission of George Washington and the so-called found founding fathers after they won their freedom from England and established this nation. We have to be very clear that the very first act that George Washington initiated was to pull together a team of men, a team of artists and researchers whose responsibility it was to design a symbol which was to represent the heart and soul of this newly developed nation. And so this team took six years to study research and design the symbol which became known as the Great Seal of the United States of America. So the artist in me asks you all to understand that when an artist is charged with something, a job of that importance, they don't, just, they don't take it lightly because they know that their work is supposed to stand the test of time. And the men who were responsible for designing this symbol, the men who took six years to design the symbol, were very clear about what they were doing. So when you see these symbols, you have to understand that they represented George Washington and the so-called Founding Fathers' desire to recreate symbolically and spiritually the essence of ancient Kemet here in this country, the United States of America. Are there any pyramids in England, no. France, no. Germany, no. Russia, no. Nova Scotia, no. Scotland, no. Lithuania, no. Ireland? No. There were, at last count, 92 pyramids in Egypt, 15 pyramids in the Sudan, south of Egypt, a dozen pyramids in Ethiopia, south of the Sudan. The only place outside of the continent of Africa where you will find pyramids is right here in this hemisphere 
in Mesoamerica, pyramids that were built by African people who navigated the Atlantic Ocean somewhere around 1000 BCE and brought with them knowledge of stone construction, concepts of God, calendar, astronomy, and mathematics, which they introduced to the indigenous people. So this symbol is a representation of the industrious nature of African people. So we have to be clear of what this symbol is and whose it is. Front of the Great Seal also speaks to this mission, this desire on the, on the part of the so-called founding fathers to recreate symbolically the essence of ancient Kemet. So when you look at the front of the Great Seal, the so-called emblem of the United States of America, understand that symbol, but more importantly, understand the origins of that symbol. That symbol was was copied from the national symbol of Kemet, which represented, which was a personification of Heru, the son of Asar and Aset. Heru, the son of God. I understand also the philosophical and spiritual differences between these two symbols. The symbol of ancient Kemet, the symbol of Heru shows him looking to a right which symbolizes the future, shows him holding in each of his talons a symbol called a shin which represents infinity. And above the shin is a symbol called the ankh which represents life. And so our ancestors were talking about this process of achieving infinite life in the past and in the future. And they knew by understanding your past, by claiming your past, you can then determine what your future was going to be by infusing that information into your knowledge base today. A very simple, very basic, and very fundamental reality. And above his head was a symbol, the sun, which represented Heru, and also represented the creative force which is responsible for the development and the maintenance of all life here on planet Earth. Those who copied the symbol of Heru and created the symbol of the United States of America deviated from this African concept. They showed the eagle, which is a bird that was indigenous to the United States, holding in his claws two oppositional symbols. In the right talon, he holds an olive branch. In the left talon, he holds arrows, symbols of war and peace, which means then that he is always ready to go to war and maybe, maybe ask for peace while he can prepare himself to go to war again, all right? The history of this nation was founded in war. The history of this nation was founded in the destruction of the indigenous population, the rape and enslavement of African people, and the use of their labor to build what has become the wealthiest and most powerful nation on earth. But also inherent within this symbol is another language, language of numbers. A language of numbers which speaks to a unspoken way of seeing the universe and seeing and understanding your relationship to the universe. Numbers have meaning. Just as letters have meaning when they're combined in a certain order to create words. Words when strung together create sentences. Sentences create paragraphs. Paragraphs create concepts and ideas which move and inspire humans. Numbers do the same thing. All right? Numbers do the same thing. So if you were to look at some numbers and understand what they mean, then they would change, that understanding would change the way that you look at everything around you. Because buildings, carvings, statues, embody 
this knowledge of numbers, this science of numbers. For example, the number one has always been associated with God, the creator. The number two represents man and woman who come from God. Number three represents the union of man and woman, which produces a child. All right, now understand the importance and, and the value of that fundamental reality. Children come through the union of men and women. Children don't come from two men or two women. That's Greek. That's Greek nonsense. Children don't come and should not come from men trying to play God and creating babies in test. I, 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 I'll put this out here, but I guarantee you, a hundred years from now, humanity will look back on these test tube babies and realize that people were playing Frankenstein and creating monsters without souls. A hundred years from now, people will look back and re-examine these scientific accomplishments. The number four is a number that symbolizes a cornerstone, a foundation, a base upon which something builds, upon which someone builds in order to position themselves to move forward. That's why Washington, D.C., Brother Jeffries in the house, my brother, Hotel, Brother Jeffries. That is the reason why the city of Washington, D.C., when it was designed, was originally designed to be in the shape of a square, 10 miles by 10 miles by 10 miles by 10 miles. This square, this four-sided symbol, was to represent the cornerstone, the symbolic cornerstone for the establishment of this new nation here in this country. Everything has meaning, whether you are, whether you are conscious of its meaning or not. The number five has always been associated with man. And the word man in this original context comes from the Sanskrit word, which means mind. So the word man has no sexual connotation whatsoever. The word man means mind, just as the word woman means the womb that produces the mind. That is how minds are supposed to come into existence, through the female. Number five is associated with man or the mind because there are five basic parts on the human body. Head, two arms, two legs. Men have five fingers, five toes, and five senses. That's why the Washington Monument was designed to be 555 feet. The designers of that structure knew that in making it, they deviated from the original formula for designing Tekken. Tekken were always designed so that the capstone of the pyramidion was to be one-tenth of the length of the shaft. Following that formula, the Washington Monument should have been a total of 550 feet high, but they added five additional feet in order to incorporate this, this symbolism of the number five in this monument and to reinforce the fact that this monument was built not to honor a Tsar, but to honor George Washington. All right, so all of this stuff is coded, encoded in architecture and symbols that are all around you. And doing some research on, on the African origins of architecture and symbolism, I found some phenomenal things about New York City. Remember the prison in New York City that they tore down that used to be called the tombs? I want someone in this room, matter of fact, let me just charge somebody in this room with the responsibility of finding and sending to me a photograph, an old photograph of the tombs. Why? Because that building was originally designed with the facade of an ancient Egyptian temple. If you look at the old photographs of this building, you'll see the papyrus columns, the lotus columns. You'll see the winged sun disk. You'll see commit symbols all over that building. Why? Because 100 years ago, there was a move, there was a movement within most cities in the United States to build prisons in the shape and with the design of ancient comedic temples. Why? Because it was in the comedic temples where the consciousness of man was reformed. Hence, reformatories in prisons were modeled after superficially modeled after the temples in ancient Kemet. 
Okay? So people have used, have appropriated our knowledge, our history, and our symbols for thousands of years, empowered themselves with that knowledge, while at the same time telling us that Africa made no significant contribution to the development of humanity. They knew that if they could separate us from the power that exists within our very DNA, within our very genetic structure, psychologically, emotionally, and spiritually, if they could separate us from that knowledge, they could continue to control us. That's the only way they remain in power, through our denial of our true selves. Okay? So with that basic, well, it only works as long as we continue to allow it to work. As they say, the dream works as long as you remain asleep. But if you wake up, it's a whole new ball game. All right? It's a whole new ball game. And so what I want you all to begin to understand is why these secrets have been kept away from us. And what they've done over the years in order to ensure that we remain disconnected from knowledge of self. All we have to do is to look back to, to the writings of ancient Africa, to the writings of ancient Kemet, and studied how people intentionally distorted historical realities. I take you back to 19, 1795. 1795, a Frenchman by the name of Count Volney traveled through Kemet and other parts of the ancient world. And he wrote a journal of his travels called Ruins of Empire. And in that journal, he documented what he saw with his own eyes. And what he saw was the African origins of ancient Kemet. His book was a bestseller in France. It was a bestseller in England. And someone decided, some American publishers decided in around 17, 95 that they were going to publish an American edition of his bestseller and make some money on this side of the water. They did publish that and then they ultimately invited Boney to come to the United States to do a speaking tour and book signing. Boney came to the States, looked at the American edition of his book and then realized that they had omitted several pages and several significant paragraphs which talked about the importance of history and put it into its correct historical context. I have to acknowledge Dr. Ben for bringing this book to me or to us and making us aware of this act. Voni, a passage that was omitted from the 1798 edition of, of, of Ruins of Empire stated that there were people in ancient times, there were people now forgotten who discovered, while others were yet barbarians, the elements of the arts and sciences. A race of men who were now ejected from, this, from society because of their sable skin and frizzy hair, founded on the study of the laws of nature, those scientific and religious principles would still govern the universe. Now, just understand that paragraph and why European Americans saw fit to remove it from that book, that there were in ancient times a people who are now forgotten, who discovered while Europeans were still barbarians. These Africans developed the elements of the arts and sciences. They studied the heavens, they studied nature, and, the, and they created those scientific and religious systems which still influence humanity today. White folk could not bear to allow that truth to be spoken because it will begin to expose their lie. Right? They, see, you know, they had to lie to us and they had to lie to themselves in order to maintain their positions of power. W.B. Du Bois in his book, The World in Africa, gave an explanation as to this bizarre and inhumane behavior. The boy said that there could be but one explanation for this vulgarity of 19th century science. It was due to the slave trade and Negro slavery. It was due to the fact 
that the rise in the support of capitalism called for a rationaliz rationalization based upon denigrating and discrediting Negroid peoples. It is especially significant that the science of Egyptology arose and flourished at the very time that the Cotton Kingdom reached its greatest power on the foundation of American Negro slavery. So there was no one on earth that these people now were going to come out and say that the very people that we have enslaved, raped, and stolen are the very people to whom we owe our very existence. They're not ready to do that. Please let's begin to be clear in purposes. We 